Explorer Corps, First Arm, Spinward Operations Area, November 4th, 3151. Captain Rin Barrett looked out across the rugged and barren terrain and sighed with her arms folded across her chest. She shut out the noises of the work behind her and instead listened to the gentle wind as it lightly pelted her face with the occasional grain of sand and pollen. Not even two weeks into this new venture and there were already challenges she hadn't foreseen. Logistics issues and the occasional spat between crewmen she could handle. The bigger issues were continuing to tug at her. Funding for this attempt to revitalize the Explorer Corps had come from some sources that were not on good terms with each other, and that was something she had to hear about from each of them on a routine basis. For now, they were just happy enough to cover costs. Jump ship and drop ship travel always came with inherent risks, but going where there weren't spare parts, spaceports, or even ferrocrete landing pads made for some frustrating wastes of time. Thus is the life of the jump ship captain on the edge of settled space. Trying to stay above the political fray and do what is right for humanity was her guiding light, and she wouldn't let grumpy combine bureaucrats or arrogant wolves get in the way. They weren't the only backers, but they were the ones that filled her mail feed on a consistent basis. With another sigh, Rin turned and looked back at the Alcray, one of the two mule jump ships that she was able to buy for the journey. It was spherical in shape, extremely common across the inner sphere, and built for carrying more than 8,000 tons of cargo. And of course, it looked old and tired enough to avoid being threatening. That was perfect for Rin's purposes. Unfortunately, the ship was currently sitting at a 14 degree angle, with one of the landing pads deep in the mud that had been just under the surface of what her science team said was solid sun-baked dirt. Rin sighed softly before speaking into the mic on her collar. What's the ETA on this nonsense? There was a short delay before a jovial voice responded, Which nonsense? The nonsense that has us stuck on this rock, Levitt. Rin sighed again, this time into the mic. Couldn't give you an ETA, Captain. Depends on the laws of physics and how many times I can hear that sigh, Lieutenant Levitt replied. In a more civilized time, I'd have you shot, Rin responded, starting to walk towards the dropship. Promises, promises, came the reply. When Rin was within 50 meters of the ship, she stopped to watch as the crew struggled with the nanofiber lines being run from the internal supports of the ship inside the cargo bay and out roughly 150 meters to a series of securing hooks wrapped around a rock outcropping. In between the two were both of the mechs that were inside the dropship for the landing. Rin furrowed her brow, taking in the view of the ancient Commando 2D and the much more modern Calliope, the original plan had been to make sure mechs were as ammo-independent as possible. The commando and its pilot were so inexpensive that it was too good to pass up. The base model of the Calliope was also an ammo hog, but Rin had commissioned a retrofit that replaced the multi-missile launcher with two clan medium pulse lasers, an additional heat sink, and a few more armor plates. The plasma rifle the 40-ton mech carried was far too useful to seek out another mech design entirely. Between the two mechs, there were three giant hands tugging on the lines through the ship's pulleys. Gradually, the ship was being pulled to a more upright position while Tex scrambled to support the still partially submerged landing pad. One of the bright parts of being out in the middle of nowhere was the lack of media attention. The last thing Rin wanted was a video of this mishap floating around the net. Even worse if it made its way back to Terra or her combine contact. Once the ship's plumb, we can get some heat down there and dry out the soil. Three or four hours, maybe? Lieutenant Levitt's voice said, this time from Rin's side, rather than the earpiece she was wearing. That's fine. I'll give the science team a chance to finish their sweep, Rin said, nodding toward her longtime friend. He smirked, as he always did, when he had some smart aleck thing to say. Rin didn't give him a chance, because she was already running toward that rock outcropping. A small group of techs and the science team members in their yellow and white jumpsuits were huddled around something. That couldn't be a good sign. As Rin closed in on them in a run, she unclipped the holster on her hip. At ten yards, the crew could see she was coming in part of the way. On the ground, face down, was one of the Explorer Corps science team. On his back was a dark gray creature the same color as the rocks around them. Its sharp legs were firmly speared into the man's sides, and it appeared to be attached to the base of the man's neck with a long, dark pink protuberance. No one seemed to be in a rush to try to get the creature off, as the man had stopped screaming and seemed very much dead. Rin wasted no time unholstering her Zadorozhna brand laser pistol and aimed it at the creature. 
Two shots through its head left it motionless, though still very much attached to the crewman's corpse. Well, you can mark off this planet as being visited by humans before, Rin said as she holstered her weapon. Why? asked one of the science team, who looked like he was about 15 and never had to shave. That's a crana. They're not native. One likely hitched a ride on a dropship long ago and ended up here. Now they're probably everywhere. Keep your distance from the rocks and finish up taking your data. I want everybody ready to go in two hours, Rin said, running her hand through her curly auburn hair. She looked over at one of the techs, who had not yet turned to go back to monitoring the cables, and added, Can you please bring the body to the ship? We will find a good spot for a burial away from any more of those things. Yes, ma'am, the tech said with a crisp salute. Rin squatted down and lifted the science team member enough to grab his dog tags. She frowned, running her fingers over the raised ring on the punched metal tag. She thought about what she will write in the message to his family, and to the other families she'll undoubtedly have to contact before this mission is over. She didn't want to be the type of explorer who ended up ignoring the human cost due to hubris. On her way back to the dropship, Rin was already writing that message in her head. So preoccupied by thought, she didn't notice the damage to the dropship's support now pulled from the ground. Tex worked quickly to rig up a couple of jump jets to fire into the dirt underneath the strut in an attempt to dry out the mud. All that Ren could see was sea bills evaporating as she added up all the costs of repairs to the dropship. There was no way they could continue their mission with only one functioning ship. Two hours later, Akrai was lifting off from the planet's surface and heading back to the jump ship. In the two days it took to reach the Chimiishu class jump ship named Rabbitfoot, she wrote a letter to the family of the geologist who died planetside. She wasn't one to cry writing such things, but it still left an ache deep inside her for every crewman she had lost in her 17-year career. Though not as old as many captains out there, filling a letter with all the words to describe how much the mission will be worse off without their loved one made her feel a million years old. She didn't really feel close to the jump ship until she could see the large purple letters of the ship's name come into view. Jump sails were stowed as the batteries of the Kearney Fuchsia drives had been fully charged for days. The rest of the ship was painted white to honor the memory of the Comstar that once was, and the Explorer Corps that Rin hoped to bring back. Finally back in the ship's cozy and rather spartan bridge, crew scurried, preparing for a jump. Lieutenant Levitt stood by her side, holding a tablet computer showing what the little excursion will cost the mission. It wasn't good. The Alcrae's landing strut had suffered from stress fractures and needed time in a dock with an experienced tech crew for repair. Dropship repairs were not cheap, and they couldn't be done quickly in zero-g. However, it was unavoidable as the mission could not continue with only one functioning dropship. We could always find the nearest port and retool, Levitt said. Unfortunately, the nearest port is not one I want to visit, Rin said, holding up her own tablet, showing settled planets within fifty light years. The closest within one jump was flashing light blue. Levitt read the name. Antalos Port Crin. Never heard of it. That's because you're not a thief, bandit, or a wall clanner, Rin said before adding her trademark sigh. I'm not a thief, bandit, or a wall clanner yet, you mean, Levitt responded, trying to bring some levity to the situation. Rin's lips pursed to stifle the smirk. She sighed instead. Every jump back toward the inner sphere is too lost. It's time we don't have. We'll have to head to Port Corrin and try to stay out of trouble, Rin said, remembering what she read from scanning the planet's report months ago when she was getting to know the systems outside of the Draconis Combine. Levitt fed the navigator the new destination, and within the hour the ship was ready to make the jump. Rin reminded herself of how important the success of this mission was and that small risks must be taken to prevent more dangerous risks later. She looked down at her hands, gripping the command chair armrests a little harder than usual. Are we ready? she asked, a quickly nodding Levitt. Yes, ma'am. In just a few moments, the rabbit's foot would unleash the stored energy in its batteries to rip a hole in space and send the ship and all of its occupants 22 light years away. Rin steeled herself and counted down. On go. Five, four, three, two, one. Go! End part one. Part two. The jump into the Antalos system was run of the mill, but immediately Captain Rin felt on edge. Even just being in a system with such a bad reputation would risk smearing her efforts. 
She tapped her finger against the tablet on her desk, looking up the various items pinned and taped onto the wall of her cabin. Some of them were from her own life and adventures, but many were much older. They were artifacts from an age when scientific exploration was a consideration beyond just a cudgel in war. At least, that's what she wanted to believe. No, it was something she needed to believe. Before she dealt with anything on Antalos, Rin would have to make sure the rabbit's foot was in good hands. She walked down the gunmetal gray steel hallway to the ready room where the mech warriors and air jocks were waiting. Their banter died down as she stepped up to the aluminum conference table. First of all, you're all staying here. The last thing I need is one of my mech warriors picking a fight in a bar and ending up too busted to work or in traction for six months, Rin said with a slightly more authoritative tone than she usually needed. A key furrow, a mech warrior of the Calliope, piped up while spinning an empty mug on its edge. Ah, Captain, don't you have any faith in my right hook? None at all. You four are staying here to back up Lieutenant Levitt and the Holtz and their arrow fighters. The last thing we need is for an opportunist to seize our jump ship while the Acre is under repair over Antelos, Rin explained. What about you? asked Kip Holt, the gruff and grizzled aerospace pilot leaning against the bulkhead next to his daughter Ariana, the ship's other aerospace pilot. Won't the Acre need some backup? Rin nodded at the question before responding. I'm hoping we can keep a low profile. The Acre is a run-of-the-mill dropship, and I'd like anyone who looks at it to assume it's not worth bothering. An aerospace fighter flying back up is a big neon sign asking for attention. I'll take the skeleton dropship crew and some techs to help with the repairs. Maybe that can shave a few seabills off the repair. Everyone nodded except for Tenika Denton, who leaned back in her chair and looked concerned. Have something, Ten? Rin asked of her mech warrior. I would feel much better if you had at least one mech in the hold, and someone to watch your back, Tenika said while gently tapping her finger on the table. Well, we wouldn't want you to feel uncomfortable. Fine, you're with me. At least I can trust you to stay out of trouble, Rin said. Move your Zeus to the Acre as soon as possible. Akif and May, Rin turned to look at the mech warriors on the other side of the table. Since you're moving your Calliope and Commando anyway, you have first watch. A few mechs standing on the rabbit's foot should let anyone at the jump point know we're not easy pickings. Aye, Captain, they said together. When Rin reached the bridge, Lieutenant Levitt was there waiting for her. He handed over the tablet with the expected repair goods as well as the bid to help with negotiations. She scanned it before stuffing it back into the rucksack she had grabbed from her cabin on the way. We'll keep things from falling apart up here if you can keep from slipping into a life of crime and debauchery down there, Levitt said with his trademark smile. Oh, you know me, life of the party, Lorin said in her usual dry tone. If all goes well, we won't have to go planetside. The station in orbit should have the repair facilities we need, and I don't think the Acre could handle a surface landing anyway, Rin added. Keep an eye out. If anyone gets too nosy or asks what we're up to, let them know we're on official combine business. That should keep most of the riffraff at bay. Just make sure you come back. You might be the only one here who really believes in this Explorer Corp stuff, Levitt said with a smile. Rin turned and offered up a weak smile before replying, I don't know how you managed to become both an optimist and a pessimist at the same time. It's all part of my charm, Captain, Levitt responded with a salute. Captain Rin and Tenneka walked through the opening airlock door, looking like they were there for business. Rin wore her light gray captain's tunic and navy blue flight pants. Her auburn hair was pulled into a tight single braid and stowed under her light gray cap. Tenika, in her usual style, was wearing a navy blue jumpsuit, opening down the front to show the coolant vest underneath. The right arm of the jumpsuit was rolled up to show off the faint blue glow of the tribal eagle inked across her forearm. It was all very deliberate, as both Rin and Tenika sought to look like people you wouldn't necessarily want to mess with. To some extent it was true, as Rin knew Tenika had been through more than her fair share of scraps, though Rin was a scientist, not a warrior. In fact, she had only ever ordered a ship to fire on a single occasion, and that was to scare off some pirates more than a decade ago. The dropship was locked down, for now, at one of the four repair gantries that surrounded the floating space station, in orbit over Antelos. Though, to be fair, calling it a space station doesn't really do the massive structure justice. Or maybe it does too much justice. The structure consisted of several defunct jump ships seemingly welded together around the original repair and construction naval yard. It was all vaguely menacing, and things didn't improve as the two explorers walked into the bridge of one of the jump ships. 
The bridge had been converted into what looked like half an office and half a bar, with junkers, techs, and various other characters scattered around socializing. No one seemed to be in a hurry to recognize Rin or Tenika. Rin scanned the room and picked out the guy who looked like he was in charge, largely because he had his hand around an underling's arm and was physically twisting it as the victim cringed. Rin and Tenika walked up to him, and his attention turned to them. He looked vaguely interested as Rin introduced herself. I'm Captain Rin Barrett of the New Explorer Corps. We're getting some repairs done on the dropship, and you look like the person we should talk to in order to replace some gear. Rin spoke with firmness, but tempered it to avoid sounding arrogant. The last thing she wanted was for this traitor to think that she thought she was too good for this establishment. The rather heavy-set man leaned back in his chair, rubbed the stubble on his chin, and smiled before responding. Well, I don't know if I'm the guy you should talk to, but I'm a guy you can talk to. What gear do you need? Rin handed over the tablet and the man looked at it, scanned over the list before responding. We can cover for most of this, though it's going to be a bit pricey. We're far from your closest depot. My name is Reese. You're on my ship and you're welcome to stay as long as you need. The way he smiled and looked up at Tenika like she was on the menu made both of the explorers stand up a little straighter. Seeking to defuse things, Rin turned to Tenika and suggested that she go get some drinks. The mech warrior furrowed her dark-haired brow before turning and walking off to seek that drink. You have a nice jump ship at that nadir point. Your dropship's crap, though. I suspect that's deliberate, Reese said, handing the tablet off to the tech who scanned it before handing it back to Rin. We are on a scientific mission, non-military, though we can defend ourselves, Rin said, offering as little information as she could. Reese chuckled and nodded. I'm sure you can. Tell you what, why don't you and your partner stick around and enjoy what the station has to offer? We can take some good care of your dropship and let get you on your way. Rin nodded. We'll stay on our ship, for the safety of your crew and ours. Reese turned his head slightly and his smile grew even larger. In a half-statement, half-laugh, he responded, <laughs> Looks like that's true. <laughs> Rin turned to see Tenika and a somewhat dangerous-looking tech in greasy overalls squaring up for a fistfight. Or at least it looked like a fist fight until Rin saw the tech reach back to slide a blade from his back pocket, holding it out of Tenika's view. Rin moved quickly toward the fight, but not before the blade slashed across the air and nicked Tenika on the forearm. She winced, but did not retreat. Just a few meters away now, Rin saw the tech prepare for another swing when the motion was interrupted by the tech being lifted several feet up into the air. In the fray, Rin hadn't noticed the huge person walk up and grip the tech by the neck. Of course, it's impossible not to identify a clan elemental on sight. They dwarf the standard human by a significant margin, and the one that was currently gripping that struggling tech around his neck was covered in the telltale signs of elemental battle armor enhancements. The massive warrior squeezed, and the tech dropped the knife to the metal floor. Only then did the elemental release his grip and drop the man to the deck. Tenika stood, quite in awe, looking up at the clan warrior as if he wasn't quite real. The tech grabbed his knife and scrambled out of the room. With the action over, the people went back to drinking and socializing. Tenika dropped her fighting stance and looked up at the warrior who, in turn, looked down at her like she was a half-completed puzzle. I could have handled him. I didn't need help, Tenika said as Rin finally reached her side. Of that I know there is no doubt, said the warrior in a tone so bass that Rin felt like her bones rattled. However, everyone needs help sometimes. That is no failing or indicative of a loss of honor. If you say so, Tenika said as she grabbed a towel from the bar and held it over the cut on her arm. The elemental turned his head enough to look down at Rin, sizing her up as Rin gawked up at him. She looked at his chiseled features and the slightly glowing green inked design up his arms, chest, and neck. If you don't mind me asking, to what clan are you sourced? Rin said with some trepidation. The elemental seemed to ponder the question for quite some time before responding. He took a deep breath and said, I do not mind the question, though I would have started by asking my name. Oh, so sorry, I, you just caught me a little off guard, Rin said. What, what's your name? The elemental nodded with a slight smile before responding. I have a tendency to do that. My name is Vasil. I am, was, of Clan Jade Falcon. Tenika piped up, pulling the rag away from the cut on her arm. I thought all the falcons bit it on Terra. Vasil looked back towards Tenika, and again, after a lengthy pause, he responded, Not all of them. 
Can I buy you a drink? Rin asked, hoping to find out more about why this Jade Falcon was out here so far from, well, everything. Yes, I would like that, Basile said, still looking at Tenneko with a slightly puzzled and amused gaze. End Part 2 Begin Part 3 Rin, Tenneka, and Vasil stood at the gantry overlooking the Acre as techs busied themselves fixing the bent landing strut. The imposing elemental did a lot of listening and observing, only asking the occasional question of the captain and her mech warrior. Who is funding your expedition? Vasil asked, still looking out at the dropship. We have various backers, but two main ones. There's a combined scientific arm that's mainly interested in procuring resources lost to time and technology, and our other backer. Rin pauses before continuing. Is the new Ill Clan. Basil sighed deeply, and Rin looked up to see the slight shift towards frustration on his face. His jaw rolled slightly, grinding his teeth. Rin felt the need to qualify it by adding, But we're operating largely independently. It's about science and bettering humanity, not enabling conquest or getting involved in petty politics. It's dangerous out here in the periphery. Besides, your ferocious eagle here, who will keep you alive? Basil said, looking down at Tenneka, who in turn looked down at the blue eagle on her exposed forearm. Clanners weren't known for their subterfuge, so Rin weighed her options, made the call, and decided that Vasil wasn't a threat. She said, we have a lance of lights to heavy mechs and a couple of aerospace fighters, plus we plan on keeping a pretty low profile. As I can see, Basil said, nodding toward the worn mule dropship. How did you end up out here instead of with the rest of your clan? Tenneka asked. It's a long story, but the end is that I am deemed not sufficiently eager to participate in the conquest of Terra, Basil said in a calm and even tone. Tenneka countered, what does that mean? I was a falcon warrior for several years before Malvina rose to power. I saw how things changed for the clan, how words were twisted and honor bent to meet her will. When my commanding officer was executed by Malvina in the circle of equals over a minor issue, I knew I could not fight for her. I could only fight for the clan. I volunteered to stay behind to care for a Sibco group not yet old enough to fight. The clan moved on without me, Vasil said, his stone-gray eyes never leaving the dropship. Tenneka and Rin looked at each other, and even though Rin shook her head, Tenneka asked anyway, What happened to the Sibco? Vasil sighed slowly before responding, Clan Hell's horses happened, and I failed to protect them. I attempted to do the honorable thing and die in battle, as all Jade Falcons should, but it appears that fate had other plans for me. I am without a clan, a home, or a mission. It was nearly a full minute before anyone spoke again. Tenneka nodded at Rin, and with an unspoken approval, Rin said, We can't offer you a clan, but we could offer you a home and a mission. Vasil looked down at the two of them, his face stoic and without a hint of emotion, Rint thought that he was about to turn and walk away, but instead, he said, Someone should keep you two out of trouble. With repairs nearly complete, Rin dealt with Reese's underlings and squabbled over prices while Vasil and Tenneka collected his gear from the storage locker. When the door slid open, Tenneka was surprised to see just a few personal possessions scattered around a simple cabin that was dominated by the presence of a clan invasion era elemental battlesuit. It was scuffed, worn, and showed the fact that it was more than a hundred years old. Tenneka took in the sight of each part as Vasil stepped into it and began to apply each piece of armor, locking it into place. When he put on the last piece over his head, Tenneka could see the remnants of a painted green falcon that had been worn almost completely away. She grabbed his rucksack and tossed it over her shoulder. Ready to go? Tenneka asked. Through the battle armor's external speakers, Vasil's voice replied, let us go explore. Explorer Corps, First Arm, Spinward Operations Area, Antalos System, Nadir Jump Point, November 10th, 3151. Cal Levitt tapped the hull table top a few times to make sure what he was seeing wasn't a figment of a glitched system. Sure enough, the five little lights continued to move up behind the rabbit's foot on a trajectory that would take them up alongside the hull. 
All right, we're on, folks. This isn't a drill. Do not let them secure to the hull. He tapped the mic on his collar and announced an incoming boarding action across the ship. Kip and Ariana were already in their fighters and on their way out of the ship's launching bay. Mech warriors Akif and Olivia were on their way out onto the hull with their mechs, and May should be out in her commando in less than two minutes. Cal glanced over at his tablet, waiting for a response from his message to Rin warning her of the assault on the jump ship. However, there was no response. From the angle of approach, most of the jump ship's guns wouldn't be able to target the incoming craft. It would be up to the mech warriors and the Holtz to keep them from latching on. The expedition couldn't afford a deck-by-deck -deck fight for control of the ship. There was no money in the budget to pay for mercenary marines to loaf around on board in case they were needed. The best they could do was lock down bulkheads and clear away the means to escape for these pirates. Then maybe the pirates could be delayed until Rin shows up with backup. If she ever did return with backup, he glanced again down at the tablet. Nothing. Kip and Ariana Holt streaked out of the launch bay, banking hard and heading toward the small craft rapidly approaching the jump ship. In her core axe, a light fighter armed with a large pulse laser backed up with two medium lasers, Ariana quickly scanned for the closest target. Her father flew farther behind, taking aim with his ER large lasers and ER PPC. Designating targets one through five, one on your right coming in fast, Ariana said, lining up her shot on the closest craft. At this distance, they were still hard to see, possibly due to being painted black with some sort of IR-absorbing paint. The lock was weak, but it was what she had. She squeezed the trigger, and the large pulse laser thumped its comforting cadence through the frame of the Corax. The laser covered the distance nearly instantly at that range, but instead of getting a firm hit, the laser seemed to diffuse and refract in a dozen different directions. Kit backed her up with both ER large lasers and the ER PPC shot at the same time. Though the lasers seemed to also diffuse and lose their power, the ERPPC cut through whatever was in front of the ships and ripped into the hull of the craft. Torn like paper, the ship spilled its contents of pirates and their gear into open space. As both aerospace fighters flew past the remnants, the machines spewing reflective metal material from the front of the craft explained the lasers' ineffectiveness. We're going to need to hit them from the sides and aft, Ari, Kip said, reversing his thrusters and pulling the nose of the stingray around to the nearest target. On the hull of the rabbit's foot, Akif and Olivia locked onto the next closest target after seeing the first craft break apart. Olivia's thunderbolt was an intimidating presence on the battlefield, but standing on the spine of the jump ship, it looked quite small. As the closest ship came into range, Olivia lined up her shot and fired her mech's ER PPC and ER medium lasers. While once again the lasers had trouble penetrating the screen in front of these ships, the ER PPC gouged a significant chunk out of the pirate vessel. Akif followed up with his Calliope's plasma rifle, which had no problem burning through the chafe and then searing its way into the remaining armor of the ship. It continued to travel forward due to momentum, but the ship began to roll head over tail out of control. Call that one good. Move on to target three. Olivia coolly spoke into the comms as she turned the Dark Age refit Thunderbolt and lined up for the next shot. The Holtz clipped a third ship off course, and the impact of another PPC blast following laser strikes left two vessels on the intercept course. The previously hit tumbling ship twisted away from the jump ship, but shots from the mechs missed number four. It slid past the jump ship on the side away from the mechs, latching onto the outer surface with maglocks. The fifth ship buzzed the mechs and seemed to continually narrowly avoid the incoming fire. The Holtz had to peel their aerofighters off into a holding pattern rather than risk hitting the ship with their fire. Both Akif and Olivia started the slow march toward the vessel that rolled and then maglocked itself to the jump ship's hull. Inside the ship, Cal Levitt turned off the magnets on his boots and boosted off the wall with the needler in his hands. As he coasted down the hallway, that would take him down to where the sensors were showing that the pirates were cutting through the hull. Several techs holding their own laser pistols joined him as a second team was sent to make sure bulkhead doors were locked and jammed shut further back in the ship where the first vessel had attached. They didn't have enough guns for a single boarding action, let alone two. Reaching the door to the storage area, Levitt checked his tablet and contacted the bridge for confirmation. Bulkhead 34E, 4th rib, correct? Levitt asked. Affirmative, sir. Sensors suggest at least a dozen pirates are in there moving gear within that room. Levitt pulled a flashbang grenade from his pack on the side and pulled the pin. He looked at the two nervous techs with him and nodded, hitting the door release and tossing the grenade inside. The Calliope reached the partially crashed ship first, using its left hand to grip it and began to peel back armor plating. Akif was angry at this point with the presumption of these pirates and, and he planned on venting them out into space. 
Olivia's Thunderbolt arrived moments later, just in time to see the Calliope tearing into the ship, which started to vent atmosphere into space, including gear and a pirate who tumbled head over heels past Akif's cockpit. It didn't phase him as he pulled the ship apart. Several more pirates were suddenly without air, but it appeared that most were able to get into the rabbit's foot. Lieutenant Levitt, we did what we could here, but there are an unknown quantity of pirates inside. Their ship is toast, though, Olivia spoke into the calm line, feeling Akif's frustration as he continued to stand his mech over the ruined pirate vessel. The calm link did not return a response. Rounds bounced off the bulkhead as the pirates exchanged fire with Levitt and the techs through the partially open door. The initial flashbang resulted in a lot of yelling and a hail of gunfire through the door, which prevented entry. Levitt could hear sporadic voices over the comm, but the gunfire was making deciphering it impossible. He considered using a high-explosive grenade from his pack, but with the already compromised hull in the room, he risked depressurizing that section of the ship. He thought to himself how he'd become really accustomed to breathing over the years, and quite preferred it over a vacuum. A bullet bounced off the bulkhead and smacked his hand, refocusing his efforts. He poked the barrel of his needler pistol into the room and blind-fired inside. We're toast, Levitt said, just before the door to the cabin exploded inward, to shower Levitt and the techs with debris from inside the room, blown outward back into the hallway. Levitt's ears were ringing, and he couldn't see much from the smoke and the dust in the air. He realized he dropped his pistol and looked around on the ground for it, only to feel the rapid, heavy thud through the decking. Thud, 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 thud. Looking up, his eyes went wide in shock as the battle-armored soldier ran past him and into the room. In only a fraction of a second, Levitt went from expecting to die gruesomely, to feeling relief, to feeling empathy for the anguished screams coming from inside the room. Gunfire continued, then gradually dwindled. When Levitt looked into the room, the figure wearing the battle armor was standing in the middle of the room. The claw that made up its left hand was firmly gripping the collar of a pirate who was no longer in one piece. Finally, there was silence, and Levitt could begin to hear through the calm link as the ringing in his ears abated. It was Rin's voice, demanding a report. There was gunfire in the background, and Levitt was called into action. Quickly rising, helping the techs to their feet and grabbing the needler pistol. As they started to head down the hallway to the location of the other pirate intrusion, the elemental came up behind them. Excuse me, it said through its external speakers, running past the crew at full speed, only to turn on a dime at the end of the hall, far more gracefully than it had any right to. Who the hell is that in the frog suit? Levitt asked over the comm. Oh, Tanaka made a new friend, came Rin's reply. End Part 3 Part 4 New Explorer Corps, First Arm, Spinward Operations Area, Two Jumps Outside the Antalo System, November 17th, 3151 Captain Rin sat in the command chair in the bridge of the Rabbit's Foot, a 245,000-ton Chimishu-class jumpship looking out at the stars through the bank of thick glass panels of the bridge's far wall. Her crew busied themselves with all of the typical maintenance duties following their double jump away from the Antalos system. It drained the ship's batteries, but after the attack at the Antalos jump point, Rin wanted to put as much space between them and any of the pirates' friends as possible. They had just barely started this journey, and already Rin felt weighed down by the consequences of seemingly routine decisions. A tech who went by the name Tyson was killed in the boarding action with the pirates before Vasil arrived and triggered an instantaneous surrender. As the weapons of the pirates clattered to the floor, Rin pulled at Tyson's jumpsuit, trying to pull him out of the line of fire. However, at that point, he was already limp, with eyes staring motionless. As Vasil, Levitt, and the others stuffed the disarmed pirates back into their craft and cut it loose after disabling their propulsion systems, Rin continued to hold Tyson. The tapping of Levitt's fingers on the hollow vid table pulled Rin's attention and broke the guilt-tinted haze for the moment. He smiled, seemingly always able to generate one even in the toughest of times. Have you weighs the crown, Captain? Levitt asked in his usual jovial tone. Something like that. I assume the scanners are clear, Rin replied. Not a peep. If the pirates had buddies, they'd have less than an 18% chance of stumbling upon us two jumps away, so that was a good call, Levitt said as he tapped the table again. Rin looked out back at the stars. After a few moments, she responded, I'll feel better after a few more jumps. 
Down in the rather spacious recreation room of the jump ship, the four mech warriors and two aerospace pilots sat around the meeting table playing cards and talking. Ever since the ship jumped out of the Antalus system, the primary topic had been Vasil joining the expedition. I don't know. It's all a bit risky to house a Jade Falcon, isn't it? What if he goes all Malvina on us? Akif said, tossing down a busted set of cards. Tenaka furrowed her brow and leaned forward. They're not all like her. In fact, there's a significant number that resisted her every step of the way. Vasil saved lives the other day. Don't forget. Have any of you served with a clanner before? I don't want to end up in some sort of honor duel because I bumped into him in the hallway, May said, tugging at her black braided hair out of a nervous habit. I would actually love to see you take on an elemental in that commando, Olivia said with a chuckle, and at the same time tossing down her winning hand, claiming the pile of multicolored aluminum chips. What would the odds be on that? Akif asked with a chuckle. Just then, Kip and Ariana walked in, grabbing a couple of seats in recliner chairs near the table. I think if you spend some time with him, you'll see that he isn't what we've been shown in the propaganda, Tenika said, dealing out the next hand. That's trash! The second he can, that clanner will gut the captain and claim the ship is his. Just you wait, Kip said with a snarl. Ariana put her hand on his forearm, but he pulled it away. Nah, don't sugarcoat it. We're all just supposed to ignore the fact that the Falcons murdered their way across the inner sphere? How do you get past that? Tenika stopped dealing and looked over at Kip before flatly stating, You will get past it, because that's the job. If the captain says Vasil is part of the mission, he's part of the mission. If you have a problem with it, go get in your stingray and piss off. We're just worried about it, Ariana said, trying to temper her father's remarks. I'm not worried. I'm just aware, Kip said with a slightly cooler tone. New Explorer Corps, First Arm, Spinward Operations Area. Two jumps outside the Antelo system, November 20th, 3151. Walking the ship as he usually did before a jump, Levitt scanned the bulkhead for stress fractures and any other anomaly. When he walked by cargo bay number two, he heard the rhythmic sounds of boots running on the decking. Inside, Levitt stopped to watch as Vasil ran in a loop around the open space between the crates and barrels of expedition supplies. Being quite cramped for space already, there wasn't really a cabin for him but Vasil said that he was fine with bunking in the cargo bay. Rin had briefly thought about asking Tyson's bunkmate if it would be okay if the elemental moved in, but the issue was tense and Tyson's friends were still grieving. The last thing they needed was a new roomie in the technician area. Additionally, Rin was concerned that the clan warrior might not appreciate being asked to live with technicians. When Vasil spotted Levitt, he stopped running and walked over. Towering over your standard human didn't phase the elemental, but Levitt was still trying to get used to having to look up to meet the clanner's gaze with his own. How you settling in? Levitt asked. The accommodations will serve well. I am comfortable. Though, we really should sit down to review the ship's defense plans should another pirate incursion occur. Defense teams with stashed weapons could allow for faster response to threats. Vasil said in his usual even tone, even though he had just been exercising moments before. Levitt nodded. We should find some time after the jump. Levitt paused for a moment before adding, I want to thank you for what you did, helping the captain out, helping the crew. Thanks are not necessary. I was doing my duty as any warrior should, Vasil said, crossing his arms over his chest. The two looked at each other for a moment before Vasil asked, are you and the captain in a pair bond? Levitt looked confused for a moment before realizing what Basil meant. He stammered, Oh, no, definitely not. It's more like a big brother protecting a sister thing. I've known Rin for most of my life. We just look out for each other. It's not anything like that. Basil nodded, seeming to understand. It is often the case in the Sibco that bonding would remain throughout careers. Warriors looking out for each other. That is a noble and honorable thing. Credit to you, Lieutenant Levitt. The wall speakers across the ship beeped on and Rin's voice carried across the rabbit's foot. Jump in ten minutes. Lieutenant Levitt, if you're done with your stroll, we could use you up in the bridge. Duty calls, Levitt said. Basil nodded and gave the lieutenant a Jade Falcon salute. Levitt returned his own and headed out of the cargo bay. New Explorer Corps, first arm, spinward operations area, three jumps outside of the Antelo system. November 20th, 3151. 
Rin took a moment to let her stomach settle before asking for the all-clear. After so many years of jumping, she'd like to believe it got easier. However, there was always a little bit of an adjustment period after jumping 30 light years through space. It's like the body needed a few moments to figure out where it was in the astral plane of existence. Are we clear? Let's get sensors up fast. I want to know if we have any neighbors in the system, Rin said after restraining the reflux. We're clear. Initial sweeps show a clear jump point. Longer range scans ongoing, the comms officer belted out with trained brevity. Rin walked over to the hollow table and marked their system. Some existing details popped up from the hard drives she had inherited from her grandfather's estate. The Comstar logo rotated slowly, and for a moment she wondered if this feeling of excitement is the same that the original Explorer Corps felt when heading out into new territory. Her eyes scanned the info, and when she saw it, Rin looked over at Levitt just as the comms officer said, We have a live HPG connection. Data transfer is commencing. It's on the moon of the second planet, away from the star, but the report from 3058 says the site was abandoned and the HPG generator was inactive, Rin said as she scanned the old Comstar documents for details. Levitt shrugged and said, well, a lot can change in almost a century. Rin walked over to the helm and grabbed her tablet. Sure enough, it was downloading all of the messages that had piled up since the last time they were in an HPG-enabled system. Among the various messages from vendors some personal items, and most notably, a couple of messages that she really didn't want to see. One of them was from her combine handler, and the other was from the science-cased representative of Clan Wolf. Captain Rin Barrett, New Explorer Corps, November 8th, 3151. Captain, when you receive this, we require a status update with all of your scientific data produced so far. Additionally, we would like your estimates concerning progress and discoveries of economic or industrial worth. Future financial support depends upon your ability to produce results that are deemed satisfactory. Response is expected at your earliest possible opportunity when you next establish HPG contact. Respectfully, Mio Sato, Deputy Bureau of Interstellar Trade, Draconis Combine. Rin sighed deeply, closing the message and moving on to the next. Captain Rin Barrett, New Explorer Corps, November 8, 3151. Captain Rin. As per our previous conversations, we expect an update at the earliest possible contact. Priorities include, but are not exclusive to, any Star League era artifacts, technology, material goods, or information generated as a result of contact with legacy data storage devices. Any contact with Clan Seafox or Clan Snow Raven should be avoided if possible. Log and report any incidental contacts or observation of Clan forces in your region. If contacted, do not share your connections with the O-Clan. This is for your own safety and for our operational security. Scientific data should be transmitted as a secondary consideration to the above. Mission logs, including location data, should be encrypted using the key provided during the August meeting with scientist Cased member Siobhan. Star Captain Randall, 54th Garrison Cluster, Upsilon Galaxy, Il-Clan Wolf. Rin sat there for a few moments before closing the second message. I want scans on that HPG moon as soon as possible. Put the Holtz on alert just in case they're sending something our way. Are you okay? Levitt asked, seeing the worn down look on Rin's face. Of course. Let's get to work, Rin responded. End Part 4 New Explorer Corps, First Arm, Spinward Operations Area, Three Jumps Outside the Entello System, November 24th, 3151. Captain Rin Barrett stared out of one of the dropship Alalia's bridge windows and scowled at the possibilities ahead of her. They were in an orbit around a moon completely dwarfed by its gas giant planet. The dropship was being buffeted by radiation from the planet, but what concerned Rin at the moment was the yellow-brown swirling atmosphere blanketing the moon's surface. Somewhere under thick clouds tainted by sulfuric acid was the HPG station that was still operating. This was exactly the sort of thing her investors would want her to investigate. What do we know? Rin asked the room when she turned to look at the hollow table. The comms officer replied, Well, you're not going to want to build a vacation home down there. We're looking at a surface temperature of around 50 Celsius, and those clouds are roughly half water. The rest is a mixture of phosphorus, sulfur, and a bunch of other chemicals that are hostile to life. Why on earth would anyone build a hyperpulse generator there? Rin asked herself before sighing. 
Her eyes turned back toward the view of the moon through the glass. She added, louder this time, unless they didn't want anyone to visit. Captain, we have an incoming communications link from the moon, the comms officer stated. Bring it up, Rin said, curious now that there was proof of life down there. Or proof of something, anyway. This, this is, is Persephone, Persephone Station, Station, the computer-generated voice continued. Your, Your ship, ship is, is not, not recognized, recognized and not welcome. welcome. Leave, or, or you will face the full might of Comstar. Rin responded into the comm mic in her command chair. This is Captain Rin Barrett. I'm leading the new Explorer Corps mission, and we seek only peace. There was nearly ten seconds of silence before the digitized voice repeated the original message word for word. Comstar, Rin said breathlessly before tapping her mic to pull up the Alalia's internal comm link. We've made contact with something down at the HPG, so we're headed down. Olivia and Akif, I want you and your mechs and ready to stomp the second we land. Aye, Captain, Olivia's voice returned, with Akif's coming shortly after. As the dropship started to change course and begin its descent into the tumultuous atmosphere of the moon, Rin tried to contain her excitement at the prospect of getting to see some genuine Comstar technology. Who knew what the site could contain? There didn't seem to be any bite behind the bark of this digital message, so it's likely the site was abandoned long ago and the security system turned on to scare away looters and pirates. As the Alalia settled down on the rough ferrocrete, Rin stood on the decking of the ship's bridge and held her breath. Surrounding the ship was a wind-swept complex consisting of three buildings constructed from poured ferrocrete that looked like they had been there for ages. In the distance, beyond the edges of the yellow haze in the atmosphere, stood a battle mech which was hard to identify. Rin let her mech warriors know to keep an eye on it as they started to disembark. Olivia's thunderbolt stepped down the ramp first. Its white paint job was tinted yellow in the caustic atmosphere. Akif's calliope followed shortly after, scanning for any possible threats. Olivia furrowed her brow. The dark, brown skin of her hands contrasted with the light gray of the Thunderbolt's control sticks as she pushed the mech forward toward the mech in the distance. Closing on it, the haze thinned and she opened up the comm link with the captain. This Battlemaster looks like it's a thousand years old. It's more of a crumbling statue than a mech, she said as she looked at the rusted mess standing motionless on the tarmac. All right, let's check the buildings and see if there's anyone home. Rin said into her mic as she put on her environmental protection suit in the cargo bay along with a couple of the science team members. Olivia and Akif moved their mechs around the tarmac, looking for threats. Everything looked so incredibly old. The building ferrocrete looked like the surface of the moon pelted with meteorites. With the visibility of only a few hundred meters, the site seemed to be surrounded by a mustard yellow fog. Rin and the team rolled down the dropship ramp in an open-top four-wheel drive vehicle toward the closest building which looked like it was still intact, though the large metallic doors looked completely rusted over. Rolling to a stop, the four exited the vehicle and began to take readings, measurements of the building, and look for evidence that might hint as to who had might been the last occupant. When Rin walked up to the large hangar doors, it was obvious that they were not going to open on their own. She nudged some of the flaking rusted metal away with her boot before tapping her mic. Akif, can you come over here and knock on the door for us? Sure thing, Captain. How gentle, Akif asked as he marched the 40-ton calliope toward the building. Rin walked back toward the jeep and away from the doors as she replied, Hard enough to make a mark, but not so hard that we don't get invited back. With all the grace a gigantic war machine could muster, the calliope's right leg kicked out and thudded into the large doors. A wall of rusted metal fell away and cascaded down to the ferrocrete. The sound was intense, like a ringing bell, and Rin was glad that her environmental suit muffled it considerably. As Akif brought his foot back for another kick, Rin grabbed her laser pistol from the front passenger seat of the vehicle. The second kick punctured the doors, which shuddered and split apart under that impact. Olivia's laughter cut across the comms as Akif struggled to pull his mech's foot from the hole it had created. Can't take you anywhere in that thing, she chuckled. Keep your eyes open. This place might look a thousand years old, but we have no idea what Rin's warning was cut off the second after Akif pulled his mech's foot from the hole in the doors. The unmistakable blue artificial lightning of a PPC shot smacked into the mech's retreating foot, knocking Akif off balance and sending the mech crashing to the ferrocrete. 
Rin waved the science team back, sending them scurrying back around the corner of the building as she pulled her pistol and followed them. Quick to laughter as well as fury, Olivia growled into the comms as she unleashed her Thunderbolt 10S's PPC and large lasers fury into the door, which ignited and then melted under the tremendous heat. Normally her mech would have been able to handle that heat of the combined shock but here on this moon, with the temperature already outside the limits of what could keep a human alive, Olivia's cockpit was instantly sweltering. She cursed and fired her missiles into the gaping hole she just created, hoping to hit, or at least humble, whoever dared to fire at her comrade. Most of the missiles impacted the damaged doors, opening the hole wider. A few missiles did streak in, causing a rumble of explosions inside that Rin could feel through the side of the building she was now leaning against. Rin yelled into the comm, Hold fire. Stay out of the LOS. I don't want to blow the whole place apart. Hi, Captain, Olivia said as she sidestepped the Thunderbolt and moved alongside Akif away from the gaping holes in the doors. The sound of fires burning in the doorway was muffled by her suit, and things went quiet. No additional fire was coming from inside the building, so she told the science team to stay put while she crept alongside the doors to the opening Akif had kicked in them. It was dark inside, and when she peeked in, she couldn't make out much beyond the usual gear and occasional crate that typically litters a hangar. A second peek, longer this time, helped Rin's eyes adjust a bit to the darkness. She saw what looked like a turret set up near the back of the hangar, surrounded by sandbags. Not wanting to be incinerated by a PPC blast, Rin ducked back and tapped her mic. Akif moved the calliope around the corner of the structure. The mech's foot was charred from the PPC hit it took, and Rin knew he would want a little payback. The captain fed him the approximate height and distance from the back wall of the hangar, so he'd know where to fire. Roughly three meters away from the back corner, he turned his mech and dropped to one knee, lining up the plasma rifle with the approximate location of the turret. He wiped his olive-skinned brow before firing the weapon, which sent a blazingly hot chunk of plasma into the wall of the structure. The ferrocrete melted almost instantly. A second shot through the hole he created disappeared into the darkness, and Akif waited as the captain peeked in again. The turret was now a smoldering, half-melted mess of ruined metal and electronic parts. It was also a light source that lit up the back half of the hangar. On Rin's second look, she lingered and then stepped inside and away from the light coming in from the busted doors. Finally able to really see, the hangar looked empty except for those scattered crates, some myomer cabling, and a turret surrounded by sandbags. However, when she called the all clear and Olivia used her Thunderbolt's hand to rip open the doorway further, she noticed there was something odd about the sandbags. Creeping closer, her pistol out in hand, Rin moved closer to the smoldering turret. The hole in the doors was finally large enough and Akif stepped his mech into the hangar to provide cover, scanning the room with his plasma rifle. Olivia worked on the doors after that in order to wedge the Thunderbolt inside as well. Stepping close, Rin realized the sandbags were actually people. Well, the remains of what used to be people. Their desiccated and mummified bodies looked as if they had been dead a very long time in the heat of the hangar and the outside world. Rin crouched down and looked at their tattered uniforms. On their shoulders was the unmistakable symbol that made her blood run cold. What is it, Captain? Olivia asked, looking down at Rin from her mech's cockpit. Word of Blake. Moo Iota. I, I've, I've seen these patches before, but only in history roms. What the hell was the Word of Blake doing out here? Rin asked, looking at the other bodies in the circle. They either all died in a circle like this, or, or were placed here. Either way, this is, this is bizarre. That's usually the correct word for anything Word of Blake, right, Captain? Akif asked. Usually, Rin replied, reaching into the jacket of the nearest dead Blakist, finding his pockets completely empty. When she moved on to the next body, it was also completely devoid of any possessions. Standing up, Rin holstered her pistol and looked over the smoldering turret. It's possible they left this thing on auto-fire before they died? One last gift for the next person to walk through those doors? Rin frowned, disappointed that this HPG station was sullied by whatever the Blakists did here. The team finished the search of the hangar, finding the crates were empty, likely holding the parts of the destroyed turret. Now open to the elements, the bodies began to decay in the highly caustic atmosphere. Even the patches with the sword and the MI lettering began to disintegrate. 
It would have been disturbing, but Rin and the team were already on their way to the next building, and no one would witness the obliteration of the last act of this Word of Blake unit. In the next building, much smaller, Rin tugged on a heavily corroded steel door, trying to get inside, but it wouldn't budge. She pulled out her laser pistol, which was a special design with three barrels arranged in a manner that the three shots would gradually spread out. This quasi-shotgun effect resulted in a triangle of misery for the target. At five meters, each shot would be roughly three inches apart. Rin wasn't a marksman and appreciated the additional chance to hit whatever it was she was shooting at. This time, the bolts bored through the rusted metal of the door's lock, and with a firm tug, the door opened and then fell completely off its hinges. The captain had to step back to avoid being crushed by the falling steel. Akif, you're on watch. Olivia, I could use you down here, Rin said, peeking into the dark interior. Promises, promises, Olivia said, setting her thunderbolt up as if it were watching over the building before climbing out of her command chair and slipping into her environmental suit. A couple of minutes later, she had crawled down the max ladder and joined Rin at the doorway. Rin told the science team they could work outside until she sensed they all clear. They busied themselves as Rin and Olivia headed inside, each armed with a pistol and flashlight. The pair entered the building and were quickly confronted by a corpse leaning against the wall at the top of a set of stairs. It was in slightly better shape than those in the hangar, but not by much. In its bony, shriveled fingers was a directional charge. Olivia stepped between Rin and the explosive out of instinct, but it quickly became clear that it wasn't something about to go off. It, like everything else, looked ancient and inert. Olivia checked it anyway, making sure there were no leads heading out to cords that someone might nudge. Then they headed downstairs, pistols and flashlights pointing out into the darkness below. New Explorer Corps, First Arm, Spinward Operations Area, Three Jumps Outside the Antelo System, Rabbit's Foot, Chimishu Class Jump Ship, November 24th, 3151. Cal Levitt leaned against the holo table in shock as he looked at the science team video from the site. Even now, so many years after the rampaging horror they caused, the involvement of Word of Blake at this site made his hair stand on end. Those zealots were responsible for countless billions of deaths and the ruination of worlds across the inner sphere. For many, there was no better example of pure chaotic evil than the word of Blake. This time, it was Levitt sighing before he keyed up the comm down to the Holtz in the flight bay. Hey, uh, Holtz, not a direct concern, but let's make sure you're ready to go if needed, he said out of an abundance of caution. The Blakists might be dead, but he didn't want to assume anything at this point. Always are, Captain, Ariana responded into the comm link. The aerospace pilot was crouched under the wing of her Corax, replacing one of the medium lasers with the help of one of the techs. With a few more ratchet turns, the job was done and she could take a break. Her father was taking his four hours off in his bunk, so that gave her time to run the place. It had been just the two of them for a very long time since her mother died from cancer back on Bithynia in the Capellan Confederation. She wasn't old enough to remember her mom, but her father took the loss really hard. He gave up his company and decided to take Ariana on an adventure. Thirteen years later, she earned her wings, and ever since, the two of them have had little trouble finding work flying security for merchant vessels. For the most part, it was a pretty low-effort job. Trouble only sprang up occasionally, and it was never anything her father and Ariana couldn't handle. It was a good life, and Ariana was happy that her father found a new purpose. Getting to fly around and live the mercenary life was exciting. How many girls back in Bithynia could say they had flown an aerospace fighter in the periphery? Ariana ran her fingers through her short brown hair, suddenly in the mood for something with caffeine in it, especially if there was a remote possibility of some action. She set her tools down on the cart and walked over to the little kitchenette built into the corner of the flight deck. She was rummaging through the fridge there for something to drink when May, one of the mech warriors, popped into her comm line. Hi, it's May. Do you know anything about a hardware upgrade? I was just working on my mech and the tablet rebooted, saying it was installing an update, May's voice said. Ariana grabbed a can of something that might possibly be tea and popped the top before responding. Nothing down here. Did you ask your techs up there? They said to check with you down here, May replied. I'd kick it up to Lieutenant Levitt and see if there's something going on, Ariana said after draining the can. New Explorer Corps First arm, spinward operations area, three jumps outside the Antalo system, November 24th, 3151. Olivia scanned for any possible threats as the two reached the bottom of the stairway, which looked to be four or five floors down. 
At the bottom, the temperature was more bearable, though the darkness didn't agree with her at all. She much preferred the high perch of her thunderbolt looming over whatever she was shooting at, or stomping on. Rin put on a good show, but Olivia knew that the laser pistol she carried had never been used on a human being. You could always tell with these science geeks that if nonsense did go down, their shots would be wild. Then again, she did come up with a nifty way to deal with that turret. As they reached the end of that long, blown ferrocrete hallway, Olivia took the lead, entering what ended up being a large central control room for an HPG station. Both Rin and Olivia looked up in awe at the bank of large screens on the wall, electronic connections strung around the floors, and a single glowing computer screen sitting among many more that were off. Everything except that one glowing screen looked like it hadn't functioned in decades, if not centuries. Olivia scanned the room out of habit, just keeping her pistol handy. Rin walked over to the computer screen and tapped on the dusty keyboard in front of it. The glowing green screen flashed, then rolled through a series of processes that showed a login prompt. We'll need the science team down here to crack this. Let's get them down here, Rin said, eager to find out what secrets the system might still be holding. She was almost giddy at the prospect of getting her hands on some of the hard drives in the room. The information they could be holding might make the Combine and Wolves happy for a long time. Olivia walked to the room, making sure there were no hidden traps or surprises waiting for the science techs. When she reached the front of the room, in the corner farthest away from the door, she paused and named her flashlight at a corpse seemingly halfway stuffed into an open air vent. While obviously not the first body she'd seen today, this one was different because it was wearing a Comstar uniform, and there was a large bullet hole in the mummified man's forehead. You better come check this out, Captain, Olivia said, kneeling and examining the body. When Rin walked up, she too knelt down. Sure doesn't look like he was with the others, Rin said, noticing something in the palm of the man's left hand. When she peeled the fingers back with a rather disgusting series of cracks, she saw he was holding a folded piece of paper. It was a piece of Comstar stationery with a hastily scrawled note on it that read, I'm honored to have served, and that the rest of my team was able to escape before they came. I did my duty until the end, but fear what might be done when they get down here. I'm going to try to hide in the vents and see if I can disable the HPG permanently. At least then, they'll be as stuck as I am. Well, doesn't look like he was successful, Olivia said while standing back up. Partially, it seems. Considering the Blakis do seem to have ended up stranded, Rin said as she rifled through his pockets, finding some knickknacks, a wallet, a lighter, and a flash drive. She stuffed all of the items into her satchel and stood up. No ship, though. Olivia said as she looked around the room again. That means they were left here on purpose by someone. The science team entered the room and eagerly began to set up on the desks and at the working computer. Rin walked over and said, I want to know how this thing was still pulling data after so long. I bet our employers would love to have knowledge of that kind of automation. Yes, ma'am, said the nearest tech, who was already working on cracking the computer login. Others were pulling out computers, unscrewing the cases, and pulling hard drives as quickly as they could. I need to talk to Levitt and make sure he knows we're in one piece, Rin said, heading toward the hallway. Can you babysit them, Olivia? Olivia chuckled, rolled her eyes, and responded, At my rate, you're getting ripped off for babysitting services. Rin was so excited by the possibility of digging through Comstar data that she had to excuse herself. She practically bounded up the stairs with a grin ear to ear. At the top, she walked out into the miserable swirling yellow haze and waved up at Akif, who swayed the Calliope's rifle in return. Levitt, we've found something potentially big here at the HBG. If we can sort out how it's still up and running, that'll be the key to for more funding. It's finally coming together. I can't wait to see what is on these hard drives, Rin said, her voice giving away her enthusiasm. Due to distance, the response came several minutes later. Levitt's voice crackled a bit from the interference from the atmosphere and the radiation from the gas giant nearby. It said, Glad you're having fun. Let's not dawdle. The ship's ready to go, and I'd hate to have to take over should you decide to become a permanent resident down there. We're making progress and should be packing up soon. If you abandon us, you're going to have to deal with payroll, and I know how much you love accounting, Rin retorted. Back downstairs, the science techs were packing drives into their bags while the one at the working computer was finally cracking the login. Olivia watched from a short distance away, over the shoulder, as the science tech quickly sought to image the computer's drive onto a clean drive on the desk in front of him. After a few moments of data transfer, the screen flashed, catching the attention of almost everyone in the room. 
Then some speaker in the room began to read a statement in a digitized voice. It said, People of the inner sphere, citizens of the thousands of planets settled by mankind, once you were united under the Star League, but for three hundred years savage wars have consumed your worlds, until a new enemy appeared, mysterious invaders known as the clans. Powerful and ruthless, they struck like lightning, driving a wedge deep into the inner sphere. They made one mistake. They threatened hallowed Terra and had to face the warriors of Blessed Blake. In the spirit of the Star League, ancient foes reunited and we took the fight to the enemy's homeworlds. Citizens of the Inner Sphere, beware. Your leaders have betrayed you in this moment of triumph. Together we stood in the eye of the golden future the third transfer would have ushered in. But when the time came, your leaders faltered, once more letting their own petty weaknesses and jealousies rip apart one of mankind's greatest achievements. Now the Master comes, bearing the torch of Blake's wisdom. See the light and revive the Star League, or face the cleansing fire as we burn away the corruption of those who have betrayed us. The peace of Blake be with you. When the voice stopped, everyone in the control room sat in silence for a few moments, taking in the message from the past. Finish up, people, Olivia said in an effort to wake the science team from their stunned stupor. The tech at the computer was barely turned back toward it when the screen flashed and then went dark. Well, that's ominous. We're done, people. Get your crap and get going, Olivia ordered, increasingly uncomfortable with being in this mausoleum of Word of Blake's madness. Two minutes later, they were all topside, and Olivia yelled at Rin that they were leaving. Unused to taking orders from her crew, Rin was taken back for a moment before nodding and getting into the vehicle that raced toward the dropship. Climbing the rungs for the Timberwolf's ladder, Olivia cursed the whole way. The last thing she wanted was to have any connection to that murderous cult. All of the houses of the Inner Sphere went out of their way to wipe out any trace of the Word of Blake years ago. And now, there were satchels full of hard drives, full of who knows what. An hour later, Alalia was lifting off from the surface on plumes of smoke and plasma from the engines. As it finally slipped from the gravity of the sulfurous moon, Olivia marched up to the bridge to confront her captain. When she walked in, the satchels full of drives were sitting next to the hollow table. Captain, that place was tainted by the word of Blake. If anyone finds out we have their tech, we'll be everyone's target, she sternly spoke to Rin. The captain was reviewing the words of a recorded message, replaying them on the hollow table and pondering their significance of every word. She didn't react to Olivia's statement. Olivia was about to yell it again this time when Rin wiped away the table and said, We're fine. The drives will be checked for useful scientific and geographic information and then destroyed. This is why we're here, Mech Warrior. We need to be flexible and take advantage of opportunities like this to learn our history. Our history? Olivia asked with a raised eyebrow. The history of the inner sphere, Rin clarified. If we get painted as word of Blakeists for having this, we won't have any safe port for the rest of our lives. We'll be hunted for sport, Olivia stated plainly, firmly crossing her arms over her chest. That won't happen. We're going to pull the data and transfer it to the Combine and the Wolves. They want this info. That'll be the end of it, Rin said confidently, with more authority. She added, That's all, Mac Warrior. Yes, ma'am, Olivia said in a flat tone, turning on her heels and marching out of the Alalia's bridge. Finally taking a breath, Rin let out a long sigh, hoping that what she just explained was the truth. Lieutenant Levitt's voice interrupted the moment with a question from the rabbit's foot. He asked, Captain, did you notice the HPG link went down? Please say that wasn't your doing. Sort of, came Rin's reply. She looked out at the windows, at the gas giant in the distance, feeling an optimism she hadn't felt since the expedition started. She expected a snarky response, but none came. The comms link with the rabbit's foot's down, Captain. End Part 5 Republic of the Sphere, Terra Firma, New Nystal, May 6th, 3140 What am I supposed to do with all this junk? Rin said, looking over the storage pod that had been delivered to the Akrae's cargo bay. Maybe there's something worthwhile in it? Wasn't your grandfather one of those science nuts? Levitt said, running his hand through his dark hair. Astrophysics. He was obsessed with sorting out how the universe worked, Rin said, nudging a box of notebooks with her booted foot. It ended up causing a lot of damage to his relationships. 
I guess I can find some time to go through it. Maybe there's some trinkets worth hawking for some cash? Levitt smiled as he shifted a couple of boxes, peering in at all the paperwork, scientific equipment, and Comstar knickknacks. Rin sighed as she recalled the only interaction she had had with her grandfather. She was a small child at the time, and the memory was hazy. She remembered his white beard and a face that was both aged and scarred. It scared her at the time, but that's all she could remember. I'll dig into this later. We need to get moving. The little detour we just did is going to cost us time we don't have, Rin said as she turned and walked out of the cargo bay heading toward the bridge. Let's go check out our new jump ship. New Explorer Corps, First Arm, Spinward Operations Area, Draconis Combine, Land's End, December 17th, 3151. Most of the content on the drives was either corrupted or useless. However, the astronomical tables, historical data including positioning of planets and the systems in the region would be useful for scientific analysis. It was the kind of stuff that would make astronomers giddy. Rind hoped it would be enough to keep the wolves in the combine happy enough to cover the costs of refueling and supplying the expedition. Until they received word, the rabbit's foot was camped out in the system jump point, taking on supplies that were slowly dwindling the modest savings that Rin had accumulated over the years. The captain sat in the private cabin, filtering through the terabytes of data the techs were able to pull from the drives, hoping to find some info that will help guide their next jumps out into the periphery. She had read some documents, listened to others as she worked out, and was generally nonplussed about what she heard. The technical gibberish was all the normal things you would expect, but Rin really didn't understand why she felt so disappointed to find out exactly what she had expected to find. On the verge of giving up, she stumbled across an audio file with an innocuous name among many others. She opened it and started listening. Down in the cargo bay, Tenika and Vasil were organizing gear and supplies. Barrels of fuel, food, machine oil, and spare parts all needed to be secured before the dropship could make the journey back to the rabbit's foot. Techs from the Alalia and the spaceport mingled and moved crates with forklifts, all while Vasil watched closely. If his steely glare was a laser, it would have cut through armor plate like a knife through butter. What's up, Vasil? Tenika asked while looking up at the elemental. Vasil briefly glanced down before going back to watching the laborers like, well, a falcon. As usual, his voice boomed in Tenika's ears when he spoke. Too many unknown personnel, in and out. This is a security risk. Tenika looked around, seeing that Vasil had a point, though it was probably a bit paranoid to think that anyone would want much to do with their expedition. I appreciate that you're always on the lookout, though. I'm a little concerned with your blood pressure. Do jade falcons ever take a break, or is it always an on sort of thing? Tenika asked, smirking up at Vasil. Vasil pondered the question, as if it weren't rhetorical, and responded, We have our fun from time to time. Tenika noticed the side of his mouth curl up slightly in what might be mistaken for a smirk if you squinted, in low light, in the back of a darkened storage bin. She shook her head, marked off another delivered pallet on her tablet, and said, I saw that. New Explorer Corps, First Arm, Spinward Operations Area, Draconis Combine, Land's End, Nadir Jump Point, December 17th, 3151. After 36 hours of this nonsense, Lieutenant Cal Levitt was no longer in his normal jovial mood. The technicians and the science team had been pulled off of their usual assignments to deal with a string of communications and navigational issues that had plagued them ever since their visit to the abandoned HPG. During one of the jumps towards Land's End, the jump ship's entire computer system rebooted just minutes before they were to be hurled 23 light years through space. The hiccup ended up costing an entire day as the crew had been put into sourcing where these erroneous commands were coming from. Finally, after reaching the land's end jump point, Levitt was able to formulate a plan of action that involved collecting every piece of electronics that contained an operating system and a connection to the ship's network in order to do a mass wipe and fresh install. Dr. Powell from the science team was able to determine there was a software update triggered in several of the systems while they were in the mysterious HPG system. Normally, an older piece of software wouldn't have tried to install over a newer one, but this one did. The ancient code ended up causing a cascade of issues that Levitt was really just now hoping that he had a grasp on, as they waited for the captain and the crew of the Alalia to return from the station orbiting land's end. It had been nearly four hours since any error had been detected, and it was the longest stretch of time so far. Levitt looked down at the chronometer on the holotable and sighed audibly. It was a habit that he was increasingly starting to mimic from Rin 
and several of the deck crew had made comments. All right, it's been four hours. Let's call it for now. But I want to know immediately if anyone on the ship notices any anomalies. If we end up jumping into the middle of a star, the captain will stay alive just long enough to ring our bell just out of pure spite, Levin said into the ship-wide calm. The crew across the ship felt a wave of relief as the effort to eradicate the malicious software had taken so much time and effort from everyone. In the mech warrior cabins, May lay back on her bunk, her straight black hair cascading over the side and dangling in view of Olivia, who was reading a frayed book in her bunk underneath the fellow mech warrior. Well, that was fun, May said as she closed her eyes. Olivia was still feeling the frustration following the business back at the HPG. Anything involving the word of Blake filled her with worry. She hadn't signed up for this job to end up labeled a zealot and hunted down. She had been cold toward the captain on the journey back to Land's End, and was planning to confront Rin about making sure the drives were all destroyed and her return to the rabbit's foot. She banished the concern for the moment and tilted her head up towards May's dangling hair. She said, It's a shame we're on ice up here. We could have torn things up down there on Land's End. Doubtful. Even this far out from the core, mercs aren't popular with the Combine, May said, with her eyes still closed. I bet we could find something, Olivia paused as Akif walked into the room, wrapped in a towel returning from a shower. She continued in a joking tone. Feels like Akif is the only one around here who doesn't have gray hair, and he's got that rotten personality, so that's a wash. Akif chuckled as he slid into a fresh pair of clothes. He retorted, Your barely restrained desire is noted. Olivia was about to respond with another jab when May leaned over the edge of the bunk, blocking her view of Akif. She smiled and added, Next time you're in battle, go ahead and let him die. I won't tell. I heard that, Akif said on his way out of the cabin. New Explorer Corps, First Arm, Spinward Operations Area, Draconis Combine, Land's End, Nadir Jump Point, December 18th, 3151. Lieutenant Levitt watched the holographic representation of the dropship Alalia slowly approach the nadir jump point and felt some relief. After the last week, it was comforting to know Rin was on her way back, and from the message she'd sent before departing, it seemed the Combine was covering the costs of this resupply. While there was no word from the wolves, the message seemed positive. Levitt had always supported his friend, and after so many years of planning for this expedition, success felt deserved. Tapping the holovid table with his finger, he scanned the bridge and tried to recall the first time he had stepped into it so long ago. Rin had bought out his contract for some ludicrous amount of money from the Merc unit he was with at the time, and he had given her endless amounts of ribbing for it. She was a bright-eyed and optimistic captain of a ship she had inherited, and she had a lot to prove. Levitt had been there the whole time. They had been friends for so long that it only made sense that he be there to back her up as she headed out into the periphery even if he didn't feel the same passion for the mission that she did. Not that anyone really could. I want to be ready to jump the second the captain is back, Levitt said to the bridge crew, who were already well on their way to making that happen. There was a flurry of yes sirs, and he stopped the tapping. Captain Rin Barrett, New Explorer Corps, December 10th, 3151. Captain, the transfer of scientific data is deemed acceptable for continuing our arrangement. Included in this message is the code to authorize the transfer of funds. We appreciate your continued discretion in all matters. Mio Sato, Deputy, Bureau of Interstellar Trade, Draconis Combine. The paper printout of the message from Deputy Sato folded neatly in Rin's hands as she sat in the command chair on the bridge of the Alalia. She felt even more tired than usual after dealing with all the paperwork needed to pay off station officials and for the supplies now crammed into the cargo hold of the dropship. As easy as it had been to promise Olivia that she would destroy all the drives, the new content that she had discovered was too good to pass up. Rin had listened to the audio files of reports, speeches, and communications dispatches during her off hours, and admittedly had fallen asleep listening to them several times. It was just too fascinating to ignore the glimpse into Comstar's past just as things were starting to fall apart. With a deep sigh, she tapped a link in the armrest of the chair and replayed an audio file she had listened to dozens of times already. Only a unifying threat could bring the true cooperation of the third transfer. A danger so great, no man could stand idly by and allow it to exist in his universe. Terra herself united behind such a threat when the threat of overpopulation and governmental collapse hit its peak. The first Star League brought mankind together to end the age of endless, pointless war. 
The clans brought us together again, but without a unifying leader. Rin's eyes scanned the bridge, then looked out into the void beyond the thick glass that separated her from the vacuum. The second was the passage of Holy Terra to our true order, after we purged those who could no longer believe. After a long sigh, her eyes feeling heavy, closing them just for a moment to get a few seconds of rest. But as a new order, unifying, rising from the ashes of the old, bringing back the balance we lost when the Camerons fell. New Explorer Corps, First Arm, Spinward Operations Area, Seven Jumps from Land's End, January 30th, 3152. You're tapping again. Captain Rin Barrett said with frustration as she leaned against the armrest of the command chair. Her normally tightly braided, curly auburn hair was a bit out of sorts as it escaped her white officer's cap. Cal Levitt, her second in command, immediately stopped tapping his fingers on the taller table and apologized. He looked tired, and Rin was sure she looked worse. Now seven jumps away from Land's End, where they were able to resupply and turn over their discovered data. When will we have the updated jump coordinates to factor in the new star set? Rin asked as she turned to the navigator. The woman in her mid-twenties was busy looking at several screens and pulling information from both before concentrating on a third. After a several second pause, she said, We should have new coordinates in just a few minutes. Looks like our best jump is to this main sequence white dwarf designated J4884B2 on the table. Both Rin and Levitt looked over at the hollow table as the navigator pulled the star up for a close-up view. She continued, from the wobble and light occlusion, it looks like there are at least a couple of planets in the system. What's our second best jump? Rin asked, with only slightly masked frustration. She knew her tone was off because Levitt looked over at her and shook his head. He's right, it's not her fault that the past three jumps have been duds. Only one of the stars had a rocky planet, and it was baked to a crisp by a red giant star it was orbiting. She sighed, sat up a bit in the chair, and said, All right, we jump in fifteen. Let's make a show of this one and shake the dust off. I want the Holtz and their fighters and prepped. Olivia and Akif, you're in the hot seats. Levitt smiled and said, Yes, ma'am, before turning and passing along the orders over the rabbit's foot comms. Wren might be feeling tired, but they were sure to find something soon. Fifteen minutes later, the rabbit's foot jumped 28.2 light years further away from the rest of humanity. New Explorer Corps, First Arm, Spinward Operations Area, Eight Jumps from Land's End, February 5th, 3152. The blue-green planet was a tantalizing prospect even before the radio signals were picked up. It was clearly just background noise and not a deliberate attempt at contact in the jump ship as it sat on the host star's zenith jump point. Rin listened closely to the voices, which had a strange cadence and some of the words were familiar yet pronounced oddly. After several hours of listening in what sounded like weather reports and local civics discussions, Rin began to prep her orders for a trip down to the surface. Because this planet had inhabitants, she wanted to make sure that they would be well prepared for any eventuality. That included three out of the four battle mechs, with their mech warriors and Vasil, just in case they needed someone who could navigate clan social structure. With the Akrai as the new backup dropship following its repairs, the mule-class dropship Alelia undocked and started its burn toward the planet. Seventy-six hours later, the dropship was setting up a course to land just outside what looked like the planet's largest settlement. That seemed to be the best word for it, rather than city or even town, as the imagery taken by the Alalia's drones showed cobbled-together structures mixed with what looked like a considerable amount of wreckage. The remnants of the scar across the plain suggested that a large ship had crashed there at some point in the distant past. The settlement rose among what was left. At least, that was the science team's best guess as they sifted through the photos and video. The team was ready on touchdown. Just seconds after the dropship settled on its landing struts, the loading ramps opened. Tenika's intimidating Zeus led the way, stopping a few dozen yards to stand guard as May's commando and Olivia's thunderbolt stomped down the ramps. As the three mechs set up a semicircle around the dropship, Rin walked down the ramp with Vasil in his battle armor a few meters away along with the science team. It would have been quite the scene for anyone who watched, though no one seemed to have come to see the show. Rin tasted some wind-blown dust in her mouth as she felt the warmth of a star on her face for the first time in months. The planet was a relatively comfortable temperature, though a little drier than Rin would have preferred. Everything had a fine layer of dust on it, likely from the shifting global winds that carried it from the planet's equatorial deserts. She looked off past the mechs toward the settlement, somewhat disappointed that no one seemed eager to greet them. 
Tanaka and Vasil, you're with me. Let's go meet the neighbors, Rin said, telling the science team to begin their work under the safety of the dropship ramps and the guns of the commando and Thunderbolt. Crates were unpacked, computers set up, and science drones prepped as the trio of human, elemental, and battle mech walked toward the settlement. It was obvious from that ground-level viewpoint that the ship that had crashed there long ago was massive. Do you think it was a warship? Rin asked into the comm link on her collar. At least a heavy cruiser. However, there look to be multiple ships here. Look at the paint, Basil said as he started to lead Rin a bit on the approach to reduce the possible angles of incoming fire on the captain. Tenika stepped very slowly with her Zeus to prevent outpacing Rin, only taking a step every five or six seconds. Sure enough, Rin could see the worn remnants of multiple paint schemes on the wreckage. Back at the dropship, Olivia watched the trio walk into the settlement. The Zeus looked almost comical, trying to step its way through what passed as a through street. After several seconds of wanting to laugh about it into the calm, Olivia pulled her gaze back to the horizon, scanning for any possible threats. Her mind wandered again to the HPG planet and the hard drives that the captain had promised to destroy. Olivia had tried to talk to the captain about it several times, only to be shut down pretty hard when Rin said the matter had been dealt with. She wanted to believe the captain, but a nagging doubt persisted. May broke calm silence while slowly walking her commando around the dropship. This wouldn't be a half-bad place to set up shop so long as you're into rusted metal and sand, she said with her usual soft and even tone. Olivia smirked but didn't give May the satisfaction of a laugh. Instead, she responded, I had no idea you were such a romantic. Why don't you bring that commando over here and propose on one knee? May chuckled. You're out of my league, mech warrior. Plus, you're pretty high maintenance in that thunderbolt. The better to stomp on you with, my dear, Olivia said as she scanned the bits of rock and scattered ship wreckage. Basil carefully looked into some of the smaller structures that lined the packed dirt street but came up with nothing but abandoned debris covered in dust. Rin sighed, frustrated that this opportunity was turning out to be a waste of time. She had read stories from the Comstar days, with the Explorer Corps discovering a long-lost human colony and bringing them back into the fold. Rin felt a little embarrassed by how badly she wanted that to be the case with this settlement. She was begrudgingly getting closer to admitting the bloom was coming off of this rose. Captain, the radio signal is coming from up ahead, Basil said as he began to move up ahead toward the rusted steel structure. Rin dropped her hand down to her holster and unsnapped it, just in case, as the elemental kneeled down to peek inside the structure through a wide doorway. Vasil swept the room with the small laser that made up his battle armor's left arm, but all he saw inside were some tables, scattered chairs, and a radio set hooked up to a computer on a table resting on the back wall. Vasil kept a lookout at the doorway while Ren walked in, laser pistol in hand. Tenika scanned in her Zeus, looking up and down the street as the captain disappeared through the doorway. Reaching the radio, Rin looked down at it and noted that it was the only thing she had seen so far which didn't have a fine layer of dust on it, from its keyboard and deck. When she reached down and hit the spacebar, the computer screen flickered to life. On it was written two words in green digital text. Rin only had a moment to process the words, Got ya, before she heard explosions in the distance and the rattling of autocannon fire. It's an ambush, Rin yelled as she turned back to head out toward the door. Seeing Vasil leveling his small laser down the street and firing, the hair on Rin's arm stood up as the small laser ionized the air. A grenade landed at Vasil's armored feet, but he kicked it as soon as it had arrived. The explosion caused no damage, but Rin was knocked back, her ears ringing so hard her head throbbed. She looked around on the ground for her laser pistol as it had slipped from her hands moments before. Vasil's voice broke through the ringing, sternly but calmly saying, Stay here. We will handle this. The Zeus stepped backward to get some space on the concealed firing positions that were pouring fire into Tenika's mech. Dozens of different weapons were all firing at her at the same time, and while Tenika was starting to return that fire, her shots paled in comparison to the damage her mech was receiving. None of the weapons were causing much damage on their own, but the cumulative effect was driving the Zeus back and eventually down to one knee. Armor melted, chipped, and blasted off the mech even as she fired her medium pulse lasers into the wreckage around her. Lining up a shot where she saw tracers of autocannon fire, she squeezed the trigger on her stick and the Zeus thudded with the generation of an artificial lightning bolt. It crackled through the air and slammed into the already twisted steel. Solids became boiling liquids and the firing from that gun ceased. Tenika grimaced as her cherished mech started to fight her more and more. 
forced down to one knee when the left leg actuator buckled, she cursed and hit the shutdown override. She saw Vasil running and firing at various targets as he tried to reach the Zeus, but she screamed into the comm link, Get to the captain! Get her out of here while they're focusing on me! The elemental hesitated, stopping and looking back at the Zeus for a few seconds before turning and heading back to the captain. Over the link, she heard his voice say, Stay alive, friend. Today is not your last day. And it filled her with courage. Their friendship had grown strong in the time since they had met on the station, and she knew that today wasn't going to be the day. She lifted the mech's arm and fired the PPC again. The azure lightning slammed and then melted into the side of a firing position, and then completely threw it. Vasil was furious at himself for letting his comrades fall into this ambush. It was his job to keep the captain safe, and he had clearly failed. As he reached the doorway where Rin was cowering, he reached out with his clawed hand. She looked up at him. Her tired and scared face now looked slightly confused until he said over the comm, We have to go. I can carry you. Tenika is buying us time. Rin looked up at the elemental's view screen and nodded, standing up and then letting him pick her up with his right arm. The next few moments were a blur as Vasil began to run as quickly as he could down the street, firing the small laser at targets of opportunity along the way. Dirt and dust was kicked up around the fleeing pair as the small arms fire chased them and pelted the back of the battle armor. Rin leaned back and looked for Tenika's mech, wanting to scream as the machine slowly crumbled to the ground. Every inch of the mech's armor was pockmarked, melted, or missing entirely, and the Zeus had no choice but to join the rest of the wreckage around it. Vasil tried to focus on what was ahead rather than the pain he wanted to feel for Tenika. She would be okay. She was too stubborn to die. At least that's what he told himself as he broke from the cover of the buildings and raced towards the dropship. When Rin turned her head back to look, she saw that Olivia and May were locked into a fight of their own around the dropship. Light vehicles were circling the ship, taking shots at the mechs and the ship like two dozen mosquitoes. They were incredibly hard to hit, though the few turrets on the Alelia were doing their best to provide covering fire, while the science team scrambled back into the dropship. Rin heard May's voice spewing a chain of curse words in Chinese over the short-range comms, and it would have been humorous if their entire mission wasn't in jeopardy. Olivia was standing her ground at the base of one of the ramps, taking aimed shots trying to lead the light vehicles. She was occasionally scoring hits and rendering those vehicles into scrap, but with so many it felt helpless. May's commando fired its weapons and then began to run at the vehicles. Her fury was apparent as she managed to catch one with a kick, which sent the truck and its occupants spinning a dozen times before smashing back into the hard-packed earth. Vasil managed to run through the fray and up the ramp before setting the captain down. She quickly retreated further inside and he was off, triggering his jump jets and leaping up into the air. Olivia followed May's lead and began to push out from the dropship, forcing the vehicles to either increase the size of their circle or risk being kicked and crushed. Some of them chose option A, and some went with option B. Huge clouds of dust were being kicked up into the air as the air cracked with laser fire and autocannon rounds. SRMs from May's mech spiraled into one of the slower-moving heavy technicals, and it blew apart so catastrophically that there was just scattered burning pieces remaining. A vehicle swerved close, rolling to a stop near the Thunderbolt's leg, and several soldiers hopped out carrying satchels. One climbed up onto the mech's left leg, which triggered the sensors and warned Olivia what was happening. She sidestepped the thunderbolt quickly, catching the climber off guard. He dropped the satchel, which fell to the ground and exploded at his partner's feet. The thunderbolt showed a considerable chunk of damage on the foot from that close call, but it was better than having a blown-out knee actuator. The climber hung on as the thunderbolt broke into a jog, trying to shake him off. He would have been successful if a metallic claw hadn't wrapped around his ankle. With a firm tug, he was forced to let go, and Vasil triggered his jump jets, sending both him and the soldier he was carrying up into the air. At the apex of his jump, Vasil let go and let gravity do its job as he aimed to land near another circling vehicle. Seeing the flailing man fall over 80 meters and slam into the ground made Olivia smirk. She pulled up the comms as she lined up another shot, saying, I didn't know you clanners had style. She received a reply even as she watched the elemental fire at small laser into the engine block of a truck that instantly caught fire. Vasil said, We are all in a battle with gravity, some more than others. Seeing the battle shifting, the remaining dozen vehicles began to peel off and head toward the safety of the settlement's wreckage. The mechs gave chase and fired into their retreat until Captain Rin's voice came over the comm and told them to hold back, that the settlement itself was a mech-killing trap. Where's Tenika? 
May yelled into the comm link. She held the line so that we could get the captain out, Basil replied, barely containing his fury as his adrenaline flowed. We have to go get her, May replied. I will, Basil said. He wanted to break orders that moment and head into the settlement, but decades of conditioning made that impossible, so he ran back into the dropship instead. Everyone get onto the ship. We're going to relocate. We aren't leaving until we get Tenaka back. Rin spoke into the comm link, trying to sound like a captain should sound like in that moment, even though she was shaking. The mechs stomped their way back onto the dropship, and five minutes later it was in the air. Riding on plumes of plasma, three kilometers away from the settlement, it settled back down on a small plateau. Rin sighed as she walked into the cargo bay where Vasil was still standing in his battle armor, looking as ready for a fight as he was before. Instead of tackling that wall, Rin turned towards Olivia and May, who both looked extremely pissed off. We will get her back, Rin said, seeking to placate their anger, then adding, We need a plan. In the darkness of the cockpit, Tenika stewed silently. The last thing she saw before closing her neurohammer off and the power systems dying was an endless sea of red warning flashes, error reports, and override warnings. The cockpit was filled with black smoke, and she could smell the hint of burning plastic and wiring even though her helmet was sealed and she was using her emergency air supply. The straps of her harness dug into her shoulders, and her head wanted to fall, so she must have been sitting at an angle. Ejection was an option, but Tenika dismissed that. Losing your battle mech was one of the most traumatic experiences a mech warrior could live through, and was compounded by the fact that her loss wasn't in a straight-up fight with another mech, but ambushed by cowards. Looking forward, all Tenika could see was the dirt and scattered metal debris that was everywhere in the settlement. No. No ejection. They'd have to dig her out of the mech with crowbars and torches. Until then, she would sit and wait. Maybe, if they took long enough, Vasil and the others could rip them apart. Tenika smiled at the prospect of her favorite clanner tearing these thugs into pieces. Maybe she can live long enough to see it. They would come for her, or at least, they would make these thugs regret their ambush. She took a deep breath, found her calm, and waited as she started to hear the sounds of boots on the armor of the Zeus's head. End Part 7 New Explorer Corps, First Arm, Spinward Operations Area, System J4884B2, February 6, 3152, Dawn. Captain Rin Barrett stood silently several hundred yards away from the ship wreckage and buildings that made up the settlement that had been so very unwelcome the day before. Behind her, just yards away, stood Olivia's Thunderbolt in silent, motionless vigil. They had marched down from the small plateau that overlooked the settlement just an hour before, just as the star was rising behind them on the dawn dusty light. The mech cast a long shadow that almost reached the dirt street of the settlement. Rin waited, knowing that if they stomped their mechs into the settlement, they could very well lose another one. Instead, the wind blew dust over her boots, and the seconds and minutes passed. More than once, she felt the urge to order the mechs to fire on the settlement and wipe out those who cut down Tenika's Zeus. It would likely be an easy route, if not for the almost certain death of the young mech warrior. Without a response, after several more minutes, she opened her comm link with Olivia and told her it was time to wake them up. Even with earplugs, the sound of the particle projection cannon firing so close to where she was standing gave Rin a throbbing headache. It crackled over much of the wreckage that made up the settlement, though it did hit several of the larger struts that protruded up into the sky. As quickly as it lashed out, the energy dissipated, leaving only the crackling of a few fires caused by dripping metallic slag. Almost a full minute passed, and Rin was about to ask for a second shot when Olivia called down from her high perch. Captain, we've got someone on their way out, she said through the comms. Rin felt relief, as perhaps there was still a way to find an end to this nonsense without bloodshed. From the blowing dust, she could gradually make out the man slowly walking out past the bits of ship and metal structures. As he approached, she could make out his worn clothing of grays and faded reds. He wore a wide-brimmed hat that looked like something from out of one of those ancient kids' cartoons about wrangling cowfolk. In his hand, he carried a rifle of a make and model that Rin couldn't recognize. At about ten meters, the man stopped and looked up, showing Rin his face for the first time. Weathered and sun-baked, he could have been about 40 or 80, depending upon how harsh life had treated him. Rin slowly moved her hand from the laser pistol in its holster as it looked like he wasn't in a hurry to shoot her. 
The two just looked at each other for a few moments before the man asked in a gravelly voice, You want something? Considering her answer for a moment, Rin responded, I'd like my mech warrior and what is left of her mech back. This time, it was someone else's turn to take a deep sigh. You get her back and your mechs obliterate the settlement a moment later, the man said. I am Captain Rin Barrett of the New Explorer Corps. I have no interest in harming you. We only sought to make contact with what we thought was a settlement, Rin said in an as authoritative a tone as possible. Well, from the fourteen dead friends I have under a tarp back there, I'd say you have at least a little interest in it, the man said. Rin furrowed her brow, briefly considering drawing her pistol to shoot him. Instead, she said, You did lure us into an ambush and fire on us first. Shooting second in a fight with Battlemech is a surefire way to get wiped out by pirates, the man retorted as he adjusted his casual grip on his rifle. We aren't pirates, Rin said. So you claim. Doesn't matter. The damage is done. Get on your ship and piss off, he added. Rin looked out toward the dropship and pondered the plan for a moment. On the far side of the settlement, Vasil was waiting and hiding for a signal to head into the settlement. After nearly a minute, she said, I'm sorry about your friends, but we cannot leave without Tenika, using her name to foster that personal connection. Can we propose a trade? What does your settlement need that we might have on our ship? Your mechs are nice. You can leave us one, the man replied as he gazed up at the white thunderbolt. Try again, Rin said. We've got some food and medical gear. How much of that do you have out here? We get by, the man replied. On the other side of the settlement, Vasil lay in his battlesuit behind the closest rock outcropping he could get to without risking discovery. May was a few hundred yards further back in her commando. He had been there, motionless, for four hours, and was waiting for the signal if things went poorly for Rin's negotiations. He watched the conversation play out over a small cam link in his heads-up display thanks to the feed provided by Olivia's Thunderbolt. Every moment of the wait annoyed him. These people had taken his friend and destroyed her mech. Through the few years he was a clan Jade Falcon warrior, he understood how those two things could devastate someone. He needed to get her out of this place. Vasil flipped through the various vision modes in his heads-up display, looking for where people might be hiding. A few locations jumped out as good spots to set up weapons, and after looking at the video from the ambush, he had nearly two dozen other spots where shots originated. This time, he would be the hunter. All he needed was the signal, or a move from the man with the rifle. If he lifted that rifle, he would be racing into the fray, and May would be rolling in with her commando as soon as she could clear the terrain from where she was hiding. I wish this could have gone differently, Rin said before adding, We only wanted to help. The man laughed condescendingly before replying, And look at the result of your arrogance. That one stung. Rin looked away again, trying to come up with a solution here that wouldn't involve more bloodshed. We can... In the distance, a shot rang out, which drew the attention of both Rin and the man. He lifted his rifle in an instinctual response, and a half-second later an explosion ripped through one of the buildings on the far side of the settlement. You pirate trash! He screamed as he brought his rifle to his shoulder. Too late, as Rin's pistol fired and three blackened holes were burned into the target's chest. Unable to take another breath, the man slowly stepped back, the rifle dropping from his hands to the dusty ground. He looked at her with a mixture of shock and hatred. She stared into his eyes and watched his face as he slumped to the ground. A tear rolled down Rin's cheek as she felt the crushing impact of failure. As she slumped to her knees in the dirt, Olivia stepped the thunderbolt in front of the captain and began to select targets among the buildings and wreckage for return fire. Small plumes of dust kicked up around Rin as she looked down at the gun in her hand. The carnage taking place in front of her dulled to gentle thuds. The rattling cacophony of autocannon and machine gun fire rang out, but sounded very far away in her ears. She couldn't muster the will to stand, or even move for cover, as every corner window, and debris pile seemed to be spewing fire in all directions. At her, at the two mechs, now advancing, and at Vasil, who was up and running the second he saw the man's rifle go up to his shoulder. Both Olivia and May were keeping to targets near the edges of the settlement, betting that it was unlikely that Tenika would be kept on the outskirts. The Thunderbolt and Commando began to circle the perimeter, firing when a target was clearly exposed and firing at them. 
The plan was to cause distraction without causing too much damage. Basil's job was to infiltrate and find Tenneka as quickly as possible, hopefully before it was too late. In and out of structures, Vasil fired the occasional small laser burst as rounds ricocheted off of his armor. Every moment that passed was increasing the likelihood that Tenneka would be harmed. Bursting into one room, which involved most of the entire pressed steel wall collapsing around it, an astonished group of young people looked up at the elemental in sheer terror. Vasil looked them over quickly, seeing that their gear was cobbled together nonsense, and ran past them out the other side of the building. Steel lean-tos, improvised bunkers, hallways, and the occasional brief exchange of gunfire filled the next few minutes of his life. Rin stood slowly and holstered her pistol. Lifting her gaze, she saw the worst-case scenario of their plan playing out, and it made her sick to her stomach. Damn these people for making her do this. All she wanted to do was help, and now people were dying. They stole a moment from her, a moment she felt she deserved after doing so much work. Stepping forward, ignoring the occasional shots that still came her direction, Rin walked up to the body of the man who now glared motionless at the sky. At that moment, something broke in her. She couldn't vocalize what it was, but she felt the impact and the consequential loss. Olivia efficiently employed her ER medium lasers to carve out positions, silencing the larger guns that lashed out at her and May's mechs. Gradually, the minor damage being inflicted to her mech's armor dwindled to just small arms fire and the occasional near miss for mortar rounds. Deeper within the structure of the crashed warship, Vasil was working up to a fevered anger. Every room he checked as he forced his way deeper into the settlement was one room closer to Tenneka, and every second that passed was also one second closer to losing her. As he descended into the lower levels, the number of soldiers firing at him dwindled, and the number of families and children increased. Often they huddled in abject terror as the gigantic battle-armored figure peeked into rooms and moved on. His armor scraped the sides and the ceilings of the hallways and rooms as they were never met to fit an elemental. This noise intensified the fear of the settlement's inhabitants as Vasil continued his search. Outside, the firing weapons eventually petered out as small groups of people surrendered and walked out away from the buildings with their hands up. May and Olivia stopped circling the structures, meeting up to watch over the increasing crowd of prisoners. It was clear that the settlement's defenders would not be able to replicate the destruction of Tenneka's Zeus twice over without the element of surprise. Most sat looking shell-shocked. Others tended to their wounded peers. Captain Wren wiped away an angry tear as she walked away from the settlement toward the ridge where the Alalia waited. She wanted nothing more to do with this planet. She wasn't even sure she wanted to continue the mission. All she could feel was a growing anger. A near silence fell over the settlement as the last of the defenders walked out and sat down at the feet of the mechs. Nearly sixty by Olivia's count as she scanned her eyes over them looking for any hidden threats. Basil, what's a good word? We're all wrapped up and quiet out here. Olivia spoke into the comms, trying to conceal her concern for the outcome of the search. The comms were silent, and it felt like a long time before May chimed in. There's probably some interference with all the steel in the way. Her concerned tone was much more obvious. The wind shifted again, bringing more dust to settle on the prisoners who sat in silence, many of which looked like they were extras from one of those old docudrama holovids on the succession wars. She put out a second call for Vasil, but only got silence in return. Down in the bowels of the ancient crashed ship, Tenneka could feel the rumble of explosions through the steel wall she was sitting against, and it made her smile a bit, knowing that her friends wouldn't abandon her. The two scruffy guys in charge of making sure she didn't miraculously break her zip-tied bindings were starting to look uncomfortable. With the gentle thudding and the occasional drift of dust down from the furniture, their glances at each other were more and more concerned. You guys are probably going to want to undo these bindings before my friends get here, Tenika said. One of the guards replied with, Why is that? Because one of those friends is a 300-pound clan elemental with anger issues, Tenika said with a smile. The two guards looked at each other again with growing concern. A few seconds later, the sound of grating metal against metal and the heavy footfalls of battle-armored feet on metal plating grew closer. Sounds like one or two levels up? Won't be long now, Tenika said, widening her smile. By the time Vasil smashed his way down to the fifth sublevel of this place, his armor showed the litany of scratches, bullet divots, and the odd burn from a laser pistol. 
He was furious at this point, and even though his vision narrowed, he continued to turn and look into each compartment as he pushed his way deeper. Reaching the end of the hallway, up against the bulkhead, he turned and looked into the last cabin. He had hoped to find Tenika, of course, but he hadn't expected to see her leaning back in a chair with her feet up on the table. What took you so long? she asked with a smirk. Rin was walking up the loading ramp of the Alalia when her calm activated. Olivia's voice was clearly excited as she said, Tenika's safe! We got her! Rin felt a rush of relief, which dulled the intense ache of disappointment. The captain turned to look back down at the settlement for one last time before walking away from the scene and replied, Let's get out of here. A few minutes later, she shed her dusty uniform and stepped into a small shower in the captain's quarters. Resting her head against the wall as the hot water cascaded over her, Rin cried harder than she had since childhood. Tenika's excitement over her rescue had faded to misery as she had learned that the Zeus was not salvageable. She had insisted that Vasil bring her to the junked mech, which had been in the process of being dismantled by the settlement's junkers when the attack happened. The dispossessed mech warrior wanted to lash out at those who had done it, but when they walked out of the settlement and saw the sorry, defeated state of the men and women under the watchful eye of Olivia's thunderbolt, the anger faded to pity. New Explorer Corps First Arm, Spinward Operations Area, System J4884B2, The Rabbit's Foot, Jimishu Class Jump Ship, February 10th, 3152. Cal Levitt had trouble understanding what exactly had taken place on the planet. The report transmitted from the Alalia was written by May, and not Rin, which was concerning. It was light on details, but did include the following. The settlement had nothing of value for the mission. We left food and supplies and are returning. When the Alalia was fully docked, Levitt was there waiting to talk with Rin, who blew past him as if he wasn't there. He looked at her in shock as the other crew began to head through the open airlock. Each looked more sullen than the last. Levitt asked repeatedly what happened, but the most he got in return were dour looks and a head shake from Basile. Ariana poked her head into the passageway and then locked it on May. She took the mech warrior's arm and the two headed off on their own. Kip leaned against the doorway further down the hallway, not saying anything but taking in Rin's distressed behavior before glaring at Vasil. When Levitt saw Tenika's face, he knew something terrible had happened. Not taking silence for an answer, he stepped in front of her and asked, What the heck happened? Tenika sighed, shrugged her shoulders, and responded, A misunderstanding led to gunfire. My Zeus is gone. Your Zeus... How? Levitt asked, completely dumbfounded. Vasil's hand fell to Levitt's shoulder from behind, and the elemental said, Later. Still looking for answers, Levitt talked to the science team and the crew of the Eulalia. While he was able to piece together much more of the story at that point, he still wanted to know details. Specifically, what had the captain so worked up with that she had locked herself in her cabin and ignored calm requests? He had never seen her like this before, and every warning signal in Levitt's brain told him this wasn't a run-of-the-mill disappointing mission. As the rabbit's foot was made ready for its next jump, Rin stayed in her cabin. She was reclined in her bed, her eyes were shut tightly as she tried to focus on the recording playing in her headphones. She tried to stop replaying the events over and over in her mind, but the memories fought her. Who fired that damn shot? Why didn't that guy just take the food and gear? Damn it! Twelve hours later, in the cargo bay of the Alalia, Tenika sat on a crate and looked at the gantry that used to hold her mech. When she closed her eyes, she could take in all the sounds and smells of the bay, and it almost felt like when she opened them, her Zeus would be standing there. Though, when she did open her eyes, it was gone. This process hadn't worked for the last thirty-seven attempts, and she was midway through the thirty-eighth when she heard the distinctive sound of bootsteps with a very long gait make their way closer. I'm not sure I'm in the mood for a pep talk, Tenika said without looking. I do not do pep talks. I am here because you need to refocus, Vasil said. Tenika finally looked up at him before saying, Refocus on what? The fact that I'm a dispossessed mech warrior on a mission that doesn't have any use for me? Or maybe the fact that I lost the mech that had been in my family for generations? Vasil listened to her questions, but it didn't show any sign of reaction. He rarely did. He just quietly listened, and when he was ready, he responded, A warrior does not cease to be a warrior when you take away her weapon. Tenika frowned, looked back toward the empty gantry, and shook her head. 
Sounds like something you would hear in a self-help holovid. When I lost my clan and the people I swore I would protect, I felt lost. I traveled to the far side of the galaxy to avoid having to face my failures and to avoid any new opportunities for failure. I now know that no matter where you go, there are people who need help and there are people who do help. You, Tenaka, are a person who helps. This is why we are friends, Basil said in the longest string of sentences she had ever heard from him in a single statement. Immediately after, Tenika surprised Vasil in return by standing quickly and hugging him. He didn't react immediately, but after a few moments, slowly wrapped his arms around her back and returned the hug. End Part 8 New Explorer Corps, First Arm, Spinward Operations Area, System J5241, February 22nd, 3152. The rabbit's foot idled over the nadir jump point of the orange dwarf star, designated J5241. The ship was one tiny speck of white, indistinguishable from the background stars, even with the jump ship's massive solar sails unfurled. Standing on the rabbit's foot bridge, Lieutenant Cal Levitt drank something foul-tasting that he was told was loaded with caffeine. It had been several weeks since the incident that had claimed one of the team's battle mechs and had left the captain unwilling or unable to continue the mission. Levitt's concern for his friend, Rin, grew by the hour, but there were only so many unanswered knocks at her cabin door that could be attempted before the whole mission would go bankrupt and fall apart. He'd have to step in in the meantime. At least the food packets were being snapped up from outside the door, so he knew she was still alive. On the hollow table, the J5241 system slowly spun in all of its glory of faded colors. The star seemed quite stable and hospitable toward the planets that orbited it, of which there were several good candidates for exploration. One of them was way outside the star's habitable zone, so Cal sent Ariana to drop some probe drones down onto the frozen surface. It was unlikely that the drones would find anything, but you never know out here in the periphery. The two other planets were more likely to be habitable, The planet closest to the star was designated J1 and was significantly less Terran-like than the other. It was smaller and less dense than ideal, but at 0.6 gravity it was still technically survivable. The greens and blues visible from the long-range scans are what made the science team giddy. Levitt expected much more interesting data when Ariana headed that way with her remaining drones. The third planet was going to be a problem, and it wasn't something Cal wanted to bother Rin with right now. Not one, but two messages were transmitted to the rabbit's foot upon arrival in system. To unknown jump ship, greetings and welcome to the Talhit system. It is our great pleasure to hear of your arrival and happily offer you resupply at our humble colony's starport. Your hesitancy to make an in-system burn with your dropship suggests peaceful intentions. We have not had the opportunity to trade with outsiders in quite some time, and can do so in terms favorable to both our peoples. As planetary chairman, I think it's important that we make the first friendly gesture. Therefore, we have shared the coordinates for our spaceport. We look forward to hearing from you. Sincerely, planetary chairman, Tyler Pollock. Two, in-system jump ship. We are honored to welcome you to the Talit system. As the planet's true planetary chairman, I offer assistance in exchange for trade and news from outside the system. While we can defend ourselves from pirates if necessary, our scanner suggests that you have other intentions. I look forward to hearing from you as soon as possible. Once we have made contact, we can move forward with what will likely be a positive and mutually beneficial relationship. Respectfully, Planetary Chairman Sarah Chen. Two messages from two people claiming to be Planetary Chairman, each seemingly ignoring the existence of the other, set off more than a few alarm bells in Levitt's brain. Their use of the title Planetary Chairman suggested that the settlement or settlements were originally set up under the Draconis Combine. That made this important, as their employer would want to know if there was a planet out here in the periphery that could lay claim on territory for the Combine. Before sending a response, Levitt would need some input. Olivia grew up on a Combine world and even attended the DCMS Academy as a teenager. If anyone could offer some insight here, it would be her. When she walked in, with her dark hair pulled into a single braid and wearing her usual dark gray MacWarrior jumpsuit, Levitt nodded and waved her over. 
On her way across the bridge, Olivia glanced over at the captain's chair and raised an eyebrow. Clearly, Rin was not out of her funk yet, and that concerned many on the ship. It was doubly concerning for Olivia because she understood that the captain was struggling with things even before the Tenneke incident. Levitt watched Olivia's face for a reaction as she read the two messages pulled up on the holotable. Well, what do you make of it? Levitt asked after a bit. Olivia frowned for a moment before replying. As with anything combine, appearances matter. The fact that they're both eager to contact us right away and even offering landing coordinates suggests that they need us to buy their story before any other. If they're both calling themselves the true planetary chairman, there's clearly a disagreement over that fact. Sounds like a fight we'd be better off staying away from, Levitt said as he turned to look back at the planet's holographic representation in the air above the table. We're not exactly equipped to get into the middle of a civil war, Olivia added. The smart play would be to mark the location and jump out. Let the Combine send forces to sort things out if they need to. Levitt nodded in approval. I agree, though the Combine is going to want more information if we want to keep paying our bills. At the very least, I think we need to make landfall for a meeting. We should pick a landing zone away from both settlements and have them come to us. That might irk them a bit, but I don't want us choosing sides and getting wrapped up in some conflict we don't understand. How's the captain doing? Olivia asked as she glanced back towards the empty captain's chair again. She's eating, but not talking. I think she needs to process a few things before getting back into the game, Levitt said, without a shred of his normal, jovial tone. Down in the recreation bay, Tenneka and Vasil were sitting at a table and talking. Since losing her mech, Tenneka had been feeling without purpose, until Vasil offered to teach her some of the finer points of running security on naval vessels. She was a quick learner, and even though some of the scheduling and patrolling of the ship was mundane, it helped Tenneka keep her mind off of her lost battle mech. In exchange, Tenneka insisted Vasil learn some of the card games that the mech warriors played in their off time. While he struggled a bit with the concept of bluffing, his naturally stoic look made for a perfect poker face. The pair were playing another practice hand when Kip wandered into the recreational space to grab a drink. He was wearing a technician's jumpsuit, which was coated with grime. Things had been tense with Kip since Vasil's arrival and had not improved. The aerospace pilot filled his large mug with a questionably fresh caffeinated drink before turning and leaning against the countertop. Vasil hadn't said a word to the man since they first met, and Tenneka was clearly ignoring Kip. Instead, she focused on explaining how certain sets and combinations of cards were worth more than others. You know you can't teach a clanner to be civilized. At best, you're simply training them to be more efficient monsters, Kim said before taking a long sip from his mug. Shouldn't you be working on your ship? With Ariana out, you should be protecting the jump ship, Tenneka responded without looking away from the cards in her hand. True enough, but my bird will be back in the air in a few hours. How's your mech doing? Vasil's eyebrow went up, and he was about to stand when Tenneka reached out and caught his forearm. A little shake of her head kept the elemental from escalating things further. When Kip saw this, he chuckled. You might have the mech warriors fooled, but I can see what is happening. Ever since you started stinking up this ship with your clanner bullshit, everything's been getting worse. Kip shrugged and continued when neither Vasil nor Tenneka reacted. I'm not the only one who understands. On his way out of the room, Vasil's voice stopped him. I have not harmed you. However, if you continue to disrespect others, we will have to settle things. Typical clanner, you think every problem should be solved with violence. Kip took the last word, already out of the door and walking down the hall. New Explorer Corps, First Arm, Spinward Operations Area, System J5241, February 26, 3152. After a 72-hour burn toward the planet the locals called Garden, the Alelia entered the atmosphere and gradually slowed its descent towards scrublands identified by Levitt as roughly half the distance between the two major settlements on the planet. Contact was made with both groups, and careful effort was made to establish that the new Explorer Corps were there for purely informational and scientific efforts, and not economic or military concerns. The reply from each settlement was muted, 
clearly showing some disappointment that the dropship wasn't headed to their respective spaceports. Thankfully, both were sending representatives to meet the Alelia as it sat down. Levitt and Olivia decided that a reasonable show of strength would be useful in making sure that everyone was on their best behavior. That's why when Levitt walked down the Alelia's ramp, he was flanked by Akif and his calliope and Olivia in her thunderbolt. Tenika walked on Levitt's right side carrying a laser rifle on her back and looking like she was quite capable of using it. Waiting for them, at considerable distance from each other, were the two representatives and their groups. Each of them looked entirely annoyed to be standing there out in the scrub brush. That was fine for Levitt, who preferred them to be slightly uncomfortable and therefore more likely to be hesitant to cause trouble. Behind each representative stood several dozen soldiers in garb that looked to Levitt as vaguely reminiscent of uniforms from the Draconis Combine. Their black tunics were Spartan, though the representatives were each wearing white jackets with black slacks. As he and Tenika walked closer, cutting the distance between the representatives into two, he looked from group to group, noticing small differences in the uniforms. Finally, reaching the middle, Levitt stood motionless with his arms crossed over his chest. Akif and Olivia's Max stood motionless at the base of the dropship ramp, looking over the whole affair. If the representatives were expecting Levitt to walk one way or the other, they were mistaken. Nearly a full minute passed before anyone moved. Once one of the representatives started walking toward Levitt, the other quickly followed. Levitt looked back at Tenika and smirked as the two representatives ended up briskly walking, then jogging, then running toward Levitt in order to be the first to greet the newcomers. Breathlessly, the first to grasp Levitt's hand for a handshake announced himself, Hello, I am Taisa Simon Chen. Planetary Chairman Sarah Chen welcomes you. Levitt nodded and returned the handshake just as the other representative ran up, taking a few breaths before saying, The, the real Planetary Chairman, Tyler Pollock, welcomes you to the garden. We hope that your stay is enjoyable. I am Taisa Lian Krask. The chairman hopes to have a discussion with you at your earliest convenience. Taisa Chen bristled and then responded quickly, It would be a shame if your time was wasted by these pretenders. I must apologize for this embarrassing situation. You have caught us in a most unpleasant situation with a treasonous element claiming power illegitimately. Gentlemen, Levitt said, cutting off Krask's next comment, while it's obvious there is some sort of disagreement here, the new Explorer Corps has no interest in that. We are here in a purely peaceful and nonpartisan capacity. What I ask is if you wish for official intervention from the Draconis Combine, you provide us with the appropriate petitions which we'll carry back with us when we return to the Inner Sphere. I promise you that each petition will be given equal measure in our hands. The two men looked at Levitt, then at each other, before agreeing to those terms. As the Taisas walked back to their cohorts, Levitt ordered the science team to begin their work setting up the temporary camp and research station. Even though they were in dry highlands biome, the planet sure seemed to be living up to the name Garden. After months of breathing in recycled jump ship air, this planet's atmosphere was absolute bliss in Levitt's lungs. He took several deep, slow breaths before turning to Tenika and saying, well, that went pretty well, considering. Tenika hugged her rifle and shrugged before responding. Sure beats our last welcome ceremony. Ha, yeah, fair enough, Levitt said with a chuckle. Maybe Tenika was moving past the loss of her mech with a comment like that. He sure hoped so. As the vehicles from the two groups headed back to their respective settlements, Levitt and Tenika turned back and walked toward the dropship. New Explorer Corps First Arm, Spinward Operations Area, System J5241, February 25th, 3152. Rin sat in the darkness of her cabin, staring at the pile of aged paper documents and the computer tablet in front of her. As far as she could find, these few pieces of paper and digital documents were the only proof that this expedition had a purpose. After days of laying in bed, and even longer sitting at her desk staring at the gray aluminum in front of her, Rin decided that she needed to sort out a plan of action. Until she had one, there was no point in trying to talk to others. Gazing over the documents, some of them were scientific reports from her days in the Republic Navy. Others were documents that her grandfather had owned and prepared from his own research. 
There was a purpose here at some point. The last decade of her life had been spent building and toward it. Rin's eyes felt heavy again and she sighed in frustration. Giving up for now, she stood up and shuffled back toward her bed. Picking up the headphones, she slid them on and began the recording. It was one of the few things that seemed to help. End Part 9 New Explorer Corps First Arm Spinward Operations Area System J5241 Planet Designation Garden February 27th, 3152 The last two days had been an exercise in absurdity from Rec Warrior Olivia Mason. She and the others from the New Explorer Corps had landed on the planet the locals referred to as Garden a few days ago. The name fit well, and if there was a bright side, it was the fact that this little planet showed all of the abundance of a successful terraforming effort. Olivia had seen the data on it as she sifted through the files shared by each of the two Draconis Combine factions that claimed to represent the planetary government. The Star League era terraforming devices held out longer than anyone could have expected, and it paid off with a very pleasant atmosphere and more plants and animals that Olivia had ever seen in a single biome. She had gone out of her way to get outside as often as possible. Finding secluded outdoor locations to dig through all the documentation, it was a welcome reprieve from the walking headaches that were the two planetary chairmen who each claimed to be the only true leader of the planet. Everything having to do with their meetings had to be perfectly equal, down to the second spent in one location before heading over to another in the sprawling terraforming complex located midway between the two primary settlements of each faction. After the sixth argument over chair and table placement in this latest meeting room, Olivia had enough. When she excused herself from the room, Levitt looked at her with a pained look on his face. She shrugged with a smirk and said, Heavy weighs the crown, Lieutenant. Grabbing the pitted steel railing on an outside balcony well away from the nonsense going on inside, Olivia looked out at the range of mountains in the distance. Their snowy peaks promised the kind of solace Olivia craved in that moment. Her eyes slowly fell to the settlement she had learned was called Basilisk. Planetary Chairman Sarah Chen claimed it was the original settlement started by the Combine roughly 500 years ago. That was pretty impressive, though it was tempered in the moment Olivia learned it when the Planetary Chairman Tyler Pollock chimed in from the other side of the conference table to state that it was actually his settlement, Tarragon, which was the original Star League base. Though the locals seemed very proud of their accomplishments, in Olivia's opinion, both settlements looked pretty lackluster. In 500 years, she would have expected sprawling cities and wonders of Star League technology, yet these settlements looked more like backwater outposts. The tallest buildings in each of the settlements was no higher than five or six stories, and their spaceports were cracked ferrocrete pads that could barely be large enough to hold one mule dropship, though it was pretty clear that neither faction had a functioning dropship. A keef had been put on babysitting duty at the dropship, which included running the drones over each of the settlements to look for anything that might be of concern. Both the Tarragon and Basilisk settlements were walled and had a variety of small arms sites along the battlements. There were obvious signs of conflict between the two factions, and it was abundantly clear in discussions with the leadership that the question of who was actually in charge of Garden was still very open. What Olivia was primarily concerned with was their mech assets, which numbered roughly a lance on each side. They were obviously older models, and from the photos and videos the drone had taken, Olivia spotted several ancient designs that would have been considered antiques even hundreds of years ago. From the state of their disrepair, they weren't that threatening. However, if things got ugly, even in her 11S Thunderbolt and with a key at her side, their numbers could be a problem. She filed away the concerns for the moment and took a deep breath. This planet is wasted on the empty heads fighting over it. She said to herself just before the calm chirped on, Olivia, can you come in here? The locals need your calming presence, Levitt asked with the sound of bickering in the background. It is crucially important that you underline with the Draconis Combine that we need the resupply to focus on mining equipment in our western reaches. If we can repair and expand production, we could be a source of valuable minerals. Tyler Pollock stated in elevated volume in an attempt to drown out Sarah Chen's request that agricultural equipment and infrastructure construction machinery take precedence. All the while, Levitt sat at the head of the table looking like he was being tortured. Olivia walked into the room and immediately grabbed the attention of the bickering chairman by wrapping her knuckle on the large meeting table. First of all, shut up. Second of all, keep shutting up. 
You're bickering about the contents of a resupply mission that might not even happen because since you don't seem to understand, you're a tiny planet in the middle of nowhere that the Combine forgot existed 200 years ago. If they deem you worthy of a future contact, I doubt you'll have any say about what they send, if anything, other than a new boss that you both can follow, Olivia said with enough conviction that it left both the chairmen speechless, though not for long. How dare you speak to me like that? You're a mech warrior. You should be down scrubbing armor plates or something, Sarah Chen sputtered as she adjusted her tunic. Olivia's eyebrow went up and she pursed her lips for a moment as she buried the urge to reach across the table and drag the chairman across it. Once they hear of my excellent leadership of the settlement, the Combine is sure to send aid, Pollock stated in a way that suggested he only half believed it. Levitt sat up in the chair and tapped the table with his finger before saying, Maybe, maybe not. However, all of this is premature. You seem to want us to play Kingmaker here, or at least proxy to the Kingmaker, and it's just not in the cards. Like I said in our first meeting and repeatedly since, make your case in any documentation you want to share, and we'll take it back to the Combine for you. It'll be up to them to decide what to do. We need assurances that you're taking this seriously. In the interests of the Combine and the true leadership of Garden, Chairman Chen said with her arms crossed across her chest. Olivia ran her fingers through her raven black hair and leaned forward, putting both hands onto the table. You have our word and the fact that we're literally being paid by the Combine to bring back news exactly like your presence out here. If we could just get a tentative recognition of Tarragon's claims, this would all go much more smoothly, Chairman Pollock stated which immediately led to shouting from Chairman Chen. Those claims are fraudulent when your scumbag grandfathers forged them, and they're fraudulent today. You treasonous worms will face the firing squad when the Combine hears this, Pollock growled across the table while glaring at Chen. Olivia groaned in frustration and looked over at Levitt, who looked up at her and shook his head. He pushed himself away from the table and stood up before stating, We're leaving in 48 hours. You have 47 to make sure I have a digital copy of everything you want shared with the Combine. Good day. Olivia walked beside Levitt as they made their way down the hallway out of the aged structure. Is it that bad that I want an asteroid to wipe them both out? Olivia asked. We won't be that lucky. Let's get the science team packed up as soon as possible and get ready to go early if needed. I'm sick of trying to play peacemaker, Levitt responded. You got it, Lieutenant. Olivia said, turning her head to get another look at the mountains. New Explorer Corps, First Arm, Spinward Operations Area, System J5241, Planet Designation, Garden, February 28th, 3152. You've got to be friggin' kidding me, Olivia sighed into her calm link from the command chair of her Thunderbolt. A Keith's voice came back quick. I'm afraid it's real and it's stupid. Turns out you were right about suiting up for this handover. Both the Terragon and Basilisk lances of mechs were on the move toward each other, and it looked like each was intent on being the first to reach the two Explorer Corps mechs that stood at the entrance of the terraforming complex. My expectations cannot be low enough for this nonsense, Olivia replied as she looked over the sensor data coming in from the two groups of mechs. Over the open channel, a voice Olivia recognized as belonging to Leon Krask stated, Planetary Chairman Pollock has decreed that only the informational packet provided by Terragon should go with you back to Combine Space. Including any others would be harmful to the people of Garden. We cannot allow it. Olivia keyed her systems to full power and told Akif to do the same on her private channel. She was about to respond to Krask's statement when Simon Chen spoke up first. He said, Planetary Chairman Chen has been exceedingly clear that your treasonous behavior would be dealt with. If today is the day you wish to die and prove her correct, that is your choice. However, the Explorer Corps vessel will not be leaving with any information except ours. I feel like I'm in an academy dance and the two most insane guys there want me to dance, Olivia said to Akif before flipping back to the open channel. She took a breath to calm herself before responding, Attention Combine Lances, you are to stand down immediately and shut down your mechs. If you do not stop this nonsense, we will leave without taking either of your messages, and you can rot on this planet together. When we return to Combine Space, we'll tell them of your dishonorable behavior, and they can deal with you like the petulant children you seem to be. 
Olivia watched the larger of the tarragon mechs, a shadowhawk that looked to be held together with armor stripped from a dozen other mechs, as it turned toward her and fired. The laser and autocannon fire went wide, but it was close enough to be an obvious act of first aggression. That's it, Akif. We're out of here. Shoot and scoot. Disable what you can. Don't let them bog you down, Olivia said as she pushed her thunderbolt into a run. She lined up her first shot carefully as the area between the two Explorer Corps mechs and the dropship filled with fire seemingly traveling in every direction. The two combined factions were firing on each other as well as at Olivia and Akif as they ran the gauntlet. Lieutenant Levitt, we're taking fire. Is the Alalia ready to launch? Olivia asked as she lined up her first shot of the Shadowhawk. Yep, we're good to go as soon as you get back. We're observing some light arms fire, but nothing directly at the ship. I think both sides here would like to get their hands on the dropship, Levitt replied over considerable background chatter. Get back here and we're ready to go. You got it, Lieutenant, Olivia replied as she gently squeezed the trigger, sending the crackling azure beam of artificial lightning across the grassy terrain. It smashed into the Shadowhawk's center torso, causing the mech to stumble step. It was held up briefly by the apocalyptic damage being done to the roughshod armor plating, but as the PPC cut into its internal workings, the mech fell forward and dug a furrow into the dirt. A keef split to the left, following up fire on the Shadowhawk to make sure it didn't get back up right away. The Calliope's medium pulse lasers stitched across the hawk's legs as it tried to rise. The Jenner and Stinger flanked the Shadowhawk, each targeting the Calliope with laser and missile fire, but achieved only glancing blows as a keef kept his mech on the move. A panther lingered a further 100 meters behind its friends, lining up a shot against Olivia's mech, which went wide but only by a few meters. Her mech's electrical systems hiccuped a bit from the electronic interference, but she kept her focus. The basilisk glance consisted of a griffin, javelin, and a marauder that all looked like museum pieces. They were hanging back and taking the opportunity for some free shots against their combine rivals. PPC fire crisscrossed the grasslands, several shots hitting the ground and setting the grass alight. Cut further to the left. Get behind the tarragon lance. We're not in the kill box. Make the basilisks shoot us through them if they want to stop us. Olivia spoke into the private comm link as she closed on the Shadowhawk, which was very nearly standing again. The mech seemed to be punch drunk and was slow to react. Olivia took advantage and fired her three medium lasers along with the mech's four machine guns. The combined fire poured into the Shadowhawk's already ruptured torso. It fired its weapons in panic, but only the medium laser scored a hit burning away a chunk of the Thunderbolt's left thigh armor. The lasers and machine gun rounds ripped into the Shadowhawk and hit something vital. The mech shuddered, then seemed to bend forward at the upper torso. Once again, the mech fell, this time for good. Akif chuckled to himself as he pushed his calliope at full speed on the grassy plains. He always enjoyed going fast, and this was the perfect opportunity. Sure, the Jenner and Stinger were shooting at him, but he figured he had the advantage when he noticed the Jenner wasn't firing any more missiles. Hey, Olivia... I don't think these guys have any ammo for their missile launcher. His comment was cut off when a PPC shot from the Panther slammed into his left arm of the Calliope, searing off armor plate and causing Akif to stumble and shuffle to regain his running cadence. Just get to the dropship. I'm right behind you, Olivia replied as she kept running past the Shadowhawk and turned her torso toward the Panther. The battlefield had quickly become chaotic, with mechs from all three sides taking shots where they could while trying to maneuver. Olivia's console lit up along with the shuddering of explosions as a few LRMs pelted her right torso. The Panther was backing up to keep range on both the NEC mechs. It fired again at the Calliope and missed, only to be struck in the right torso by a Keith's plasma rifle. The superheated plasma burrowed through the armor of the Panther and went internal as the mech stumbled and struggled to keep its arm up for another PPC shot. As Olivia closed on the Panther, the whole battle seemed to turn with them as both the Combine forces started to focus their efforts on the NEC duel. The Jenner managed to catch up with the Calliope and rake its back with its medium lasers, which filled Akif's cockpit with flashing red lights and an alarm which he had to ignore as he pivoted. His medium pulse lasers raked across the Jenner, slicing off one of the mech's missile pods, but otherwise causing only minor damage. We're going to get pecked apart here, Akif said into the comm link with a considerable amount of frustration. Just keep running. Don't stop until you're in the ship, Olivia growled as she lined up a shot on the wounded panther. Her PPC shot smashed into the center torso and raked across the already heavily damaged right side. The mech's entire right torso and arm sheared off and crashed to the grass below. The mech stumbled, then turned to run as its PPC was now laying on the ground. Akif kept moving, twisting and turning to catch an angle on the Jenner, which was trying to stay on his six. 
On the downhill side of a slight bump in the terrain, it ventured too close and Akif was able to lash out with his left arm, smashing the light mech off balance and sending it sprawling into the grass. The stinger was still following, firing its medium laser, but was missing most of its shots. Still, the calliope was starting to rack up damage, and that dropship never seemed so far away. In the distance, the basilisk marauder fired both PPCs at Olivia's thunderbolt, and they both gouged deep into her right arm and right leg. With armor melting and shearing away, Olivia twisted and returned fire with her PPC, which missed the marauder, but it hit the javelin behind it, causing the light mech to step back. It didn't seem to be firing, possibly due to a lack of ammo. The griffin fired its PPC at Olivia as well, but only got a glancing hit on her right leg, adding a little more worry to her console as she tried to figure out if she had enough armor to get to the dropship. Can you get a hit on the marauder with a plasma? Let's get it toasty warm, Olivia said as she lined up a shot on the stinger. Her medium lasers danced across the ground around the running mech's feet, but did only light damage. Akif replied by twisting his mech and angling a bit back toward the basilisk glance to get a shot. He took a calming breath before squeezing the trigger. The plasma rifle in his mech's right arm spit the searing hot round across the field and it smashed into the marauder. Akif's eyes went wide as he watched the marauder stop, then start to flail its arms as the plasma round had struck the heavy mech's cockpit. Over the open channel, what Olivia assumed was Simon Chen's voice screamed in absolute terror. It was the worst thing she had ever heard as the marauder stumbled backward, then fell to the ground. She had to turn off the comm to shut out the horrible sounds of the pilot's agony. It was not how any mech warrior wanted to die, and Olivia felt a pang of guilt for having to ask Akif to take that shot. Olivia kept pushing her mech forward, even as another PPC hit her leg, causing her mech to stumble and start to drag. The knee actuator was damaged and the grinding of metal on metal was audible even through her cockpit's soundproofing. Her console was flashing every warning light possible on that leg, but she still pushed forward. The last thing she was going to let happen was to end up the prisoner of one of these knucklehead factions. Akif was just a few hundred meters away from the Alalia, which had lowered its ramps in preparation for their arrival. The guns of the dropship could aid Olivia if only she could get closer. More missiles pelted her mech, and then the medium laser from the stinger cut into her leg, shearing it at the knee. The ground approached rapidly, though Olivia was able to reach out with her left arm to take the brunt of the damage. She was down, but maybe she could still get there. Olivia, hold on, I'm coming back, Akif yelled into the comms as he turned the calliope around and fired at the stinger. The plasma round bounced off the mech's shoulder, coating the armor with a partial plasma hit, but not going internal. Just get to the ship. I'll be there in a minute, Olivia grunted as she pushed her thunderbolt up to a crouch. Lining up her shot on the distracted stinger, she fired her PPC and medium lasers. The flood of heat in her cockpit was intense, but the dancing beams ripped the light mech to shreds. It didn't so much fall as simply disintegrate under the fire. Olivia growled with satisfaction as she turned toward the griffin. The javelin was now in a sprint toward her mech, not firing but clearly intent on closing the remaining distance. Akif took another shot with his rifle, but it passed through the javelin's legs. Olivia took a breath, waited several seconds to let her heat sinks do their job before firing at the griffin who was slowly circling her crippled mech. When it fired its PPC again, the azure beam struck her center torso, boiling away precious armor and leaving a nasty charred scar. Thankfully, it didn't penetrate. Just as Olivia was about to fire her PPC in return, the griffin was bathed in laser fire from the air. Dual large laser beams cut deeply into the griffin's torso, followed by the bolt from a PPC which shattered the mech's fusion containment. The griffin's mech warrior ejected, but it was too late to escape the explosion which bathed the battlefield with intense blue light. Olivia turned away, having to shield her eyes even with the Thunderbolt's adaptive view screen tempering the glare considerably. Roaring overhead, a stingray in white and metallic blue pulled up from its dive and passed over Olivia's mech. She felt a wave of relief as she realized that they had backup. Don't say I never did anything for you, Kip spoke into the NEC private channel. Don't say I never wanted to see you, Olivia replied as she turned her torso to face the last attacker. The javelin's pilot saw the writing on the wall and banked the mech away from Olivia's thunderbolt. It began to run at top speed back to the basilisk settlement. Finally able to take a breath, Olivia furrowed her brow and looked down at the console, trying to sort out just how long this damage was going to take to repair. An explosion pulled her attention back to her view screen, where she saw the javelin being cut down by the combined fire of the Holtz aerospace fighters. Wait, stop, Olivia said into the comms. Just sit back, we've got this, Kip responded as he circled for another attack run. 
Olivia shook her head, mouth dropping open as the aerospace fighters lined up for runs on the basilisk settlement. Negative on that attack run. They're not a threat any longer, Olivia pleaded into the comm. Captain's orders are clear, Kip responded, even as his lasers cut across the walls of the settlement and into some of the nearby buildings. Ariana's Korax followed immediately with her own lasers, which obliterated the walls and set more buildings ablaze. Olivia watched in horror for a few seconds before pulling up the comm with the dropship. Levitt, tell them to pull back. I'm okay. Levitt's voice was stern and immediate. Holtz, fall back to an overwatch pattern immediately. Do not fire on the settlements. That is an order. There was no response as the aerospace fighters circled and then made an attack run on the Tarragon settlement, creating similar carnage across its defensive walls and battlements. Damn it! Stop! Olivia barked. The comms were silent as the fighters made a second run further into the settlement before pulling back and heading back into the upper atmosphere. Left in their wake were two settlements ablaze. Olivia dragged her mech the last few hundred meters with her ruined leg in her mech's fist. Akif stood guard as she crawled into the dropship and the doors closed. Shutting down the Thunderbolt systems, Olivia sat silently in the cockpit's darkness, fighting the desire to pummel the next person she saw to a pulp. Akif's voice on the comm was clearly concerned. Olivia, are you okay? She closed her eyes and bit her lower lip hard enough to taste iron. After several long seconds, she replied, No. End Part 10 New Explorer Corps, First Arm, Spinward Operations Area, System J5241, Nadir Jump Point, March 1st, 3152. After three days' burn toward the jump point, Olivia's anger had turned to resolve. This mission was in danger, and somebody had to say and do something about it. Her first stop was at Lieutenant Levitt's cabin, where they agreed that what happened was unacceptable and that Captain Wren needed to account for it. That was putting it lightly. When the ship docked with the rabbit's foot, Olivia was the first through the airlock. Dividing and conquering, she headed toward the flight deck looking for the Holtz. Levitt was on his way up to the bridge to see if the captain was back on deck. Akif saw the look of steeled determination on Olivia's face and made a bet that he didn't want to be around when she found her target. He wisely offered to supervise the repair efforts on the Calliope and Thunderbolt. Olivia counted her steps as she walked through the ship. It focused her mind and let her play out how she expected this interaction to go. Her hand instinctively fell to the laser pistol on her hip, though she didn't expect things to go that far. When she reached the flight deck, both aerospace fighters were there, but neither of the Holtz. Turning on her heels, Olivia kept moving. Upon reaching the recreation deck, Olivia stopped in the doorway. Ariana was there, laying against Mai as they both watched something on a tablet computer. Tenneco was cooking something in the little galley kitchen, and Kip was reclining on the two back feet of a chair with his feet up on the table. Hey Olivia, glad to see you're back, Tenneco said after noticing Olivia was there. Kip looked up from looking down into whatever he had in his mug and smirked at the mech warrior in the doorway. Need something, hon? Kip said in an intentionally dismissive manner. Olivia took one more deep breath before entering the room, walking to the table Cat's corner to where Kip was reclining. The captain ordered you to target civilians, Olivia asked, in as calm a tone as possible. Kip sighed softly, in no rush to answer. After several long moments, he responded with, I saved your butt out there. You should be far more appreciative. Olivia bristled slightly, but retained control. When we get back to the Combine, I'm going to file my own report with the authorities. You won't be able to whitewash this. You think the Combine's going to care about some squabbling serfs out on a planet they didn't even know about five minutes ago? Don't be naive, Kip said in a slightly more irritated tone. Olivia glanced over at Tenika, who had stopped cooking and was watching. Her hand was resting on her holstered pistol. Looking back toward Kip, Olivia's deep brown eyes focused on Kip's smug, grizzled features before responding. You're not going to get away with this. I didn't sign up for a genocide. Ariana sat up with growing concern, but May reached out and placed her hand on the young pilot's arm in an unspoken don't. <laughs> Kip laughed at Olivia and then lifted his mug to his lips. The next few seconds slowed to a crawl in Olivia's mind as her temper won out and she swept her leg underneath Kip's chair, sending it out from under him and smacking hard on the thin rec room carpet. Kip fell back 
his mug flying from his hands. He wasn't on the ground for long. The old fighter jockey was quicker than Olivia expected and was on his feet and grappling with her before she could properly shut him down. She could hear Ariana's voice telling them both to stop, but she had to get control of Kip first. Tenika pulled up Fasil on her personal comlink as the two fighters knocked over the table and fell onto the floor. You better get to the wreck area. Kip and Olivia are going at it. Aff, Fasil said as he dropped what he was doing and started to run through the cramped hallways. Get the hell off of me, you lunatic, Kip grunted. You're the murderer, Olivia grunted as she tried to bend Kip's arm in an unnatural direction. Tenika didn't see who pulled the gun from Olivia's holster, but the first shot startled everyone in the room. The cooler door now had a quarter-sized blackened hole in it. The second shot sent Tenika diving behind cover as Olivia and Kip wrestled over the weapon. Olivia barked, as Kip kneed her hard in the thigh, causing her muscles to cramp up in response. The third shot stopped the wrestling, as it was immediately followed by a scream from the other side of the room. Tenika peeked over the couch, where she was taking cover, her mouth dropping open in silent horror. Sitting on the edge of the sofa, between Maya's legs, Ariana sat with a stunned look on her face. Her eyes widening in fear as she tried to take her next breath, a breath that didn't occur. May's cry continued as the mech warrior stared at the hole that had been bored completely through the center of Ariana's chest and into May's shoulder. If time was moving slow before, it sped up now. Olivia watched as Ariana fell back against May's arms, her eyes still wide, face going pale as her body continued to struggle for an unobtainable breath. Kip roared, taking the opportunity to elbow Olivia in the face so hard that there was an audible crack. Operating on pure rage and grief, he pulled the gun free from their shared grip and stood up. His hand shook in an uncharacteristic fashion as he looked over at his daughter, now being cradled by an inconsolable May. A tear rolling down his cheek, he looked down at Olivia, who was now nursing a cracked jaw. He lifted the pistol, aiming it at her head. As his finger curled around the trigger, he breathed out and squeezed it. The gun throbbed gently as it was fired. When Olivia realized that she hadn't been shot, she opened her eyes to see Vasil gripping Kip's hand with the pistol still in it. The laser had passed through the elemental's fingers, burning partially through two of them and continuing up into the ceiling above. Kip screamed as Vasil's remaining fingers closed tightly around the weapon, snapping plastic parts and Kip's fingers in the process. The Elder Holt cried out as his hand was crushed. Tenika had her pistol out now, but it was clear there'd be no more fighting, even as the ship's general alarm started to go off, filling the room with oscillating red lights. Medic! We need a medic in the mech warrior wreck room! Tenika yelled into her comm link. Every eye in the room except for Vasil's were locked on Ariana. May pulled her close, resting her forehead against Ariana's. Olivia tried to fight back the tears as she watched May's anguish play out. The ache in her jaw was nothing compared to the pain her fellow mech warrior was feeling in that moment. Vasil gripped Kip's shoulder with his free hand, keeping a hold of the pistol with the other, and led him out of the room. Kip groaned and cried out, You killed her! You killed my girl! You're gonna pay! His cries echoed in the hallway for a bit, and then there was silence. Olivia crawled up to her feet, even though her muscles protested every movement. When she stepped closer to Ariana, May's eyes snapped up to meet hers, and she growled, Don't. Olivia's hands went up in a sign of contrition, and she stepped back. Tenika's hand slid over Olivia's shoulder, and her words seemed to bounce around in Olivia's traumatized brain. Are you okay? I... I don't know, Olivia said through her aching jaw. Tenika guided Olivia toward the door, saying, Let's get you out of here. Bathed in the flashing red lights, May leaned in close to Ariana again. The pain in her own shoulder from where the laser had continued to burn even after passing through Ariana's body was just a dull ache. Closing her tear-soaked eyes, May spoke barely above a whisper. Will you wait for me? I miss you already. New Explorer Corps. First Arm, Spinward Operations Area, System J5241. Nadir Jump Point. March 1st, 3152. As Olivia headed out of the dropship, Cal Levitt followed behind for a bit before turning toward the bridge of the jump ship. For the past three days, he had gone over every possible twist and turn for a conversation with Rin about what happened, and what has been happening. 
but none of them seemed to go well, even in his normally jovial outlook. When he reached the bridge, he felt a bit of relief in seeing Rin out of her cabin and apparently acting as captain again. That relief was short-lived as he stepped in and took a look at the slightly slouching Rin who looked like she hadn't slept in months. In her hand was a glass with a couple of large ice cubes in it. Her uniform was wrinkled and her normally very tightly bound red hair was hanging free over the back of the command chair. Are you okay? Levitt said, though he felt like an idiot immediately after the words left his mouth as anyone with eyes could see that she wasn't. Slowly, Rin turned her head towards the lieutenant and said, I'm fine, except for the fact that we're now apparently down another mech. The situation developed rapidly. Rin, I, I was worried about you. Did you order the Holtz to open fire on those settlements? Levitt asked with a healthy amount of concern. The bridge crew busied themselves. If they were listening in, they were doing their best not to show it. Rin sighed before responding. I gave him the order to fix the problem and make sure those settlements can't be a threat to each other again for a long time. Levitt furrowed his brow and crossed his arms. What are we going to tell the Combine? The survivors are going to report what the Holtz did. They won't get that warped version of what happened long after ours. I did what I needed to do to save the mission and the people that are a part of it. Had I not given that order, Olivia would be dead. Akif could have been killed. The dropship and everyone on it could have been lost, Rin said with an increasing certainty in her voice. You didn't have to go that far, Levitt countered. I'll do anything for this mission. It's our destiny to keep going, Rin added as she got up from the chair and walked over to a cabinet where she had a bottle of something noxious waiting. Levitt's concern was only growing as he watched his oldest friend refill her glass. It's not like you to drink on duty, he said. You're dismissed, Lieutenant, Rin said as she returned to the command chair. Levitt was about to challenge her when the ship's general alarm started to flash. Tenika's voice came over the comm link shortly after. Lieutenant Levitt, you better get down here. Something terrible's happened between Olivia and Kip. R really bad. Levitt frowned at Rin before turning and running from the bridge. The captain barely noticed as she pulled up her tablet and began looking at possible destinations for their next jump. When Levitt arrived at the infirmary, he was quickly confused, trying to parse out what might have happened. Olivia was sitting on a bed on one side of the bay, with Tenika and a member of the science team working on a piece of headgear to keep her jaw in place. On the other side of the room, Kip was staring daggers at Olivia, with a clearly injured hand on a fold-out tray being looked at by a ship's medic. Between them stood Vasil, holding a clearly broken laser pistol in one hand and a combat blade the size of an ancient gladius in the other. What the heck happened? Levitt asked, running his hand through his salt and pepper hair. That trash killed my daughter, Kip immediately belted out. Olivia didn't respond other than just shaking her head, which hurt enough that she stopped quickly. The pain in her jaw was starting to intensify now that the adrenaline from the fight had worn off. Ariana, wh where is she? Vasil responded as he tossed Levitt the broken pistol. He said, she is in the rec room with May. There was a fight. The pistol was fired multiple times. Ariana was hit, incidentally. That's bull. I save her life and she kills my daughter. Of course the clanner would be on her side, Kip snapped. Tenika piped up from where she was leaning against the med bay cabinetry. She said, It's Olivia's pistol, but sorting out who fired it's tough. They were both grappling for it. And two shots hit nothing, the third hit Ariana. Kip shook his head and fell back onto the bed, looking away from everyone. Levitt looked up at Vasil and asked, Can you keep things calm here? Vasil nodded and Levitt turned, walking out into the hallway. He'd wanted to stop and lean against something. This all seemed to be falling apart so quickly, and he didn't know what to do. He placed his hand on the cool metal wall and tried to find some calm before continuing his walk to the recreation deck. By the time he reached it, the alarms were off and the two science team members with some medical training were looking at May's shoulder. She sat on the edge of the couch with her elbows on her knees. Her face showed anguish and exhaustion. As Levitt walked in, his eyes fell to the sheet covering Ariana's body which was now on the floor. How badly are you wounded? Levitt asked. I'll live, May responded. I'm, I'm sorry about Ariana. I, I know you two had grown close lately. 
Levitt said, wishing he had the right combination of words to dull the pain on her face. We have to go back to the Combine, May said. I know, I, I don't know how quickly we can do that, Levitt replied. May's eyes remained locked on Ariana as she spoke. I don't think I can be around them. Not after this. I hear you. I will talk to Rin. I'll see if we can work something out. We'll get you your full contracted pay. I promise, Levitt said, still searching his mind for a way to fix this. I don't care. Just get me off this ship, May grunted as the medic pulled the pressure patch tab which sealed the mech warrior's shoulder in place and would keep it from getting infected. We'll figure something out. Until we sort out up from down, I'm going to ask that everybody stay in their cabins. Levitt paused before continuing. We'll get Ariana somewhere safe until people can cool off and we can make arrangements. I said my goodbyes, May responded, not lifting her eyes from Ariana. End part 11. New Explorer Corps, First Arm, Spinward Operations Area, System J5381, Zenith Jump Point, March 14th, 3152. Being faster than everything aimed at her was euphoric. It was a running theme in May's existence, going back to the days in grade school when the bullies couldn't catch her as she sprinted around the playground. Leaping over equipment, running around the legs of her instructors, and usually laughing the whole time. She wasn't laughing now, though. Even as she sprinted her commando through the light forest, dodging trees and exchanging fire with vehicles in pursuit. May's parents had originally pushed her toward dance, and for a while that was her entire world. Dreams of moving gracefully to music on some grand stage on Luthien filled her dreams. At least, they did until May saw her first holovid of a fight between two battle mechs. She was walking through her grade school academy when the cheers from the cafeteria caught May's attention. Walking in with her backpack on her shoulder, her black hair tightly bound into a braid, and holding her dance shoes, May watched in awe as the holovid projection showed the twists and turns of a battle between two mech warriors on some unnamed planet. A light mech that she later learned was called a Jenner ran with such grace that it almost looked to be dancing between the explosions around it. It twisted and turned and leapt into the air on jets of plasma fire. The mech firing at her was clearly having trouble and just firing out of frustration hoping that something would hit. Just when May thought that the Jenner would be running forever, it turned and bared down on its opponent, a panther painted in dark gray camo. SRMs and lasers cut through the panther's armor as it reeled and tried to fall back. However, the Jenner was on it like a predator catching its prey. As the cheers and jeers rose up around her in the cafeteria, May knew that she was destined to be a mech warrior. Convincing her parents was a challenge, but eventually they gave in, her father was the last domino to fall when he found May organizing the other kids in their neighborhood into a mock mech battle using sticks and thrown plastic bottles. After that, being a mech warrior was all that May ever wanted. It was her singular purpose that drove her, kept her out of trouble, and helped her get through life's trials and tribulations. When her mother passed away, May had her studies at the War Academy to distract her. When her father followed a few years later, May was finishing up her first two-year deployment as a rookie mech warrior in the DCMS. Being a mech warrior was always the distraction that could help her get through whatever life sent her way. That's why she was running through the forest in her commando. Dodging missiles, lasers, and bolts of bright blue PPC fire was preferable to thinking about how she had lost Ariana. For the first time in her life, there had been another destiny in addition to her first, but it was stolen away. May's teeth ground together as she twisted and banked hard, bringing the commando back around to fire at the closest tank, a swift J. Edgar. Its laser shots missing completely in the commando's turn, the hovercraft tried to bank away from the approaching mech, but May used their shock to close in like a predator on its kill. She fired all ten of her SRMs into the hovercraft, which shuddered from the multiple impacts. Before it could recover, May pushed to full acceleration and slammed her mech's foot into the crippled hovercraft. Armor buckled, tore, and was blown away as the vehicle shuddered and was ripped into pieces by the rushing battle mech. May roared as the commando stumbled, but she was able to keep it upright and running toward the next target. The 35-ton blade pushed through the undergrowth, finally catching up with the fight. May's eyes narrowed as she watched the mech lift and aim its rotary autocannon at her mech. The flashes from the weapon were prelude to the geysers of earth kicked up around her. May felt the shudder of impacts on her mech, and a quick glance down under screens showed she had caught some leg armor in the first shot. Keep going. Close on it. 
Go, May told herself out loud as she continued to run toward the blade in an angled sprint. She heard the welcomed beep of her SRMs finishing off their reloading cycle and aimed her targeting reticle at the center of mass. May added the medium laser to the mix as the SRMs peppered the armor of the blade. It shuddered from the impacts, but it did not falter. More autocannon rounds hit around the commando, with only a few glancing blows. At 50 meters, May split to the left, dodging another series of autocannon rounds while also letting loose with another 10 SRMs. This time, the missiles dug deep into the blade's torso armor. Explosions briefly bathed the mech in fire and set it off balance. The mech stumbled into a tree, which shuddered from the weight but did not break. Circling closer, 30 meters, 20, 10, the two medium lasers danced across the commando, scoring a hit and leaving twin scars across her mech's torso, but it was too late for that. May growled with determination, now drenched with sweat as she pushed her mech to the limit. The blade tried to turn to get a close-range shot off with a rotary autocannon, but May was faster. With the commando's hand up, she ran past the blade. She felt the shudder as her mech's fingers closed around the blade's exposed ammo feed, and then was slammed back against her restraints of her jump seat as the two mechs were yanked to the ground. May saw stars for a moment, but quickly shook her head as she looked up at the forest canopy above. Knowing this fight wasn't over, she twisted the commando to get a shot at it. The blade was on its back, and the belted autocannon feed was spewing AC-5 rounds up into the sky. They rained back down onto the prone mech and clattered to the ground around it. Lining up her laser, May fired into the pile of ammo just a few meters away. Instantly, the screens went blank, and the fans kicked in around May to siphon off the heat generated by the simulator to enhance realism. May simply closed her eyes and let the goosebumps form on her sweaty skin. You know, it's usually a bad idea to set off an ammo explosion when you're right next to it. A voice May, immediately recognized as the captain, interrupted her moment of simulated death. The blade was knocked out, yes, May responded. Oh, very much so, May. We need to talk, Rin said in a concerned tone. May unbuckled her harness and stood on slightly shaky legs. After hours of stationary sim practice, the muscles needed a minute to remember they had a purpose. I'll be out in a minute. When May climbed out of the simulator, Captain Rin was standing there holding a towel. May accepted it and wiped the sweat from her face before saying, I can't stay on this mission. The mission needs you. I'm sorry about Ariana. I really am. But this is much bigger than us, Rin said. May looked at Rin, taking in her disheveled looks for a few moments before responding, I think you're in over your head, and it's going to get a lot more people killed by the end of this. Rin's brow furrowed, and she reached up to push her glasses higher up on her nose. I know what I'm doing, but without you, people are at risk. We need you. This time it was May's turn to balk. She looked around the simulator bay and settled her gaze on Rin again before asking, What are you going to do about Kip and Olivia? I've asked Olivia to keep to her bunk for now. Kip has been living in the flight bay. I think we need a distraction from what happened. That's why we're in this system. I have some data that suggests there's something big to be found. That's why I need you. I'd like you to come with me to check it out, Rin said in a slightly excited tone. We need you. If I go, it's my last run. I'm still gone when we get back to the Combine, May conceded. If that's what you want to do when we return, I won't stop you. I'll even honor your contract and you can keep your commando, Rin said as she took May's hand in hers. May looked into Rin's face and was a little put off by the slightly too wide smile on it. <sighs> Deal. New Explorer Corps First Arm, Spinward Operations Area, System J5381, Zenith Jump Point, March 14th, 3152. Down in the mech bay, Tenika and Vasil were helping Akif with the repairs to the Thunderbolt. The three of them agreed that if anything could lift Olivia's spirits, it would be seeing her beloved mech back in one piece and ready to get into the fight. At the moment, the Thunderbolt's leg was reattached, but with new myomer cables that made up the mech's musculature were being temperamental. Covered in grime and grease, Vasil helped without complaint, though Tenika could see he was favoring his uninjured hand. We need a break, Tenika said as she slid down the gantry. Let's grab a drink. I'll be there in a bit. I just want to get these cables right so I don't have to worry about them, Lakeith said as he dangled from his harness behind the Thunderbolt's knee. 
Come on, Vasil, I'm buying. She playfully punched up to hit Vasil in the shoulder, and he looked down at her and grunted. The bay had a simple galley kitchen, cooler, and table where the two of them sat down with drinks that tasted somewhat like fruit-infused water. How are your fingers doing? Tenika said, gesturing towards the bandaged digits on Vasil's hand. Minor burns. They will be healed soon, Vasil replied, holding up his index finger and middle finger in a V shape. How are you other than that? Tenika asked as she took another sip. I'm fine. Yourself? Vasil responded in his usual Spartan prose. I'm still a little bit shook up from what happened. I, I've never actually seen anyone die up close like that before, Tenika admitted. Basil nodded slowly, taking in the comment and letting it stew for a few moments before responding. That is a benefit of being a mech warrior. You have distance between actions and consequences. I guess, Tenika said. They sat there for almost a minute before she spoke again to break the silence. Can you tell me how you ended up out here? Vasil looked down into Tenika's eyes before he said, I do not think that will improve your mood. We're friends. Friends back each other up. I want to know more about you, Tenika said as she reached out to place her hand on his arm. Vasil's eyes fell to the raptor tattoo on her arm, and he started to talk. Jade Falcon Occupation Zone, Orkney System, 25 kilometers outside New Hampshire City, November 3rd, 3151. Well away from the bustling city, hidden among the dusty rock and crystalline formations for which the planet is known, a series of small buildings was nestled. Behind a chain-link fence and signs that warned outsiders to keep away, Point Commander Vasil stood in his office looking over the concerning data arriving from the spaceport police garrison. Multiple jump ships had arrived in the system and had launched a half-dozen dropships now heading toward Orkney. If they were a clan, Vasil expected a challenge for the planet. If they were Lyran or some other inner sphere units, he expected no challenge at all before the bombs started to fall. Any retribution aimed at the Falcons would likely be devastating. Not that it mattered. There were just a few hundred Jade Falcons left on the planet, and not a single functional battle mech with which to defend it. Whoever these invaders were, the fight would be short. For the first time since the choice was made, Vasil reconsidered his decision to remain behind as the Jade Falcon Tuman left for Terra. Those thoughts lingered in his mind for all of a second before Vasil reminded himself that Melvina Hazen was a lunatic, and that he would surely have died in some dishonorable attack that was meaningless in the end. Staying on Orkney to watch over the Sibco had meaning. There was honor in helping these young Falcons learn what it meant to be a warrior, even if it guaranteed that his own days as a warrior were likely over. Vasil often found himself pondering things in a way that most Jade Falcons did not. In his youth, one of his instructors commented that there must be some ghost bear genes in Vasil's mix. It wasn't intended to be a compliment. Still, Vasil made his choice to remain behind when the rest of the Falcons moved on to Terra. He suffered the mocking and disgusted looks from his fellow elementals without response. If they wanted to go die for Malvina, that was their choice and their destiny. In the silence following their departure of the Falcons from the planet, Vasil threw himself into his job of training the young Falcons of the Sibco. There were a dozen Trueborn Falcons, all just past their thirteenth year. Eight of them were destined for trials to be a mech warrior, and the other four were bred elementals from their stature and bulk. Training was significantly curtailed after the rest of the Falcons left with every battle mech, repair part, and suit of battle armor they could find. Thankfully, Vasil had done a good job of squirreling away his armor just in case it was needed. As he walked outside and looked up into the stars as if he might be able to see the dropships still days away, he wondered how long he would be able to wear it before being gunned down by these invaders. At least he'd get a chance to die in battle after all. Falconer Vasil, is everything all right? A young voice broke through Vasil's contemplative thought. He looked back to see Ayas Taylor standing at the doorway to the barracks wearing her mech warrior trainer jumpsuit. Wake everyone up. We have a mission, Vasil said, crossing his arms and looking back up at the starry night. Two days later, two dropships descended into the New Hampshire City spaceport. Vasil and the others watched from the distant safety of a rock outcropping in a ridge near the Sibco complex. There were flashes of laser fire and a couple of explosions from missiles, but they stopped quickly. Confirming the invaders were hostile, Vasil turned to the twelve ASs and spoke through his armor's external speaker. We have to go east. 
There is a supply depot there that could have something left behind that we could use to defend ourselves. If not, we will continue on to Jamestown and hopefully find passage off-planet, he said as he looked over their young faces. Some looked concerned while others were ready to rush out and fight barehanded. The group of fledgling falcons and their falconer turned their backs to New Hampshire and their Sibco, hiking quickly through the mountains to the east, each carrying food and water to last a three-day hike to the depot. Basil trailed the column, frequently looking back to check for signs of attack. After the second day, the mountains gradually turned into rolling highlands, and Vasil knew they were getting close. By that point, the Iasses were tired and a bit sleep-deprived, but none would ever admit to it. After all, they were aspiring Jade Falcon warriors. They would do what is asked of them and more. Finding a good spot to rest for a few hours under the shade and protection of a crystal and rock outcropping, the group ate and rested in silence. Over Vasil's comms, he heard a chirp before an incoming message. He was curious, and so he listened to it. To any and all Clan Jade Falcons left on this planet, this is Star Captain Nafim Johnston of the Hell's Horses. Any resistance is to stop immediately, and you shall turn yourselves over to us for processing. Any guerrilla actions would dishonor your clan, and will be met with lethal and overwhelming force, the voice said in a tone that dripped with arrogance. Basil weighed his options. Looking over at the young cadets in his care, they were in no position to fight anyone. But why send out this message at all? Surely the captured at the starport would have told the horses that there were no defensive forces on the planet. We need to get moving, Basil said as he stood up in his armor. The Iasses quickly packed up and the group began to move in double time toward the depot in the distance, which was no more than a speck on the horizon marked with a green arrow on Basil's heads-up display. After an hour of jogging, the building was close enough to see the gated fence was open. Go. Get inside. Now. Basil growled as he picked up the sound of a tracked vehicle behind them. The dozen young falcons ran onto the ferrocrete of the depot and into the hangar, which was reinforced ferrocrete with turned to face the threat. Moments later, a Hell's Horse's tank roared over the crest of the hill and turned directly toward where Vasil was standing. He let his targeting computer soak in the tank's data, calculating its speed, class, and range. The Yenyo was a 55-ton medium tank built around an XL engine and a large pulse laser. In addition to the laser, it had three streaks, SRM-6s, and two machine guns. Vasil calculated his chance of survival against it to be roughly 10% if he charged at it now. For now, he waited as the tank slowed and came to a stop roughly 200 meters away from his position. Over the open comm link, Vasil heard the voice from earlier say, Point Commander Vasil, you are my bondsman, along with any Sibco cadets you have with you. Your suffering as a weak and cowardly Jade Falcon is over. Vasil stood motionless, not reacting to the insult, though he fought every fiber of his being that wanted to send him running, screaming at the tank. He bit his tongue for now and responded, I am wary of accepting the word of a Hell's Horses warrior who would use such an inappropriate amount of force against a single elemental and unarmed children. Ah, yes, that's lovely. You are alive in there after all. What a delight. Do you wish to bait me into some mismatched personal duel outside of my vehicle? I'm afraid that I'm not quite that stupid. Stand down and take off that armor before I shoot it off and grind those baby birds under my tracks. The voice replied with a level of glee that disturbed Vasil. The Enyo and the Elemental stared each other down for a dozen wordless seconds before Vasil said, If you guarantee on the honor of Kerensky that you will take in these cadets and give them a chance at trials to become warriors, I will stand down. However, I cannot be your bondsman. Well bargained and done. Let's deal with that last part first, the voice gleefully replied as the turret fired. The large pulse laser's red beam cut across the open ground and seared the light grass into vapor, beyond where Vasil had been standing a fraction of a second before. Pumping his legs hard, Vasil closed the distance between him and the tank, counting down the meters before he could fire his jump jets and land on its armored hide. As he moved, Vasil counted on the streak SRMs having a hard time locking onto a single elemental. Luckily, they did not fire. The tank turned a bit to bring its machine guns to bear. 
Both streams of machine gun fire cut furrows into the dirt around Vasil as he ran. A few rounds bounced off his sloped armor with several striking true. Warning lights began to glow as the suit warned of stresses in the plate, but he still ran on. At a hundred meters, Vasil triggered his jump jets and rose on a plume of smoke and fire. As he came down, his suit picked up a missile tracking from behind him. It flew by the tank and impacted the hill beyond it. At the last second, the tank veered to the right and Vasil was forced to land on the ground just behind the tank, which was now accelerating toward the depot. Shifting his weight and turning toward the tank, Vasil saw the asses trying to set up a small crude weapon at the door of the hangar. Two of the kids were fiddling with the Manpack SRM launcher trying to reload it quickly. Vasil yelled into the comm as he raised his arm to fire his small laser at the tank, now leaving him behind in a dust cloud. Do not do that. Go back inside. You cannot help. Vasil fired his jump jets again, trying to catch the tank, which was now aiming directly at the depot. On the open comm, the Hell's Horse's star captain laughed and said, On second thought, let's just wipe the slate clean. Vasil landed with a hard thud, only to jump again. His muscles ached as he pushed his armor to the limit. His eyes went wide as he watched the Enyo fire at the doors of the depot, with 18 streak SRMs and the large pulse laser. Strike, bandit scum! Vasil roared. As the tank started to turn back towards Vasil, he landed directly on top of the turret. Operating on pure rage and adrenaline by this point, he sank his claws into the metal plating just behind the laser turret. He pulled back as hard as he could and didn't stop, even after his suit started registering stress fractures in his suit's musculature. "'Your dishonorable filth!' Vasil growled as he aimed his small laser into the gap he created and fired the weapon. The small laser bored through the exposed internals and into the mechanisms of the large pulse laser. Glowing with molten slag, the weapon would be useless. As if an instinctual response, the annual picked up speed and then swerved hard in an attempt to knock the elemental from its back. He fell but still clung to the tank, now dangling off the turret over the set of SRM tubes. Looking down, Vasil saw the machine gun on the left side of the tank, tracking frantically looking for a target. With a hard stomp, his battle-armored foot crashed down on the barrels, bending them to the point of uselessness. Reinforcements will be here soon. You'll die anyway, falcon scum. The star commander growled into the comm as he jerked the tank from side to side in order to dislodge Vasil, letting go with his claw just long enough to drop down and duck under the swinging turret barrel. Vasil began to hammer down into the body of the vehicle. He pulled at armor, fired his laser into the hole, only to rip and tear more. All the while, his rage was insatiable. Finally, he felt as if he was getting close and the tank suddenly jerked to a stop. Vasil stumbled and fell down the front of the vehicle, though he was able to cling on. A much less confident voice from the Star Commander came over the comlink, saying, You fought with honor. Let's make a deal. Vasil didn't respond on the comlink. He simply climbed back up to where he was working and jammed his metallic fist through the last bit of internal structure and into the tank's cabin. When he pulled his arm from the hole, he could see down into the cabin lit red. Without hesitation, he aimed a small laser into the hole and fired. New Explorer Corps, First Arm, Spinward Operations Area, System J5381, Zenith Jump Point, March 14th, 3152. Tenika took in Vasil's story in awe, though she kept searching for some sign of emotion in his face and found none. He recounted it with the cool and collected manner she had grown to respect, but she knew there was hurt behind the facade. Did any of the cadets make it? Tenika asked as she squeezed Vasil's hand. Vasil shook his head and said, They all died as true jade falcons. They showed courage when none was expected. I should have considered that in my actions. That sounds suspiciously like you blame yourself, Tenika responded. Ultimately, I was responsible for them. I failed, Vasil said in a matter-of-fact way that was off-putting to Tenika. You charged a tank to try to save them. You could have abandoned them and no one would ever have known, but you didn't. You fought for them. I could have done more. I could have done things differently, Basil said with a slight crack in his voice. Wanting nothing more than to cradle this giant of a human in her arms, Tenika stood up. Even with him still in his chair, the two of them were now at eye level. She leaned in, pressing her forehead against Vasil's and stared into his eyes. You retain your honor. You fought for them. You fought for me. You'll keep fighting until you can't, and then a little bit more after that, 
Understand me, soldier, Tenika said in as authoritative tone as she could. Vasil's eyes tracked back and forth between her left and right eye for a few moments, at that extremely close distance, before he responded, Yes. End Part 12 New Explorer Corps, First Arm, Spinward Operations Area, System J5381, Planet B, March 16th, 3152. Stepping down the ramp from the Alalia onto solid ground, Rin straightened her off-white jacket and took several deep breaths from the chilled atmosphere. Her captain's cap was snug on her tightly braided red hair and her glasses high on the bridge of her nose. She closed her eyes for a moment and silently told herself to straighten up and put on the show. Even though no one else knew it yet, Rin felt this planet held the key to her destiny. No, she knew it did. The ramp rumbled behind her as Akif's calliope took its first confident steps down out of the dropship. The 40-ton mech held its right arm out, prepared to fire, but it was just the mech warrior messing around and it didn't appear there were any surviving settlement on this chilly planet's surface. However, if any of the snow drifts or plant life turned out to be hostile, Akif was ready. Behind him marched May and her commando. After their conversation outside the simulator, May had slowly returned to the world from which she had retreated following the loss of Ariana. Rin understood all of this and empathized with May. However, the last thing the mission could absorb was the loss of another mech or another team member. Being down to just one aerospace pilot was going to put the rabbit's foot at risk, especially since their pilot, Kip, was still devastated by the loss of his daughter. Unfortunately, that emotion manifested in anger, and Kip was taking it out on everyone around him until Rin sat him down and they talked. She shared a few things with him which seemed to focus Kip on the mission at hand. When May's commando passed Rin by and began its patrol of the landing zone, Rin pulled the mech warriors up on the comlink. After a perimeter check, let's keep close to the ship. Olivia, since your mech is still being troublesome, you're my wild card. Keep out of sight in the dropship and come out if something happens. Rin said as she hopped into the four-wheeler Tenneka was driving as it reached the end of the ramp. Half captain Olivia responded in a flat tone. Tenneka had dark glasses on, help with the sunlight coming off the snowdrifts around the LZ. As Rin buckled up, Tenneka asked, Where to, boss? Two kilometers east, there's an old settlement. The drones show nothing recent, Rin replied. That sounds familiar, Tenneka retorted with a slightly pained chuckle. The vehicle handled the snowdrifts without issue as its wide tires helped it roll more on top of them than through them. Gradually, they reached the far end of the valley, surrounded by gentle icy hills. As Tenika stopped the vehicle, Rin took off her belt and stood up, looking out at what appeared to be a long abandoned settlement made up of dozens of stone and brick buildings. Once out of the vehicle, the two walked up to the closest building, leaving fresh tracks in the light snow. This place looks like no one's lived here for a thousand years, Tenika said, tugging her jacket a little tighter at the same time. Rin pulled out her tablet computer and flipped through something on it before responding, No, no one's ever lived here. How do you know? Tenika asked as she watched Rin step forward and start to slide her hand over the bricks as if she was looking for something. Rin smiled to herself as she looked for the mark. Her response came in the form of a strange chuckle. <laughs> it's just a hunch. Tenika kept her eyes peeled and a rifle in her arms in a guarded position as they moved from building to building along the perimeter of the settlement. The mech warrior had no idea what the captain was looking for, but she sure was determined. After a walk around the tenth building, they were getting a bit far from the vehicle for comfort. Tenika was about to say something when Rin yelped out, It's here! She tapped on a brick that had a maker's mark carved onto it that looked like a warped star. The facing of the brick popped open, revealing a keypad with a small screen next to it. Now that's fancy masonry, Tenika said. Rin ignored the comment and typed in the code. After a few moments, the keypad chirped and the ground under their feet began to rumble. Rin and Tenika backed up, unsure what was happening. The snow fell from where it had settled on top of the ruined walls. Tenika lifted a rifle and had it at the ready, scanning for possible threats. Rin just waited. A rectangle section of ground, roughly the size of the vehicle they arrived in, began to sink and then slide back, exposing a gently sloping ramp into the ground. Rin stared in awe as her imagination began to run wild. She knew they were close to something big, and here they were on the verge of a grand discovery. As the movement and rumbling from the door stopped, Rin checked her tablet and then pulled out the flashlight on her belt. You ready? she asked as she walked toward the passage. Shouldn't we wait for support or something? 
Tenek asked with some trepidation. You're my support. Let's go, Rin said as she walked down the ramp. Tenika tapped the calm link on her collar. May, can you come babysit us out here? Two kilometers east, we've found something, Tenika said as she looked back toward the landing zone. May responded quickly, on my way. New Explorer Corps, first arm, spinward operations area, system J5381, T-7 hours from planet B, March 15th, 3152. Cal Levitt stood in awe of the messy cabin. Strown around the items Rin had collected over the years were boxes of her grandfather's files, books, several tablet computers, and countless sheets of crumpled paper. In the middle of the chaos, Cal's best friend sat furiously scribbling with a pen on the latest sheet of paper. He looked over at the photos on her shelf and sighed. The one with the two of them, fresh out of the academy, hit hard. Her smile was infectious, and it was impossible to listen to her talk about her passions without also getting excited. It suddenly felt so long ago. Rin, we need to talk before we land. Your behavior is worrying the crew, and I think something is very wrong. If the stress of this mission is too much, maybe we can work something out with the wolves and dragons. With what we've found so far, it's possible they could give us a break on the contracts, Cal said as he stepped forward to Rin's desk. Rin finally looked up to reply, Cal, I have it. I'm sure, look. She held up a piece of paper, and from what Cal could make out of the hastily scrawled writing was confusing but looked like a patterned code of some sort. He took the piece of paper from her and looked at it while Rin kept speaking. I, I wasn't sure at first, but there is a cadence to the words. When I wrote it out, I started to notice the pattern. See, it repeats every three lines, even though the whole thing is 300. A whole speech, but only three important lines you need to know over and over. Cal was even more confused by her explanation. He shook his head and looked into her excited eyes before saying, Rin, what are you... What are you talking about? What speech? These three lines? They, it looks like gibberish. It's not. You see, these three lines repeat over and over. I ran it through some programs, but the computer wasn't able to get much. Just numbers. But I saw there was more to it. If you line these up, they look like coordinates. Well, it, it doesn't look like it, but they are coordinates. We're here. They led us here, she said, looking more excited than she had been since dreaming up this mission. What do you think is down there, Rin? Cal asked as he looked into her almost crazed eyes. The solution, she replied, stepping back and starting to organize a messy desk. The solution to everything. Cal sighed again, looking back at the picture of the two of them on the shelf before responding. That's setting a high bar. Rin leaned forward a bit, put both hands on the desk and said, You'll see. New Explorer Corps, First Arm, Spinward Operations Area, System J5381, Planet B, March 16th, 3152. The ramp Tenika and Rin walked down sloped a little more than switched back, which cut off most of the lighting from the surface. With their two flashlights, the pair slowly descended deeper into the poured Ferrocrete tunnel. Tenika was on edge after her previous experience planetside, but Rin was enthusiastically moving faster as they made their way down the passage. Three more switchbacks brought them deeper and deeper into whatever this was, and Tenika didn't like it. Trying to raise the other mech warriors on the comm link was met with silence. Whatever this place was built out of was blocking their communications link. At least she hoped that it was what it was, and not some active jamming device. Finally reaching a flat surface, Rin was five meters ahead of Tenika and reached the door first. Roughly two meters by three meters, the metal door looked ancient. It was iron lightly rusted, and had rivets in it instead of welds. The only modern thing about it was the keypad set in the ferrocrete next to it, the one that Rin was frantically punching numbers into as Tenika walked up. The keypad chirped, and the door slowly strained against the grime and rust that had sealed it into place. You're going to have to tell me how you got that code, Tenika said as she looked over at the near ecstatic Rin. In good time, just you wait, Rin said as she stepped into the space beyond the door. As the boots hit the floor on the other side, lights high above started to kick on automatically. Both Rin and Tenika had to shield their eyes for a moment from the intense glare. As Tenika's eyes adjusted and she peeked again, her mouth dropped open in shock. The underground hangar stretched more than a hundred meters in each direction, with crates and vehicles scattered around in a haphazard mess. Though Tenika wasn't looking at any of that, her dark brown eyes were fixed firmly on the massive battle mechs standing motionless at the head of an arrow formation of other mechs in the hangar. 
Tenika tried to find the words to react properly to what she was seeing, but all that managed to escape her mouth was, Whoa. Ren walked triumphantly forward with her hands jutting out in exuberant victory. Her eyes scanned in every direction, mentally cataloging all the possibilities that lay ahead of them. Is that really a... I've never seen one before for real, just holovids. Tenika managed to stutter, forgetting she was even holding a rifle at this point. It hung on her shoulder as she stood dumbfounded. I know you missed your Zeus, but I think you might need an upgrade, Rin said with a huge smile as she turned and gestured toward the leading mech. Tenika took in the amazing view, painted in black, shifting up to light gray, as her eyes traveled higher on the mech. The king crab dominated the room with its presence. It looked to be in pristine condition, with no signs of combat repairs or wear and tear. Is it really mine? Tenika asked, still disbelieving her eyes. Rin smiled and walked up to Tenika, taking her by the shoulders, and responded, We can't have a mech warrior on the mission without a mech, can we? I, I suppose not, Tenika said as she was finally able to break her gaze from the mech and looked at Rin. After a few moments, looking around in awe, Rin sent Tenika back up to notify everyone that they were going to need to bring in the other dropship and Vasil to help with all of this. With Tenika returning to the surface, Rin took a moment to enjoy the feeling of vindication. The items around her would be valuable beyond their physical use as they were artifacts of a different time, a time full of possibilities, a time when the galaxy was almost made anew. She walked closer to a set of crates and wiped the dust away from the iconography on the top. The downward thrusting sword was unmistakable. Reaching the surface, Tenika opened a link to the comms officer on the Alelia, asking her to relay a message to the rabbit's foot. Lieutenant Levitt, we need you to prepare the Akrai to join us planetside. The captain has found a cache of goods and mechs. It's big. More info to follow, she said before connecting with the mech warriors. What's up, Tenika? Akif asked after Tenika's excited greeting. You're not going to believe it, but we found a king crab, she said. Really? May responded. That's not all. The captain wants Akif to come help out at the site. Olivia, you're on guard duty at the dropship, Tenika explained. Olivia's response was delayed and showed some hesitation before she said, Affirmative. Two hours later, Akif watched from the command chair of his calliope as the central courtyard of the Faux settlement slid open and the black and gray king crab slowly rose on the hangar's massive lifter. He struggled to find something clever to say and ended up just silently watching as it halted at ground level. During that journey up to the surface, May and Rin watched from below, proud that they were able to get the mech up and running. In the King Crab's command seat, Tenika gripped the control sticks and gently pushed the foot pedal. The massive 100-ton battle mech slowly began to step forward, responding well to the commands. It was definitely going to take some getting used to, but already Tenika was in love with it. How is it? Akif asked the open comm link. Tenika chuckled and replied, it's a bit slower than I'm used to, but she has got a lot of weight to throw around. The mech took several more steps forward and then increased its pace as Tenika carefully stepped around the ruined structures onto open ground. Akif walked the calliope up next to the mech and laughed as it was dwarfed by the king crab more than twice its weight. Well, you'll never have to worry about how to make an entrance now. Tenika smiled to herself as she looked down at the console, taking in all that the mech's systems had to offer. It was this feeling of power and control over destiny that she had lost when her Zeus was taken from her. The king crab lifted its arms, and she aimed her weapons at a distant crop of snow-covered trees. Testing the lock, Tenika resolved to never let anyone or anything take that feeling from her again. End Part 13 New Explorer Corps First Arm Spinward Operations Area System J5381 Nadir Jump Point Jump Ship Rabbit's Foot March 18th, 3152. Lieutenant Cal Levitt felt quite accomplished in the moment as the mule dropship named Akrai slowly built speed and headed toward the chilly, rocked planet where the rest of the team was waiting. He was covered in sweat and some grime after helping Vasil and the others load the dropship with some additional gear to support what had been described as a major discovery over the long-range communications link with the Alalia. With the second dropship away, Cal didn't feel comfortable about leaving the rabbit's foot, so he resisted the temptation and sent Vasil on with some of the crew. He was having trouble not getting excited at the prospect of a discovery so good it required both dropships. He was making his way back up to the bridge of the rabbit's foot when he heard a chirp on his comlink. link. 
He recognized the voice of the ship's comms officer. The voice stated, We've got a jump ship flare at the Nadir jump point. It happened just a minute ago. Levitt ran the rest of the way to the bridge. When his boots hit the deck plating, he could see it was abuzz with activity. People were shuffling around and everyone was talking. Sit rep, folks. What's going on? The communications officer, well-trained but green, walked up to the hollow table and pulled up a very poor quality 3D render of a jump ship, which flickered off after a couple of seconds, only to restart again on a loop. Cal walked up to it, took in the limited view, and furrowed his brow. He looked over and said, Kirsch, is that all we have? What are the specs on this thing? Is it talking? Corporal Miri Kirsch, the ship's greenhorn comms officer, shook her head and replied, That's all we were able to get, sir. I think we're being locked down. I tried to pull up the Akrai and let them know, that we, but we haven't gotten anything back. Then the Akrai and everything else disappeared from our scanners. We're blind and deaf out here. Cal tapped his knuckle against the edge of the hollow table in frustration. The jump ship was at another point, so it wasn't an immediate threat, but if it sent over a dropship, the rabbit's foot was in trouble. How long would it take for a dropship to get from the Nadir to the Zenith jump point? Levitt asked. Mary looked down at her console, clicked a few things before responding. 4.5 days, maybe less depending on the speed of the dropship. Try to get a message out to both dropships. Let them know that they might have company and need to get back to the ship as quickly as possible. Let's get the rabbit's foot ready to go, Levitt said as he walked over to the command chair and toggled the ship-wide comms link. He glanced back at the short clip of the fuzzy jump ship image before speaking into the mic. This is Lieutenant Levitt. We have an unknown jump ship at the Nadir jump point, and it does not appear friendly. We need to start preparing for a jump. Kip, I need you on the bridge ASAP. Turning back to walk to the hollow table, he looked over at Kirsch, who was busy trying to get that message out. His eyes tracked over the other consoles, with crew all frantically doing their jobs, and finally, down to the repeating jump ship hologram. What are you up to? New Explorer Corps. First Arm, Spinward Operations Area, System J5381, Planet B, March 20th, 3152, 1310 hours. Landing the Akrai near the Alalia wasn't a problem, though Vasil was on edge as no one on the dropship had heard anything on the comms from either the rabbit's foot or the planet since they left over two days ago. That kind of communication blackout rarely indicated an uneventful trip. Walking down the sloped dropship ramp, taking in the view with each step, Vasil was not expecting to see what looked like the most poorly designed field supply depot ever constructed. Through his battle armor's heads-up display, he was able to quickly sort out the Calliope in commando, but Olivia's thunderbolt was nowhere to be seen, and there were three other battle mechs in the valley. All three were painted black at the feet and gradually faded up to the light gray near the heads. The largest mech was easily identifiable as a 100-ton king crab. The other two were smaller designs, and it took his computer a few seconds to pull up their IDs. The Grim Reaper was 55 tons, and the Helios, 60. Only the King Crab was active, plodding its way on a patrol. What's going on here? Vasil asked over the NEC comm frequency. Akif's voice responded, but it was difficult to hear what he said over the shouting in the background. Repeat. What is going on? Vasil asked again, starting to jog toward where he saw the others standing around a large pile of crates dumped into the snow outside of the brick ruins. Closing fast, he loomed large over the rest of the crew, though they did not notice him. Captain Barrett and the mech warrior Olivia were screaming at each other, and both May and Akif were trying to play peacemaker. You're going to get us all killed! Olivia screamed, trying to get past May, who was trying her best to stand in the way. Firing back, Rin yelled, You've been sabotaging this mission from the start with your attitude. Vasil was confused as to why they were being held back from settling whatever the issue was. Let them fight, he said over the open speaker in his battle armor. To unprotected ears from just a few meters away, the statement was loud enough to give everyone pause, if not ringing ears. Olivia looked over at Vasil and said, this is all word of Blake Shadow Division gear. If even one piece of this is identified for what it is, we will be hunted by everyone. Fasil gritted his teeth at the mention of the word of Blake, and he turned toward Rin, who was already sporting the beginning of a black eye. She spoke past to Keith, who was still standing between the two angry women. She said, This is exactly the sort of thing we were sent out here to find. The word of Blake is gone. These are all just things. The information we could gather from some of this technology would be prized by both the wolves and the Combine. 
It sounds like something that could be resolved in a circle of equals. May and Akif, let them fight. The first to yield withdraws, and the issue is settled, Basil said in a very matter-of-fact way. Seriously? Akif asked. Fine by me, Olivia said, balling up her fists. You can't stop destiny, Olivia, Rin replied. Akif and May looked at each other for a moment, then gave up and moved aside. Vasil didn't expect to be watching a circle of equals fight today, but life is full of little unexpected moments. As they squared off and circled each other, Vasil figured Olivia had the edge. Sure enough, the mech warrior charged in and knocked Rin off of her feet, sending both tumbling to the snow-covered ground. Grappling while yelling and grunting with exertion, Olivia vented her frustrations now that it was clear that Rin had lied about giving up all the information gathered from the HPG site. You're a reckless liar, she growled as she rabbit-punched Rin in the stomach. Rin let out a wheezing cough as the air left her lungs. Kicking her legs out, Rin was able to unbalance Olivia enough to get out from under her before swinging one leg around to kick Olivia in the shoulder and sending the mech warrior sprawling. May and Akif looked around nervously, as if this were an academy brawl between classmates which might be broken up at any second. As Olivia was about to lunge again toward Rin, a shadow fell across the entire group. Turning in his battle armor, Vasil immediately felt his adrenaline pump as a pair of dropships fell from the sky. Get to your mechs. Now, he bellowed. Akif and May wasted no time and ran directly to their nearby battle mechs, while Olivia and Rin slowly scrambled up onto their feet. Vasil was on the move quickly, yelling at the dropship crews to drop whatever they were doing and get back into the ships. It was chaos manifest, and every passing moment felt wasted. Vasil opened the comm slink with Tenika and asked, Is that you in the King Crab? Heck yeah it is! How do you like my new ride? Tenika said in a jovial manner. We have incoming dropships. Get back here and put yourself between us and them. Look menacing. Basil said as he grabbed a crate and dragged it over to toss onto a pile, creating a slightly higher bit of cover. His mind was running a mile a second, trying to create as menacing a series of barriers as possible. No matter what came out of those dropships, he wanted to present a challenge. Rin ran up on Vasil and told him to stop. We'll talk to them. There's more stuff here than we need. We can work out a deal, Rin said, trying to calm the elemental as he added a crate labeled Battle Mech Actuator to the pile he was creating. That is your job. My job is to keep everyone safe if you fail. Vasil responded as he ran from her to create another pile of crates. The two egg-shaped ships slowly settled down on plasma fire and smoke. Blown water vapor, dirt, and debris billowed even further out, scarring the pristine snow. Vasil looked back at the Acre and Alalia, his suit estimating the distance and confirming that whoever these people were, they knew enough to land outside the range of any of the mule's weapons. When they cut their engines, there was a short silence as nature reasserted itself in the valley. Smoke drifted, and water vapor slowly to return to its solid form. Vasil zoomed in on his HUD to try to ID the ships, but there were no markings other than the dark gray paint that both dropships looked like they had been dipped in. There was clear wear and tear and a suspicious lack of maintenance which told Vasil these were not regular house forces, and they sure the heck weren't clanned. The dropship doors cracked open and began their slow crawl toward the ground, as May and Akif took their first steps in their battle mechs toward Vasil. Tenika was not far behind, slowly trotting up the slight incline toward the forming line between the two pairs of dropships. When the ramps hit the snow-covered ground, Vasil stood waiting with three battle mechs at his back. The Helios and Grim Reaper still stood pilotless, facing the Alalia, with their backs to the new arrivals. Rin continued to walk toward the gray dropships, now more than fifty meters ahead of the rest of the NEC crew. "'You are too far out ahead,' Vasil said into the comms. After a few seconds, Rin replied, "'Just stand down. I will sort this out.' Vasil got the notification for a private channel connection. When he joined, he heard Olivia and Tenika's voices in the back and forth. "'Are we going to fire on these guys if they take out the captain?' Olivia asked. "'I would assume so. Vasil, what do you think?' Tenika responded just as Akif and May joined the channel as well. Vasil watched as the jet black 80 ton Victor stepped out onto the ramp of one dropship, while a marauder with a matching matte black scheme took its first steps out from the other ship. Behind each of those mechs, a 50 ton enforcer and then a 75 ton mortis. 
That last mech was painted black just like the others, except for the massive scythe-like axe in its hands, which was painted glossy red in a pattern that was clearly intended to mimic blood. With a grunt, Vasil said, We are outgunned, but it would be a glorious fight. Should have known the Falcon was ready for a fight, Keefe chimed in. May hadn't said anything since joining the channel, and instead of standing along with the others, she was pacing in her commando a couple of dozen meters back. The newcomer Lance of Mechs slightly advanced from their dropships and then stopped. Then the Mortis took a few more steps. A magnified view of Vasil's HUD showed the captain from the back. She was making hand gestures as if she was talking, but a scan of the frequency showed no open channels. I think they are talking on a closed channel, Vasil said as he double-checked his weapon systems for the tenth time in the past minute. Why would she not include us? Tenek asked. The captain keeps a lot of dirty secrets, Tenika, Olivia responded. So if this goes sideways, Vasil, Tenika queried again after ignoring Olivia's comment. Vasil watched more closely, trying to pick out any sign of how the conversation was going. Before he could respond, the Mortis took several steps, accelerating towards Rin. The NEC mech warriors watched in horror as the Mortis closed the gap and swung its scythe at her. Go, Vasil roared into the comms as he fired his jump jets, rocketing up into the air to close the gap with the captain quickly. Rin began to run as soon as she saw the mortis prepare to strike, and barely managed to dive out all the way of the gigantic weapon. Unfortunately, the rush of air the weapon brought with it knocked the air out of her lungs and slammed her down onto the cold, rocky ground. May's commando raced past the line toward the middle, missiles launching toward the mortis as it was still in the backswing. Roughly half of the short-range missiles peppered the mortis and forced it to take the focus off of the captain. Over the next few seconds, three things happened. The first was a cascade of fire from both sides as the mechs opened up on each other. Lasers burned through the atmosphere in a kaleidoscope of colors. Missiles streaked towards targets in perfect arcs of fire and white plumes of smoke. The second thing that happened in those first few seconds was Tenika's king crab slumping forward into a full shutdown. The second she squeezed the triggers to fire both heavy PPCs, it locked up and all the systems went dark. The third thing involved a largely ignored distant rumble of machinery long dormant in the hills above the valley. Sensors calibrated to pick up the sounds and atmospheric shifts of battle woke up and started to run their code. Wheels began to turn and tracks began to roll. Akif was quick to run and circled the field, moving with purpose to avoid incoming fire while adding his own into the fray. He lined up his plasma rifle on the mortise, but just as he pulled the trigger, the victor stepped into the line of fire. The ball of plasma slammed into the armored shoulder of the victor and burned into the plate with sparks and fury, but caused little actual damage. The 80-ton monster of a mech lined up a return shot, which sent a Gauss rifle slug whizzing through the Calliope's moving legs. Akeith breathed a sigh of relief as he cycled his medium pulse lasers at the new target. May's brow furrowed in fierce determination as she ran her commando into the fray, trying to distract from any further aggression toward the captain. She zigged and zagged the mech while doing everything she could to stay upright. The mech's internal structure groaned from the incredible stresses being put on it. Two PPC shots cut across her mech, one of which seared away much of the armor on her right arm. May fought the controls and narrowly avoided smashing into one of the brick walls of the ruins over the hidden depot. Descending into the rocky, snowy ground with a crunch after a second jump, Vasil knelt down to check on Rin. She coughed and was awake, though looked pretty banged up. Stay here. I will return, he said into the external speaker before running a few meters away and triggering his jump jets again. Not going anywhere, Rin said, wiping blood from her lips with her hand. She shielded her eyes with the same hand as Vasil rocketed away, but then focused her vision on it. Her two outside fingers were bent at impossible angles. Oh, well, at least I'm going into shock, she muttered as a hand fell back to the ground. Just a minute before, Rin had felt so confident striding up to introduce herself to these newcomers. Sure, they looked a little menacing, but as so long as she put on her game face and sounded official, things would work out. They had to. It was destiny. She wasn't prepared to hear such raucous laughter in response to her introduction. Things degraded quickly after that. The gruff voice on the private comms link explained, You're on the wrong planet, missy. This is Hex Prefecture turf, and you don't have permission to be digging around here. 
Well, I think we can come to an arrangement. We can't possibly fill our holds with all this, so we can split it 50-50, Rin said with some reluctance, though 50% is still better than zero. More laughter filled the comms link before the voice she presumed belonging to the pilot in the large mech with the scythe responded. Well, that wouldn't get set a very nice precedent for looting our stuff. If we let you keep half, and everybody else wants half, soon there's not much left. Rin was getting desperate and played her next card when she said, We are in direct employ of the Draconis Combine. A fight against us would bring the fury of the dragon your direction. Well, came the response. I guess we'd better make sure we don't let the word get out came the response before the mech charged at her. What happened next, Rin couldn't quite recall at the moment, as her view of the sky seemed to be narrowing a bit by the second. She tried to lift her hand to wipe her face again, but couldn't feel it or see if she was successful. This didn't seem like the destiny she was promised. Damn it, work! Tenika yelled as she frantically fiddled with the wires of the jumped console. The king crab remained motionless as the world was lit on fire around it. Thankfully, the mech wasn't taking fire as it looked like the intruders assumed it was always inert. Still, Tenika knew that her friends needed her. Somewhere, May, Akif, Olivia, Rin, and Vasile were fighting for their lives, and here she was playing computer technician. After reconnecting a couple of more wires, Tenika slid back up and sat into the command chair, hitting the startup buttons on the console while uttering a prayer for the first time in decades console flashed and then lit up in a celebratory cascade of beeps and lights. She wanted to cheer and throw up her hands in victory, but there wasn't any time. Buckling quickly and sliding on her neuro helmet, Tenika finally looked up to see the battlefield before her. The King Crab's computer started marking targets and IDing friendly units as she had programmed them into the system earlier that day. It also picked up Vasil's battle armor suit initially as a hostile until she marked it otherwise in the HUD with the movement of her eyes and a button on the right control stick. She felt a surge of both pride and concern as the little elemental landed on the left arm of the mortise, which reacted by torso-twisting wildly and trying to scrape him off with the hatchet. The king crab's weapon systems chirped ready and Tenika focused intensely before firing. The targeting reticle glowed brightly and she squeezed the triggers for both heavy PPCs. Vasil clung on with all of his strength as the mortise flailed and tried to knock him off. The scything hatchet came close, but the elemental was able to scramble back behind the mech's elbow. There he went to work. Venting all of his pent-up aggression into this task, he began to carve into the exposed joint of the mech with his small laser. Plastic and myomer burned as he fired again and again, pushing the power of the laser to its limit and dancing on the edge of locking up the weapon entirely. From the corner of his eye, he saw the victor draw near, but thankfully its attention was drawn elsewhere by a flash of a plasma cannon shot. Nearly tossed again by the mortise, rapidly turning and swinging its arm, Vasil growled and fired yet again. This time the laser hit something important, and the entire left arm went slack. The barrel on the heavy PPC it carried pointed to the ground and swayed uselessly. Admiring the victory for a moment, it was cut short by the bright blue light that his battle armor struggled to dim in time to keep Vasil from seeing spots. The mortise rocked backwards as both heavy PPC shots slammed into its center and right torso, like twin freight trains of blue lightning. Armor wasn't blasted so much as it evaporated and boiled away, digging deep into the heavy mech's internal structure. Vasil acted on instinct and hit his jump jets even before he could see what happened. Only after starting his arc up into the air did he turn and see the mortise slowly falling back and crashing to the snowy ground. Turning his attention to the nearby victor, Vasil twisted on his arc only to see the victor's hand rising up to meet him. May kept up the speed, but in one in every dozen shots, the marauder stalking her was getting lucky. The PPC wasn't scoring hits, but the two medium pulse lasers were slashing at her meager armor. She was giving as good as she was getting, sending SRMs into the marauder's tough hide as often as the reloader chimed in her ear. May growled in frustration, lining up her next shot when everything seemed to go wrong at once. Her run was turned into a tumble as she was slammed against her command chair restraints. The commando's right arm came completely off, and the left leg dangled by cables. It would have been an almost comical sight to see the little commando twirl through the air if there wasn't a human being inside. The enforcer had closed to cut off the running commando. The LB-10X in its arm had caught May's mech full on. 
The mech-sized shotgun round had ripped through the already heavily damaged commando and scattered smoking bits of wreckage over dozens of meters. The annoyance handled, both the enforcer and the marauder turned toward the stalking kid crab. Hanging upside down in the dark, lit only by a fire behind her, May wondered why she wasn't already dead. Everything ached, and she could smell the chemicals in the smoke rapidly filling what was left of her cockpit. The cockpit glass was cracked, and smoke was escaping, but not fast enough to let in fresh air. Every breath burned. May reached out, trying to grasp at something, anything that could help her escape this impending doom. But in that moment of pure terror, she suddenly stopped. Her hands went limp as she remembered her promise to Ariana. The last words out of her mouth were, I missed you. End part 14 New Explorer Corps, First Arm, Spinward Operations Area, System J5381, Nadir Jump Point, Jump Ship Rabbit's Foot, March 20th, 3152. Cal Levitt was well past sick of flying blind. More than enough time had passed since the mystery jump ship had entered the system for any dropships that might have been dislodged to reach Planet B, and there was no way for him to know if they had doomed Rin and the rest of the crew. The bridge crew and the science team had done everything they could think of to break up whatever was locking down the sensors and blocking communications. Short of sending Kip out in an aerospace fighter with a handwritten note, they were helpless. Tapping the empty mug against the command chair armrest to the beat of a song he could barely remember, Levitt had to be snapped out of his daydream. Lieutenant Levitt, I, I said everything's back. We have eyes, comms, everything. Corporal Miri Kirsch said with a level of exuberance that Cal admired after days of silence. Pull up the jump ship. Can we sort out if they sent any dropships? Cal said as he stood up and moved to the hollow table. It's gone. It must have jumped out of the system. That would explain why we have our eyes and comms back, Miri continued as she hammered out commands on her console. Cal pulled up the original short flickering image before asking, Did we get anything just before their jump? Yes, I'll pull it up, Miri responded. A few seconds later, a new view of the mystery jump ship popped up and Cal moved them together with a wave of his hand. Though the quality was crummy, it was immediately obvious that there were two dropships missing from the spine of the jump ship. Levitt's brow furrowed. We're in trouble. I want everyone at their stations and defenses up. Why? It's gone, Miri said with a confused look. If it left dropships behind and it jumped out, that means they're coming back, likely to the nearer point. It's what I would do if I knew my prey was pinned in system with their own dropships out, Levitt said, before adding, If we have comms, I want to know what the hell's going on down there on Planet B. New Explorer Corps, First Arm, Spinward Operations Area, System J5381, Planet B. March 20th, 3152. Keeping the Marauder from firing with repeated hits with his plasma rifle was Akeef's entire mission at this point. The 75-ton mech was continually backstepping and turning to fire its extended-range large lasers and the snub-nosed PPC at his mech. Even though most of the shots it did fire were missing, the Calliope's double heat sinks were working hard and every plasma rifle round Akeef fired pushed their limits, filling his cockpit with alarms and waves of hot air. He was doing damage, and each round of searing plasma bored into the Marauder's armor and added to the target's soaring heat as well. So long as he kept moving and firing, his opponent would be unable to bring all of its weapons to bear. As the Marauder and Calliope circled, the jet Black Victor loomed over the battle-armored infantry it had just smacked to the ground. Vasil coughed, trying to get his next breath of air from punished lungs as it seemed like every alarm in his heads-up display was flashing. Clicking his tongue, he flipped through the diagnostics as quickly as possible, ignoring what he could and dismissing others that he really shouldn't. Above him, the victor blotted out the sunlight, and it pulled Vasil's attention back to this 80-ton opponent. After helping to take down the mortis, Vasil was feeling vindicated in his struggle for valor in battle. But now, less than a minute later, he felt as though these were his last moments of life. He struggled to get his limbs moving again, shaking off the effects of what was likely a concussion. Vasil saw the victor lift its right leg as if to step on him. Instead of being shuffled from the mortal coil, or even just being mangled under the mech's foot, Vasil heard the dual thunder crack through his breached armor. Blue light washed out his vision for a moment as the victor was knocked off balance. Dropping its foot back to the increasingly muddy battlefield, the mech tried to turn to face down the source of the shots that cut deeply into its internal structure. The mech only made it a quarter turn 
before the massive claw of the king crab came down on its left shoulder, finishing the job that the heavy PPCs had started. The victor seemed to come apart at the seams, right down the line of its left torso. The right arm flailed as if it could keep balance, but that was a fool's errand. It crashed to the ground with a tremendous thud. Vasil breathed a painful sigh of relief. Able to finally sit up, he watched with satisfaction as Tenika stomped down on the already mangled torso of the mech, making sure it didn't get up again. If I did not know better, I would think you were a jade falcon with that ferocity, he spoke into the comm link. Any response was interrupted by fire from the enforcer and the mortise which is down but had lifted itself back up to a half-prone position. The pristine armor of the king crab was pelted and melted under the incoming fire, but the massive plates held up without issue. The three battle mechs started to fall back, seeing the writing on the wall when Olivia's thunderbolt stepped down the dropship ramp and began to add fire to the king crabs. Laser light, missiles, and PPC shots continued to be traded back and forth until a new source of long-range missiles began to rain down onto the battlefield around the attacking dropships. The one egg-shaped ship closest to the ridge began to take significant fire, armor plates buckling and being blown off while its crew frantically tried to pull up their ramps and go through liftoff procedures. The attacking mechs turned and ran at that point, though the mortise continually fell back to the earth with the damaged gyro and non-functioning legs. Another salvo of missiles smashed directly into the dropship, punching through the armor and setting off secondary explosions inside. The gunfire seemed to trail off for a moment as everyone watched in shock and awe of a dropship dying its fiery death. The dropship crumbled in on itself as the integrity of its internal structure was lost. The neighboring dropship lifted off on plumes of smoke and plasma with ramps still halfway up wasting little time skirting across the valley away from both the Explorer Cormex and the fire from the ridge. The feeling of victory was short-lived as the next flight of missiles from the ridge headed towards the Akrai. Most of the missiles went wide or fell short due to the increased distance, but enough made it through to get Olivia's voice on the comms quick. Akif, get up here quick and stop whatever it is that's shooting at us. We'll hold off our new friends and collect the captain. Roger Dodger, Akif said, finally backing away from the dance with the Marauder and making a break for the ridge. Vasil, are you okay? Tenek asked, unable to see the elemental from the vantage point of the King Crab's cockpit. My armor needs repair. I will survive. We need to get the captain back to the ship. She has extensive injuries, Vasil replied as he finished pulling himself back up to his feet. His battle armor was barely functioning and not happy with him for a half dozen really good reasons. Where's May? Did you see her go down? May, are you on the comms? Tanika asked, suddenly realizing the commando was nowhere to be seen. Another flight of missiles streaked towards the Akrai, but Olivia was there to put herself in harm's way. Only a couple of missiles struck the ship, blasting away armor. The Thunderbolt looked unblemished, though it was clear the knee actuator was still on the fritz with each awkward step. Vasil slid his arms underneath Captain Rin as carefully as he could and lifted up her limp body while Tenika watched over them both in case their new friends returned for round two. The mortise continually tried to drag itself back from the fray, finally stopping and slumping to the ground as if exhausted. We've got automated LRM tanks up here, really patched together stuff. They aren't reacting to my presence, Akif's voice cut through on the comms. I stomped one pretty good, and the other one should be down in a few seconds. Olivia responded. We have a chance to get out of here. Let's go. There is no disagreement. While Vasil walked Rin to the Eulalia, Tenika guarded the dropships and Olivia walked out onto the battlefield. The Thunderbolt stood unchallenged and Olivia felt vindicated. Every step of the way, Rin's reckless decisions had put people into danger. Her eyes scanned the broken up and scarred ground until they settled on what was left of the torso of May's commando. The 25-ton mech looked like a shattered toy cast away by its owner. Olivia wiped away a tear before kneeling the Thunderbolt down to get a closer look. She spoke softly into the external speakers of the mech when she said, May, tell me you're okay. There was no response. Cracked canopy was blackened with soot from the inside, and it looked like there hadn't been an attempt to open the escape hatch. Olivia wiped away another tear before speaking again into the mic. Come on, May, we gotta go. A crewman from the Akrai spoke on the NEC channel. We finally have contact with the rabbit's foot. We have to leave immediately and return to the jump ship. They expect company at the jump point at any moment. As if to put on an exclamation point, the surviving enemy dropship began to rise up into the atmosphere. Time was not on their side, but Olivia had to know for sure. 
She pulled herself from the command chair and slid out of the Thunderbolt's escape hatch into the chilly open air. Tenika watched the mortise for signs of movement and let her guard down when she saw the escape hatch on the cockpit open. A rather scrawny, rat-like man crawled out and was waving his arms. Tenika ignored him for a moment as she turned her attention to the kneeling Thunderbolt. Olivia coughed as a billowing cloud of black smoke hit her upon opening the commando's cockpit. Every second of waiting for it to clear felt like an eternity before she was able to finally slide in enough to see that May wasn't going to be coming back to the ship. The charred cockpit and the remains of her fellow mech warrior made Olivia want to keel over. Instead, she balled her fists and resolved to make sure Rin paid for her recklessness. May didn't make it, Olivia said into the calm channel before hopping back down and heading back to her thunderbolt. Meanwhile, the Mortis's mech warrior was walking toward the king crab at a leisurely pace, with its hands out in supplication. Tenika had to take a moment to collect herself after hearing about May before opening up the external mic and speaking to him. In a rather harsh tone, she asked, What do you want? My peers have left me, so it looks like I'm asking for mercy. We were just defending our turf. I hope you can understand that, the man said, looking up at the king crab like he was having a conversation with the mech itself. I could crush you and no one would think less of me, Tenika responded before adding, You killed my friend. The man looked back at the fallen victor and then at his mortise before stating, Looks like you took a life already today, too, and you trashed my mech. Plus, my boss is going to kill me anyway when she finds out that we lost a dropship. We should take him with us. He could be useful at the jump point, Vasil said as he walked back down the ramp unaugmented. When Vasil reached the dispossessed mech warrior, he roughly grabbed him by the shoulder and marched him up into the dropship. Do we have time to grab the Helios and Grim Reaper? Tenika asked as Akif's pockmarked calliope made its way back across the valley floor. Yes, came the unexpected reply from Olivia. She clarified, we might need to barter with them, as the other dropship has a head start to the jump point. In less than an hour, the battle mechs were packed away neatly in the dropships, along with a few crates of ammunition. The rest of the haul from the secret supply depot was left to sit in the snow and wind. New Explorer Corps, First Arm, Spinward Operations Area, System J5381, Nadir Jump Point, Jump Ship, Rabbit's Foot, March 21st, 3152. We have confirmation from the Akrai and the Alalia that they're on their way back to the Rabbit's Foot, Corporal Kirsch said, leaning back from her command console to get Levitt's attention. He nodded and felt some relief, knowing that both dropships were still functional and were on their way back. Every second of waiting felt like a week, and the crew had been on edge waiting for the other shoe to drop with the mysterious jump ship. Is the other drop ship still headed towards the Nadir? Cal asked while checking the various data feeds on the holo table. Miri nodded, running her hand through her cropped hair in a habit that betrayed the exhaustion she was feeling after not getting any sleep for the past few days. She responded, Yes, at 2G as well. They'll be at the Nadir a full day before our drop ships. Do we have any updates on the captain? Cal asked, his brow furrowing as he asked the question. The mech warrior Tenika said that the captain is pretty rough off with broken bones and a punctured lung. She's going to be out of action for a while, Miri said, seeing the pain on Levitt's face as he soaked in the bad news. She added, the crew's pretty devastated between that and the loss of the mech warrior May. Cal's eyes never looked away from the table as his mind ran through the possibilities, timetables, and possible ways as it could play out. As the sensor data flickered out, he knew they were out of time. Lieutenant Levitt, we just lost all incoming data feeds, Mary said as she tried to establish connections with the data drones in orbit around the jump ship. Levitt sighed before saying, the jump ship's back. End part 15. New Explorer Corps, First Arm, Spinward Operations Area, System J5381, Approaching Nadir Jump Point, Dropship Alelia, March 22nd, 3152. The mech warrior sat quietly with a disturbingly passive look on his face, in the chair that Vasil had dragged into the mech bay. As Olivia stared him down, taking in his odd facial features, the thinning hair, the light gray eyes, she was taken back by the calmness that seemed to surround him like an aura. At a glance, you wouldn't think that he was a captive who had just lost his battle mech. His cooling vest looked like it was a newer design. It had wear and tear but hadn't faded and didn't show the worn and frayed edges that had come from decades of use. On it were two patches, one that said Higgins, all in caps, and the other was a circular unit patch that showed a bear-like creature consuming a planet in its clawed grasp. Grabbing the other chair that Vasil had brought, Olivia sat facing him. So, 
You are Higgins. Does that name come with a rank? Olivia asked as she started her interrogation. The man sighed, held up his bound wrists. Yep, though this isn't necessary. You know I'm unarmed, and your bulky friend here looks like he could kill me before I could stand. I know when I'm beat. I just want to get back home to my family. This is true. I could, Vasil said with a scowl as the elemental continued to stand guard at the man's four o'clock, just out of his peripheral vision. Seeking to generate some goodwill, Olivia nodded and Vasil stepped forward, sliding that huge combat knife between his wrists and slicing the plastic band. He rubbed one wrist and then the other before sitting back, almost slouching in his chair. Now unbound, he continued, It's Captain Usul Higgins. You met my unit. We were on our usual patrol of the systems when we saw your jump ship. The last resort doesn't need pirates and looters rooting around. Do you make it a habit of jamming communications in the system? How's that done, anyway? Olivia asked. Higgins smiled, which was off-putting, due to his rodent-like facial structure, and replied, Oh, we picked up a little piece of tech that helps with that. You'll have to forgive me for not showing my hand, as you are currently holding me hostage. Olivia furrowed her brow before responding, You surrendered to us. You are not a hostage, you are a prisoner. <laughs> We might be out in the periphery, but I know what a Blakist is and how you people deal with your prisoners, Higgins said while gesturing toward the black and gray mechs and crates around the mech bay with a downward pointing sword on the starfield background. Recoiling a bit, Olivia felt the sting of being proven right concerning taking the stuff from the depot. After a second, she recovered and said, We're not Blakists. We just stumbled across this depot and decided that a resupply was warranted. Then you pirates showed up. You think we're the pirates? Higgins scoffed before continuing. You show up on our turf, loot all this, and then suggest we're the pirates. If you're not Blakists, you sure are as arrogant as they were. How are we supposed to know it was your turf? It's not like you put up signage, Olivia countered. I said as much upon our arrival to your captain, right before she threatened us, and said that you were going to be taking everything no matter what. Higgins replied, leaning back in a stretch and putting his hands behind his head while crossing his legs at the ankle. Olivia tried not to show a reaction. While it didn't sound like something Rin would say or do, hardly anything about Rin seemed stable lately. Maybe she had been so zealous to keep everything that she had overstepped. She looked over at Vasil, who was watching Higgins for any sign of aggressive movement, then over at Tenika, who was just walking into the bay a few dozen yards away. Feeling the weight of this train wreck of a mission on her shoulders, Olivia asked, How do you see this playing out? Higgins smiled with that creepy smile and chuckled before saying, Well, my people have at least a few hours head start on you to the jump point, and they know I'm with you, so I imagine there will be some sort of parlay where you hand over all this nice loot, including the mechs, and we let you go on your merry way. Basil placed his hand on Higgins' shoulder and said, We could always just toss him out of the airlock. His friends do not know we did not leave him on the planet. Higgins leaned his head back and smiled up at Vasil as he said, You must be the group's diplomat. Charming. Though I hate to break it to you, they know I'm with you. I have a tracker on me that cuts through the interference. My crew knows exactly where I am and where you are. Toss me out into space if you want, but it'll doom everyone on your ships and we'll take your stuff anyway. You could be bluffing. Tenica said as she walked up next to Olivia, still clad in her coolant vest and shorts. Higgins lowered his arms, and Vasil removed his hand before he responded. I could be, but you can't afford to try to call me on it. If your jump ship had the means to cripple ours, you'd have done it already, and then you would have had your comms back. If you had your comms, you wouldn't be talking to me. Face it, ladies, you're out of your depth here. Vasil sighed and asked, Can I please throw him out of the airlock? Tenika shook her head and smirked before replying, Maybe in a bit, once we check out a few things. New Explorer Corps, First Arm, Spinward Operations Area, System J5381, Nadir Jump Point, Jump Ship Rabbit's Foot, March 23, 3152. With Kip flying in a holding pattern around the jump ship, the sensor blindness was only slightly less frustrating for Cal Levitt. At the distance between ships at this jump point, Kip couldn't see more than a little gray blur in the distance at max magnification. However, at least they knew for sure that the other jump ship was still there. With both of the Explorer Corps dropships still en route behind the third dropship, this was all a big strategic mess. With what he was able to pick up from Olivia and Vasil before the comms were blocked again, 
These new arrivals were either a pirate band or some sort of local power that didn't like the NEC treasure hunting on their turf. The facts were few, considering Rin was the only one who had a conversation with them, and she was so banged up that she was placed into a deep sleep. Olivia said that they had one of their leaders in their custody, which might be the only way they could get out of this one without more bloodshed. Cal hadn't shared the news about May or Rin's condition with anyone on the rabbit's foot yet. It wouldn't do any good when the crew needed to be sharp. He felt the cold sting of a leader being out of control of a situation, and it was distracting him. Have we had any luck in figuring out how they're jamming all our comms? Cal asked as he looked at the blurry ship in the video Kip recorded a few hours ago. Corporal Miri Kirsch grabbed the tablet one of the other bridge crew was working on and scanned it before responding, No good news yet, but we think they're using something to flood all the possible comlink wavelengths with noise. When we try to transmit, it's like screaming into a windstorm. Levitt shut down the repeating video. It was safe to assume that if they could flood all of the possible channels, then they could also select one to leave clear. His reasoning was confirmed moments later when Miri said, We've got an incoming message from the jump ship. Cal ran his hand through his hair before pointing to the message link on the hollow table. It flickered open, and he saw a video of a woman who looked to be in her 50s or 60s, wearing a simple naval tunic and a cap that signified some sort of high rank. After a moment, she began to speak. Cal curled his eyebrow up as she said, Greetings, I am Guider Flores of the jump ship Skyfire, and it has been brought to my attention that your forces and mine have come into direct conflict. Know that you are in a system claimed by the Duchy of Last Resort, and thus subject to its laws, several of which cover looting historical objects of technological value. You currently have two dropships heading back to your ship full of goods that do not belong to you, along with one of our officers, who is currently being held captive. All of this being established and not up for debate, I offer a temporary truce so that we can discuss these matters in person and collect our officer. The dropship headed in your direction from the planet will be requesting docking clearance in less than 30 minutes. They will not enter your ship armed so long as you remain peaceful. Additionally, you have one aerospace fighter in orbit around your jump ship. Recall it. All further communication will be through those representatives on the dropship. Good day. Cal listened intently to the message, then closed the file. The prospect of letting this dropship attached to the rabbit's foot without Vasil or any of the others to defend it felt like a non-starter. Yet it seemed as though there wasn't much of an option. He looked over at Miri and saw that she was busy trying to find a way around this communications lockdown. Scanning the room, he felt helpless. They were facing an opponent that could control their ability to speak and listen to what was happening around them. This didn't bode well for any commander. However, they didn't have to do everything they were told. Corporal Kirsch, you have the bridge. I need to go talk to our aerospace pilot, so bring him in with the visual signal. Prepare to accept the boarding, but do not grant them boarding network access until you hear from me. We might need to let them on, but let's buy ourselves some time first. How long until the Akrai and Alalia arrive? Cal asked as he headed out of the bridge. Approximately 45 minutes if they kept up their G-plus burn from when we lost contact, Miri responded quickly. 25 minutes later, Miri's calm lit up with a connection to the incoming dropship. The gruff voice on the other end said, This is the Defiant Star, requesting docking clearance with your forward link ETA 4 minutes. Miri waited nearly a minute before responding. You are clear for docking at our A1 dropship link. Be aware we are facing significant issues with our ship's electronics due to interference from your dropship. We may be delayed in offering network access for depressurization. Just get it done, came the reply. She tapped the comm to close the connection for a moment, logging the frequency and channel on her tablet. It wasn't the same as the one from the jump ship. That meant they knew what they were doing and were rotating channels. Miri sighed and bit her lower lip, wondering what she would say when they requested access again. Down at the airlock, Kip and Cal were waiting with a couple of the more unfriendly-looking techs that were available when Cal ran by. Technically, they weren't armed, but hidden in the metallic ribs of the bulkhead behind them were rifles and a couple of steel bars. If it came to it, Cal figured it wouldn't prevent a takeover, but they might be able to take down enough of them to give Olivia and the rest of the crew a chance when they arrived. He looked down at his watch as he heard the dropship clamps close around the arriving ship just a few meters away. The small window into the airlock glowed red as the lights indicated an incomplete docking process. Kip looked ready for a fight, standing further back from the others with an arm's reach of the hidden rifle. 
A few minutes passed before Cal received a message on his small personal tablet from Corporal Meary on the bridge. The message said, Lieutenant, they are insisting we grant them network access to complete the docking procedure. They are getting really angry. Cal replied, Tell them we're working on the problem. In five minutes, give them access. Lock down the ship and close every bulkhead door between here and the bridge. Even if they get through us, the Ilalia and the Akrai will be here by the time they get through. We should just shoot them when they come through the door, Cal, Kip said, looking increasingly impatient. Cal looked at his pilot and wondered if he hadn't made a mistake by asking him for backup. Glancing back on the timer on his wrist, he replied, That's the option with the most downside risk at the moment. It can't be our first play. Keep cool and we'll see what happens. If we can resolve this without fighting, that's the wind condition. The minutes crept by and finally the light from the airlock turned to green. The ship's mechanisms rotated the heavy external door open and Cal could make out some shadows of people entering. Stay calm. We're all friendly if they are, he said as he glanced back toward Kip who nodded with understanding. A faint sound of rushing air could be heard before the internal door began to slide open. Bathed in green light from the airlock, several surly-looking soldiers wearing camo stepped aside. Behind them was a woman with unkempt jet-black hair and wearing a dark gray uniform. She looked directly into Cal's stunned face with piercing gray eyes and then smiled. It took a second for Cal to register what was happening as she stepped into the ship. Her black boots clicked more than stomped on the metal plating of the deck. This wasn't the boarding action he had expected. Cal snapped back to reality and stammered out, I'm, I'm Lieutenant Levitt. You're, you're on the rabbit's foot. I understand we have a lot to discuss. The woman, now flanked by her two soldiers, replied, We sure do, but I could use a drink. Let's all sit down and see if we can work this out. Cal looked back at the techs, and Kip, who all looked as confused by this as he was, before responding, Yes, of course. Follow me. End Part 16 New Explorer Corps First Arm, Spinward Operations Area, System J5381, Nadir Jump Point, Jump Ship Rabbit's Foot, March 23rd, 3152. I appreciate that you've come without any clear hostile intent. I understand there was a disagreement down on the surface of Planet B, but I'm confident that we can resolve it peaceably, Cal said as the group sat down around the ends of the Rabbit's Foot's conference table. He was having a hard time concentrating while looking at that raven-haired woman sitting across from him. While she was absolutely the concept of beauty manifest in physical form, what was most distracting was the series of gently glowing black branches of a digital tattoo running up her neck, jawline, and right side of her face. At the end of each branch were cherry blossoms in more intensely glowing pink. While Cal had seen the type of thing before, like on Vasil or even Tenika's avian-themed arm ink, this was next level intense. What made it even worse is that she obviously knew that it had an effect on others, which only added to the imbalance of confidence in the room. Cal had asked Kip to head back down to the aerospace bay with instructions not to do anything troublesome. He doubted the hot-headed pilot would be much help in a negotiation. The two uniformed men behind the woman looked like bar bouncers, though the inked design on one of their necks showed what looked like battle armor of a design that Cal didn't recognize. You can call me Gia. I'm as close as you'll get to a representative of the last resort, so we may find a path forward. I assume you're stalling waiting for the arrival of the other dropships, the woman said, sitting up straight in the chair and placing both of her hands on the table, palms up. Cal glanced down at his tablet, waiting for the message from the bridge letting him know the dropships had docked. Taking a breath for courage, though he didn't really understand why he felt like he needed one, he responded, We will let them know that you're not hostile and that we're going to talk this out. We could be a little hostile if you need to save face in front of your crew, Gia said with a smirk. Cal bristled and said, No, that, that won't be necessary. And it's not my crew. The mission's captain's on that ship, Rin Barrett. Gia nodded and responded in her cool, effortless manner, We know. She won't help out your case. Your captain has some seriously dangerous interests. Cal leaned back, wondering how she would know anything about Rin. His tablet beeped and he glanced down. The message was titled, Ships Docked, Friendlies on Their Way. Down in the Akrai's airlock, Vasil barged into the ship, carrying his combat knife, out and in the ready position. 
He scanned the hallway for possible threats, but there was only a completely terrified rabbit's foot crewman who looked like he was about to lose control of his bodily functions at the sight of the elemental headed in his direction. Where are they? Vasil growled at the crewman as he dropped his guard a bit. Feeling a wave of relief that he was still alive, the crewman stammered out, They're in the conference hub. They're not aggressive. They're, they're talking. What do you mean they're talking? Olivia asked as she stepped through the airlock with Tenika at her back, each of them carrying rifles and clearly expecting a fight. There are only three on the ship. They're, they're talking in the conference hub. Lieutenant Levitt is expecting you, but he's, he said no weapons, the crewman said, backing up to the steel wall to let Vasil and the mech warriors by. A few moments later, Akif marched Higgins through the airlock and followed the rest. Olivia and Tenika stashed the rifles in the rafters in the hallway, a turn away from the conference hub. When they stepped around the last corner, they saw Cal standing in the open door. His hands were up in a placating gesture, and he said, Play it cool. We may be able to talk our way out of this. If we get aggressive, they might lock us down again and we're toast. Got it? The pair nodded, and then Cal looked past them at Akif and the captive. Cut his hands. He's not a hostage. Akif looked at Olivia, and she nodded, so he pulled a blade from his boot to slice the plastic. Higgins rubbed his wrists with a smirk on his face. There was a strong temptation to punch him, though Olivia resisted it. They were in hot enough water as is. When they re-entered the room, Higgins walked to the far side and shook the hands of the two men standing behind Gia, who remained seated and didn't react to his presence. When he put his hand on her shoulder, she turned her head and looked up at him in a way that Higgins knew wasn't welcome. He retreated and stood off to the side. Gia turned back to Cal, who was now flanked by three mech warriors, and Vasil, who had slid his combat knife back into its sheath on his hip. She smiled politely and said, we appreciate that you didn't try to turn our comrade into a bargaining chip. That reflects well on you. However, we need to talk about a path forward. Cal nodded, even as his tablet beeped again, the message title reading, Captain in Medical Bay, Stable. He sighed in relief and responded, I'm quite sure there's a path forward here. Enough blood has been spilled on both sides over this misunderstanding. There's no replacing the dropship that you destroyed, of course. Gia started before Olivia stepped forward and interrupted. That wasn't us. Those were drones in the hills. I think they activated when the shooting started. One of our ships also took damage, Olivia said with purpose. Gia shifted her gaze to Olivia only momentarily before focusing on Cal again. She responded, Regardless, the damage was done, and we lost a dropship. We also lost two battle mechs to your one. In the interests of fairness to the fact that you're also on last resort territory, we believe we can walk away as friends with the three Word of Blake Battlemax in your possession, the miscellaneous goods you can keep. Cal pondered the offer for a few moments, even as he could hear the mech warriors bristle at it behind him. He leaned forward a bit, placing his hand on the table and gently tapping at it with his finger before saying, We lost a valuable member of our team down there due to your aggression and the fact that we're currently in possession of the battle mechs and the supplies counts for something, as any attempt to take them by force would likely result in their damage and or additional casualties. I think a more reasonable offer would be the Helios mech and half of the supplies split as evenly as possible. Gia's black hair cascaded a bit over her shoulders as she also leaned closer slightly. Her words were measured and dripped with saccharine venom. We could wipe you out and still salvage plenty to make up for the effort. But we're not Blakists, and we're not barbaric Jade Falcons. Vasil took a long, slow, calming breath, fighting the urge to cross the room and deal with that insult. Cal looked back at him and felt a rush of relief seeing the Elemental wasn't taking the bait. Seeing the Elemental wasn't a fool, Gia continued, We'll take the Grim Reaper and the King Crab as well as two-thirds of the supplies. Cal heard a whimper from Tenika and figured it was worth a try when he countered by saying, We'll keep the king crab. You can have everything else. Tenika held her breath as Gia leaned back and brushed her hand through her long hair. After a few seconds of staring Cal down, she said, You have a deal. We can begin the transfer immediately. And the communications lockdown has to end, Cal added, wrapping his knuckle on the desk. Gia's grin turned into a Cheshire smile before she replied, Done. After all, we do want to leave you as friends. Now let's have another drink while we let our crew handle the transfer. Cal stood, straightened his jacket, and said, 
I have to decline. My captain's in rough shape and I need to make sure she's getting the care she needs. I, I-, I could use a drink, Akif said, stepping forward. Chia shrugged and sat back in her chair while all but Akif filed out. Before going, Cal leaned over to Akif and whispered, Be careful. I think she may collect skulls as a hobby. Akif smirked and responded, Don't worry, Lieutenant. I'll keep an eye on her. As he stepped through the door, Cal figured he had a 50-50 shot of never seeing Akif alive again. When he reached the med bay, Cal could see that Rin wasn't going to be up and running around anytime soon. Her chest was wrapped in gauze and a compression vest to help her breathe, and the ship's doctor had set IVs in her arm with various concoctions hanging above. The bruises on her face were substantial and looked like they'd be hanging around for a long time. When he sat down on the stool next to her bed, Rin's eyes opened and she smiled at him. You look worse than I do, she said with a rasp. You must not have access to a mirror because it looks like a dropship landed on you, Cal retorted with a chuckle. It's been so long since he had laughed, Cal was taken aback by his own laughter. I'm sorry, Cal. I'm sorry for everything, Rin said with a tear rolling down her cheek. Cal wiped away the tear with his thumb and said, I know, we just need to recalibrate and be more careful about things. Recklessness isn't something you're good at. This time it was Rin's turn to laugh, but she only got a second into it before coughing and groaning in pain. Just rest up. I'll keep this nonsense going till you're back. I think we should stick to surveying for a bit before heading into a friendly port. No more treasure hunts, Cal said, standing up from the stool and looking down at his friend. Rin nodded slightly before saying, no more treasure hunts, before pausing for a few moments and adding, Can you please tell Olivia that I'm sorry? I will, Cal said, as he reached down to squeeze Rin's bandaged hand. New Explorer Corps, First Arm, Spinward Operations Area, System J5381, Nadir Jump Point, Jump Ship, Rabbit's Foot, March 24th, 3152. Eighteen hours later, the transfer of mechs and supplies to the guest dropship was complete. Cal and Olivia made sure to personally check that there weren't any crates left behind, as neither of them wanted any evidence of the word of Blake around to cause more trouble. Levitt, you'd better get over here, Olivia called out over the comm link. When he wandered over, very aware that he was being watched by the visiting crew, Cal stopped in his tracks instantly when he saw it. The Calliope was in a sitting position, wedged behind several large stacks of crates. Olivia ran her hand through her hair in frustration before looking over at Cal and saying, Why would they try to steal it? They'd know we'd check. I can clarify, Gia said as she approached the two. Behind her walked Akif, looking rather sheepish and avoiding eye contact. He's bailing on us, Olivia said, putting her hands on her hips. Cal sighed, rubbing his temple before saying, Okay, what's going on? Your mech warrior is seeking passage to the last resort. He has expressed displeasure with the leadership of this mission, Gia said, speaking for Akif, who didn't look like he was going to be participating in this conversation. If you leave, you forfeit your pay. This is some murky business, Cal said while looking past Gia and into Akif's eyes. Gia smiled, that wicked smile, and it pulled Cal's eyes back to hers in a way that he didn't like. Her words once again took on that predatory tone when she said, There are consequences for poor leadership. Looking past Cal at Olivia, she added, Need a good job? The last resort is always looking for talented mech warriors. I'm good, thanks, Olivia said while crossing her arms and glaring at Akif. Two hours later, Cal stood on the bridge of the rabbit's foot and watched the holographic representation of the last resort dropship heading on its trajectory towards the jumpship. Every second of distance between them improved his sour mood. Losing Ariana, May, and now Akif bailing on his contract made the prospect of continuing the new Explorer Corps mission that much more untenable. Let's get jump telemetry to the inner sphere, nearest combine port of call. We need to resupply and debrief with our employers as quickly as possible, he said, as those seconds continued to tick by. The last resort, Southern Operations Area, System J5381, Nadir Jump Point, Jump Ship, Skyfire, March 24th, 3152. Guider Flores rolled her eyes as Gia walked onto the bridge with her two flunkies like she owned the place. To say the two of them didn't get along is an understatement of their personalities could not be any more different. Flores respected the system and people who had forged the last resort into a state worthy of the history books, while people like Gia seemed only to enjoy the here and now. Her casual disrespect for tradition, rules, and the way she enjoyed messing with people always rubbed Flores the wrong way. 
From the flashy uniform to that glowing ink in her face, it was all just so uncouth. I take it we're done here? Floris asked. Gia smiled and took off her gloves before saying, Oh yes, it went very well. They bent, but did not break. It was all very dignified. Guider Flores turned to issue the command to prepare a jump from the system when Gia spoke again. Lock them down again. I want a firing solution for a long-range strike. Target their propulsion systems. I want them to spend a good long while out there sitting and thinking about things. When we return, their ship and mechs will be waiting for us. Flores bristled before responding. Are you sure about that? What if their employers come looking for them? Gia grabbed her seat, one set several inches higher on the decking than Flores' command chair, and said, They don't strike me as a group anyone will miss. End Part 17 New Explorer Corps First Arm, Spinward Operations Area System J5381 Nadir Jump Point Jump Ship, Rabbit's Foot March 24th, 3152 Cal Levitt allowed himself to feel a few moments of pride as he stood on the bridge of the rabbit's foot. The jump ship was well on its way to being ready for the next jump, which would take the crew away from all of this word of Blake nonsense and whatever the last resort was. It ached to have to let a Keefe go, but ultimately if someone wants to leave and you force them to stay, you're always going to have to watch your back. Down to just Tenica and her king crab and Olivia and her thunderbolt, the mission was a little light on defense. Kip was a wild card who would probably hold up in a fight, but he was only one pilot, which would be unlikely to make the difference if pirates made a go for the jump ship. The truth is, the mission was in dire need of some reinforcement and downtime. Pulling up the ships on the holotable, Cal took in the view of the last resort's jump ship. It had its sails unfurled, which wasn't surprising, considering their earlier double jump. Even with batteries, they were likely going to be stuck around J5381 for at least a week. That filled Cal with confidence, as no matter where the rabbit's foot jumped today, this jump ship wouldn't be following anytime soon. Still, the sooner they could go, the better. How long until we can make our jump, Corporal Kirsch? Cal asked, not taking his eyes off the holographic representation of the two jump ships. Miri looked at her screen, then responded, Ten minutes until the route is locked, then we can make the jump. Cal pulled up the shipwide comms and made the announcement. Only a few seconds later, the holographic view of the two ships in front of him fizzled out. He let out a deep, rin like sigh as Corporal Kirsch announced that they had once again been locked out of their communications and sensor systems. <sighs> Using the last recorded position of the last resort's jump ship, how long do we reasonably have until they can fire on us? Cal asked as he wrapped his knuckle on the edge of the table, fighting the urge to put his fist through it. Two minutes. Probably less, she replied. Cal looked at her, then around the room before responding. Nuts. System J5381, Nadir Jump Point, Jump Ship Skyfire. Gia leaned on her elbow while sitting in her chair, watching with some annoyance as the bridge crew prepared the Skyfire's long-range weaponry. She scowled at Guider Flores, who seemed to be taking her time, which was always her passive-aggressive way to protest an order. Gia up, brushed her loose black hair over her shoulder, and stated, As soon as you have a firing solution with the Barracudas, you're free to fire. Barely listening as people began to move around the bridge a bit more frantically, Gia looked back to Guider Flores and saw that she was in a heated conversation with one of the crew about something. Gia sat up and was about to ask what the problem was when the lights on the bridge began to flicker, then went out completely. What is going on? Gia said, trying to control her flaring temper. The only lights on were the strips of emergency red along the floors and had offered little aid other than to flee the room. A voice which Gia identified immediately as Flores's sounded confused as she said, Our systems are all rebooting at random intervals. Something strange is happening. Are they somehow doing this from their ship? Gia asked as she stood up from the seat, though she had nowhere to go in the darkness. Impossible, another crewman said from Gia's left. They're locked down. They can't send anything out. Throwing a brow and scowling, Gia said, Find that mech warrior from their crew and bring him up here. System J5381, Nadir Jump Point, Jump Ship, Rabbit's Foot. Could we jump sooner? Cal asked Corporal Kirsch out of desperation. She shook her head before responding, Not unless you want to risk ending up somewhere in the deep space far from a star. Then we're toast without a jump battery. If they're launching missiles, how long until the impact if they fired them immediately when we were locked down? Mary looked down on her tablet, scribbled some figures, and said, mm, Within the next minute? I want everyone in their battle stations and secured. We may need to ride out the storm and hope that we live long enough to jump, Cal said with a resigned tone. 
Runners were sent out and an internal network message was sent. Cal just hoped that everyone would be where they needed if they were able to jump this ship away. Every second passed with an increasing dread of missile strikes across the hull. Every second without an explosion was a gift, and Cal hoped that there would be enough of those to make it out in time. Olivia ran onto the bridge, breathing hard and having to steady herself on the bulkhead. She said, We're ready to go. Just get us out of here. We're trying, Cal responded, looking back towards Miri and adding, As soon as the lights are green, jump us the hell out of here. Don't bother with a countdown. Mary nodded and continued her hawk-like focus on her console, showing the strings of numbers that represented the billions of calculations the ship's computers had to make to guarantee a ship would be able to jump 20 light-years through space and arrive at the pole of another star. If the ship ended up too close to that star, it could be obliterated with plasma, heat, and radiation. If it's too far, time is lost moving the ship with conventional thrusters to get in close enough range for the solar cells to generate energy economically. Rarely, jumps are so bad that ships end up too far from the star to ever get close enough to recharge the ship's KF drives and the crew is lost to the ravages of time. With every passing second, Cal felt more and more tempted to jump early. Gia didn't seem the sort to let an opportunity go to waste. If this really was a betrayal of the deal, why wouldn't they delay the attack? Something wasn't right. System J5381, Nadir Jump Point, Jump Ship, Skyfire. The longer we delay, the more likely they figure out what is going on and make the jump, Gia practically roared into the darkened bridge. By now, everyone was moving around, trying to get rebooting systems to stay on long enough in order to complete the orders to fire. Every time one would start up, another would reboot again. After several minutes, Akif was shoved into the room by Gia's two hulking bodyguards. Hey guys, no need to get handsy. At least take me out to dinner first, he said with a level of snark that ramped up Gia's anger even more. What did you do to our ship? She barked at him. Uh, Sorry, ma'am. I don't know what you're talking about. I was just working on my Mac when the lights went out. Then your friends showed up and dragged me up here, Akif responded. Gia walked up to Akif and glared into his somewhat confused eyes before saying, If this is your doing, I'm going to toss you out of the airlock. He shook his head earnestly and responded, I don't know what's going on. He paused. Wait, did you connect to the Rabbit's Foot network when you were over there? Guider Flores responded from a few meters away. Why would that matter? Because they dropped something on us, Gia growled. The bridge lights flickered on a few moments later and seemed to be staying on. The ship's holotable showed both jump ships in the same position they were in before. We have a firing solution. The weapon systems are green, a voice from the bridge's weapons officer chirped up excitedly. Fire! Before the system goes down again, Gia yelled. Akif's eyes went wide when he realized that they were firing on the rabbit's foot. Hey, you had a deal. You got the mechs and gear. They're not bad people. You don't have to kill them, he shouted, trying to get closer to Gia, but her goons grabbed him and held him back. She turned back to him with a Cheshire smile and said, Sorry, we have to make a point or else word will get out that anyone can take from you. The periphery is a very dangerous place. System J5381, Nadir Jump Point, Jump Ship, Rabbit's Foot. Cal and Olivia were genuinely confused at this point. It had been seven minutes since the jump ship had been locked down, and still there was no incoming fire. Not only that, the ability to pick up data from the systems was flickering on and off, almost as if their ability to keep the interference going was being impacted by something. They've launched something. Five missiles looking like barracudas, but they were only on the scanners for a second before we went down again. Depending on their speed, we could be hit in two to five minutes, Corporal Kirsch said as she frantically moved from one console to the next. Well, that's reassuring, Cal said, looking over at Olivia, who had her own look of concern she was dealing with at the moment. He continued, So we're either going to die, or jump in the next minute and a half. Olivia walked to Miri's station. Olivia walked over to Miri's station and watched the jump data compiling. Her face glowed a gentle green from the light emitted from the screen as she said, Hold on to your butts. System J5381, Nadir Jump Point, Jump Ship, Skyfire. Gia watched the five holographic representations of the missiles traveling ever closer to their target and couldn't help but feel a rush of an impending kill. Returning to the last resort with a jump ship and three battle mechs would please her father to the point that no one would be able to suggest that she was less than suitable replacement for him when the time came. Impact in 30 seconds, the gunnery officer called out, beginning a verbal count 20 seconds later. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5. 
Just as he said four, there was a flash of light from the hollow table where the rabbit's foot was, and then it was gone. No! Gia roared as she got up from her seat and smashed her forearms down on the hollow table, cracking the thick glass in her fury. The holographic missiles continued their journey, but then flickered out of existence when the glass caved in. Pressed up against the bulkhead of the bridge, Akif felt a sense of relief knowing that his former crewmen were safe. At least for now. New Explorer Corps, First Arm, Spinward Operations Area, System J5352, Zenith Jump Point, Jump Ship, Rabbit's Foot, April 12, 3152. Slowly gathering his bearings, Cal Levitt's hand gripped the armrest of the command chair. With every jump away, he felt a little better about the prospects of making it home alive. The chances of that last resort jump ship would be able to guess their path of the rabbit's foot were increasingly remote. Cal smirked to himself and muttered a quiet thanks to the gods of compound probability. Lieutenant, you may want to come see this, Corporal Kirsch said with a flat tone. Cal rolled his eyes and got up from the command chair, wandering over to her console. He took a second to wrap his brain around what he was seeing before tapping the comm link on his collar. Olivia, grab Tenica, Kip, and Vasil and meet me on the observation deck in ten minutes, he said. Nine minutes later, the mission's warriors wandered onto the large observation deck which was lined on one side with thick ballistics plastic. At the moment, it was tinted black and didn't show anything beyond. "'What's going on?' Tenica asked as she grabbed a seat on one of the many chairs scattered around the room. Olivia shrugged and said, "'Maybe we're going to have a discussion about what to do next?' Basil sat down in the chair next to Tenica and crossed his arms. He was coated in various types of grime, and Tenica gave him a look over before saying, you might need a shower, big guy. Vasil chuckled and responded, Soon enough. I'm still working on getting my armor up and running again. Every day it sits in pieces, I feel further from my purpose. Tenika smiled and punched his arm playfully before saying, I think you're right where you need to be. Kip grabbed a spot, leaning on the back wall, looking annoyed with the prospect of being there. And Olivia flipped through her pocket tablet for another minute before the door to the observation deck opened again. Cal wheeled in a still-bandaged Wren, who was sitting in a fold-out wheelchair. There were greetings, well-wishes, and even Olivia felt compelled to shake Wren's hand in a gesture of peace. "'You look pretty good for someone who tried to fist-fight a mech,' Olivia said. Wren smiled and replied, "'I'm thinking of giving up this peaceful life of science and going pro on Solaris.' Cal laughed and said, "'I think they're giving you too many painkillers if you're thinking of being the comedian on this crew.' When the banter died down a bit, he walked over to the console on the wall. He asked everyone, are you ready to see something cool? He hit the button, and the blanked out windows turned translucent. The system star was clearly visible, along with a couple of blurry objects that were the planets in orbit around it. Oh? Not impressed? Well, let me just zoom in a bit, Cal said with a smile. He hit a few more buttons, and the wall of glass shimmered and then began to zoom in on one of the blurry planets. As the planet moved closer, the room began to fill with a soft orange glow. Everyone stopped talking, looking out at the amazing sight. Orbiting around star J5352 was a massive gas giant planet with swirling reds, oranges, and radiating light that gave it the impression of self-illumination. Cal let everyone take in the view for a minute before speaking. His hand fell to Rin's shoulder, and she moved her hand up to cover it. A tear rolled down her cheek as she looked at the wonder in front of her. The science team said it's an ultra-hot gas giant, just on the edge of becoming a brown dwarf star. Those swirling reds and oranges are clouds of crystalline materials like rubies and other gemstones. We might have the biggest concentration of wealth on this side of Terra, Cal said with pride. Wren turned her head, seeing the remaining members of the team she assembled, looking impressed or downright in awe of the planet in front of them. Even Vasil looked fascinated by the wonders of the cosmos. Rin sighed, an act which still ached a bit with every attempt, and started to think about May and Ariana. They'd have probably gotten a kick out of this, too. Imagining them sitting together, looking out at the orange planet, Rin felt the guilt and shame that had plagued her since that close call with the last resort folk. However, she also felt hopeful that they would make good on their mission and prove that the loss wasn't without purpose. Shifting her gaze to Olivia, Rin saw the potential for great things in her, Sure, her eye still ached from being punched, but Olivia stood up and led when things were rough. Rin was beginning to understand the value of having someone around to keep her feet on the ground. Tenica's head fell against Vasil's shoulder, and he briefly looked down at her. Usually his face was emotionless, but Rin thought she noticed a little smile. 
Maybe it was a quarter of a smile, but there was something there. We needed this, Rin said, tilting her head up to look at Cal. Her oldest friend smiled down at her and said, I don't suppose we could figure out how to capture a ruby the size of a dropship. Unlikely, but I appreciate your can-do spirit, Rin replied with a sigh. End Part 18 Well, folks, this is the complete Season 1 for the new Explorer Corps. Big thank you to everyone who got into the story, as it's heartening to see so many of you start to care so much about these characters. Now, compiling all of this into one video, I think I realized I may have just actually written my first whole Battletech novel. That feels pretty good. Remember that if you want to see content like this in the future, the least expensive way to show that support is to share the videos with others who might enjoy them. Getting more eyes on the content is the key to future growth, and it's the way to get around YouTube's promotional algorithm. If you wish to take that extra step and financially support what has turned into a full audiobook, channel memberships are a great way to go above and beyond. If people keep showing up and demanding more, I'll keep going. There are a lot more stories to tell, and not just from the new Explorer Corps. Take care, and I'll see you again soon. Now go out and make the world a slightly better place today and tomorrow.